The Apostles, they stand at the top of the world, collectively known as the Twelve Super Beings. Historical sources say that each of the Apostles possessed incredible power. Some of these creatures could control water, which is comparable in volume to the oceans, while others had the ability to resist entire human empires. Moreover, the Apostles were able to create new worlds out of their own flesh and blood. But the most powerful among them was the Apostle known as Yulman who possessed boundless power that nothing could compare to. According to the records, his fighting power was far superior to the other apostles, but nothing was known about its origin. The highest category of danger is designated as the apostle. However, when the apostles disappeared, they gradually began to be forgotten, and after that they began to be considered legends at all. The man sneezes slightly, and then, rubbing his nose, thinks about how cold it is in this place. There are snowy mountains around him. He knows that soldiers will come very soon to fight this little dragon. This small dragon rushes, making menacing loud sounds similar to growling. This is an Ice Dragon Warcraft Disaster category. The Disaster category is the most dangerous category in the existing Warcraft classification. It has tremendous power and destructive power. The Ice Dragon Warcraft leads monsters from the north to the Thunderfield. Many creatures, large and small, follow him. In order to protect national security, the Fram Empire immediately moved its troops to defend the territory from the attack of these creatures. A hard and exhausting battle is about to begin very soon. The soldiers, whose faces reflect fear and panic, wonder if their temporary squad will be able to defeat all these monsters. But perhaps only God knows the answer to this question. Someone's voice gives the order to the first squad, according to which the squad should join the battle. Soldiers, howling and shouting, fully armed, run forward, attack, meeting face to face with the enemies. They attack monsters, and they, in turn, fight back. Monsters are flying even from the air, they are literally everywhere. Soldiers who are rushing into battle before are flying back, wounded and no longer able to continue the battle to resist the enemies, because they so simply destroy them one by one, without even putting much effort into it, while the soldiers themselves are trying their best with all my might. A huge ice dragon explores the battlefield with his penetrating gaze. With one blow of his tail he shakes the air, and gets rid of several soldiers at once. The man watching from the side realized long ago that these soldiers are not opponents of these monsters. The disparity in combat power is too great here. Most likely, very soon people will be defeated. Suddenly, a loud female voice is heard, which orders the soldiers not to panic. The man, hearing this sound, turns around, clearly interested in who it could be. The woman continues her speech. She assures that if the enemy is many times stronger, this does not mean that victory will be his. However, if people retreat now, they will all definitely fail. A ball of flame forms above her hand. Raised up, the girl directs it directly at the dragon. Her blow hits right on target. This girl, Sierra Charlotte, is one of the four great magicians of the Fram Empire, known as the Fire Witch. She was appointed to lead this army. In the crowd of soldiers, there were immediately those who recognized Mrs. Sierra. After her appearance, the army was inspired. The soldiers seemed to have opened a second wind. Everyone immediately believed that now they have a chance to win. Sierra, full of determination, ordered everyone to charge. The soldiers did as they were told. I will rush into battle with renewed strength against the ice monsters, of which there were a lot. The dragon, who seemed to have been defeated by Sierra, began to stand up, raising his head and then his entire body. He made a loud sound, opening his mouth wide. The soldiers were amazed that the monster could still move. Sierra Charlotte herself was surprised. It seemed impossible, because she used one of the most powerful fire magic attacks fire explosion and thought that she had already defeated the monster. A shining ice ball began to form near the open mouth of the ice dragon, after which, with one breath, the monster froze the soldiers who tried in vain to avoid this fate, rushing away. Swinging his tail, the dragon hit the frozen ice figures, and they split into pieces, scattered across the battlefield. Sierra gritted her teeth and looked at it, but she decided to act immediately. Jumping down from the cliff on which she stood and towered over the place of battle, she rushed at the dragon with a sword and shouted, proclaiming that she, Sierra, the great magician of the Fram Empire, would not allow this monster to win. The monster's eyes flashed, and with his tail he deflected the blow of the enemy sword. Now the dragon and the great magician, having come together in a duel, glared at each other. He controlled the ice, she controlled the fire. The two opposing elements fought using all their skills. Sierra bounced off the blows, landing on another place. To attack the monster, she created a circle of fire on the ground, while the monster was ready to use its ice sphere again. The girl threw into the attack, the ice dragon did the same. Sierra, around which streaks of fire were rushing, 
rose into the air, directing her blow at the enemy. The enemy did the same, their blows, icy and fiery, clashed, but the first was much stronger. Sierra, already exhausted, was thrown aside by this blow. Now she was lying on the ground, coughing, trying to get to her feet. The soldiers looked at her and were surprised that even Mrs. Sierra herself had lost. What should they do now? Someone's sword touched the ground. The frightened soldier looked at his comrades and said with horror that he did not believe. He backed away, and then completely turned around and, convinced that they could not win, rushed to run from here as fast as he could. He was followed by exactly the same soldiers who were afraid to fight and die. They ran after him, their faces full of horror. The army led by Sierra Charlotte was fleeing from the battlefield, not even paying attention to the lady lying on the ground and stretching her hand in their direction. She was left sitting here alone, looking at the back of the fleeing soldiers. In places, her clothes were torn and stained with blood. Her arms and legs were bleeding, but she found the strength to stand up. The girl looked angrily at where all her warriors were running. Now she really hated them. A man's voice rang out behind her. The man asked why she did not run away herself, because it is obvious that they have no chance of winning this battle. The girl turned around to see who the man was. The stranger introduced himself as someone who wanted to earn a few gold coins here, and then again reminded him of the question he had just asked, why didn't she run away with the others? The girl seemed displeased. She said that the word escape is not and never will be in her dictionary. The man thought it was cute, but said there was no time to talk about it now. Sierra asked what he was talking about, and behind her, the ice dragon was ready to kill. She realized that she was distracted, and immediately turned back to where her enemy was. The monster had already directed his icy blow at her and the girl, blinking from the light and covering her face with her hands, decided that now it was over. When Sierra realized that there was no blow, she opened her eyes in surprise. The man kept his hand on the nose of the ice dragon, telling Tom that he was interfering with his conversation with this miss. Grabbing the monster's muzzle more comfortably, the guy forcefully pushed him away, saying that such a small creature like him should calm down. The dragon, leaving a trail behind him and lifting snow into the air, flew back. It seems that the actions of this man angered him even more, rage appeared in his eyes, claws broke stones. The dragon's body was immediately covered with ice, he was ready to attack the guy again. He stretched out his hand forward, purple circles with some inscriptions appeared in front of her. The guy, smiling, said that this dragon is very naughty, so, unfortunately for the dragon himself, he will be burned. The guy used his magic on this creature and, enveloped in a purple vortex, the dragon screamed. Gradually parts of his body began to disappear, leaving only bones. The guy watched with pleasure, Sierra watched with her mouth wide open. The whirlwind gradually subsided. Soon there was practically nothing left of the dragon, except an ice crystal, which the guy who defeated the dragon took for himself. Throwing this trinket in the air, the guy turned to Sierra, saying that he saved her life, because it would be fine if she went on a date with him at her expense. Sierra Charlotte was sitting on the ground, holding her shoulder with one hand. This guy was able to kill a disaster category monster with one hand. Who is he? Uttering the last words, the girl, deprived of strength, began to fall to the ground, but the guy quickly appeared next to her. He picked her up, who was already unconscious, in his arms. After that, he said that he was a simple mercenary who decided to earn some gold coins. But it was Yulman, the first among the apostles, nicknamed as Limitless. Memories of the ice dragon, of the guy who killed him, made Sierra wake up screaming. Her eyes were wide open, her hands were clutching the blanket, and it seems that she did not immediately realize where she was. A voice rang out in the room. Apparently, this man was waiting for her to wake up and was glad to see him now. She was finally awake. The old man who owned the voice held his left hand behind his back, and he had a book in his right hand, but now all his attention turned to the girl who woke up. It was Asses, the chief magician of the Fram Empire and the director of the Royal Academy. The first thing he asked was how Sierra was feeling, because she had been sleeping for several days. However, the girl herself was more interested in something else. She immediately wanted to know what happened to the ice dragon. Asses closed the book and recommended the girl to lie down, because she needs rest, she should not worry about anything, since the ice dragon has already been destroyed. The old man, looking at the girl, asked what happened after the ice dragon died. Stammering, Sierra said she couldn't remember what happened after that. Ace closed his eyes and took out an object, telling Sierra to look at it. It was some kind of bottle with a purple flame shining inside. The girl stared at the object with excitement, realizing what was in front of her. 
The director explained that this flame was next to her when they arrived, and it did not disappear even when the girl was unconscious. It was Hellfire, a flame that people will never be able to manipulate unless it is. The Apostle, Sierra immediately thought about it. The old man said that even though the Apostles have been missing for a long time, since Hellfire appeared in this battle, they clearly don't know something. He put down the book that had been in his hands all this time, and, heading for the door, praised Sierra for her efforts, told her to rest, he himself did not want to interfere with her rest. Asses stopped at the door and spoke again. From his words, it became clear that the Empire would claim that it was their army, led by Sierra, that defeated the Ice Dragon. He turned to the girl and continued. According to Asses, anything that has anything to do with the Apostles causes people a lot of unnecessary panic. So the army of the Fram Empire, including Sierra, just has to accept all the honors and praise for defeating the Ice Dragon. Through clenched teeth, Sierra Charlotte agreed with all the director's words, sitting on the bed and clutching the blanket tightly in her hands. The people in the streets rejoiced. Everyone thanked Mrs. Sierra for bringing them victory. It really was a universal holiday. Yulman was sitting at the table with his hand on his head. He witnessed everything that was happening on the streets and understood that there would be too much noise if his identity was revealed. But he was hurt and annoyed that he would never have the opportunity to see cute girls who would treat him as a hero and he came to the world of people just to find a girlfriend. He got up from his seat, throwing a small bag over his shoulder. Now the guy was going to leave this city and hide somewhere. Soldiers were approaching the place where Yulman now lived. The guy was already saying goodbye with pain in his heart to his favorite tavern and a beautiful lady at the bar. However, soldiers came inside. The man who was at the head loudly asked who was a mercenary here. The visitors of the inn reacted instantly to this question. All of them immediately pointed to Yulman, who was going to sneak out of here. He thought for a moment that he had been discovered, but very soon the man told about his intentions. It became clear that he had been looking for Yulman for a long time. Now he is here to inform him that the guy was invited to take part in the passing test at the Royal Academy. The tavern immediately became noisy after such news. Isn't the Royal Academy the best academy in the Fram Empire? Someone was unhappy that this guy had only recently come here, and he had already been called there. Everyone was wondering why this happened. The man frowned. He didn't like the outrage coming from those who were here. He sternly asked if there were any of those present here who participated in the battle against the Ice Dragon, like this mercenary. Whispers began again among those present. In the battle against the Ice Dragon, only a handful of people survived. Is this guy one of them? The man said that everything was true, and added that, in addition, after participating in this battle, the guy remained unharmed. The man sternly looked at the soldiers gathered in the tavern and asked if they had any more questions about this. Everyone was silent. There was one person who raised his hand to ask a question. It was Yulman himself, and he asked only about the girls, are there many beautiful girls in this academy? There really were a lot of beautiful girls at the Royal Academy of the Fram Empire. Yulman decided that he was in heaven, his mouth was almost watering. A man asked the director of Aces why he wanted to train this incompetent mercenary. Asses, smiling, replied that young people should be given the opportunity to show their strength, to prove themselves, as they can be unexpected talents. From the side, Asses watched a new student who stood and looked at the girls. Before the test began, the director of Aces congratulated everyone who was here on the chance to enter the Royal Academy. He said that the entrance test would begin right now, which would allow us to understand which of those present was suitable for the Royal Academy. The director added that he hopes that the participants will give their all, show what they are capable of in order to pass the test and survive. Among the many girls and boys began in silence. What was he talking about? What does survive mean? What did he mean by that? A large fiery paw stepped onto the floor of the hall. A fiery demonic wolf, a summoning beast that only experienced fire magicians can summon, appeared in front of the test participants. And he wasn't alone. Someone had already managed to get scared. Someone hoped that these wolves would not harm them, because this is just a test. Meanwhile, Yulman was not even worried. He, fascinated by some girl, asked her not to be afraid and promised that he would be able to protect her. The noise was growing in the hall. The participants were excited about the appearance of the fire wolf, but someone was sure that the monster was not real, because it was a simple test. Yulman looked with contempt at the panic that had risen, because, in his opinion, it was not worth making such a fuss over this small fish. One of those present was shouting, apparently trying to calm everyone down. He said that now is not the time to panic. On this test they all have to show what they are capable of. This guy was already ready to prove himself, he used magic to attack the beast, but the fire wolf quickly jumped over those green stalks that were aimed at him. 
The next attack, the airflow, also did not bring an effective result. It seems that the monster did not even feel it. The attacker's eyes widened. His face was covered with sweat. In an instant, the wolf was there and bit into human flesh, tearing it apart. The girl who was watching this could not move. She stood with tears coming to her eyes. The panic began to intensify. The test participants began to run away. They already realized that they could really lose their lives here. The monsters are real and can kill them. Many rushed to escape from here to escape. Yulman, looking at this, did not understand what was happening. His attention was attracted by some guy who called those who fled stupid. Because in such a situation, mass flight is really a stupid decision, since those who run become the target of the monster. With an air chain, this guy detained the fire wolves and now told everyone else to attack while there was such an opportunity. An archer girl joined the battle, who told the archers to attack with arrows from the left flank. The magicians attacked from the right flank, the swordsmen attacked right in the center. A massacre began, in which the test participants tried to win together. The monsters fell, the guys managed to get the upper hand, which everyone was incredibly happy about now. They really managed to do it, sincere smiles of the winners shone on their faces. However, soon people began to notice some movement, frightened glances darted to where the defeated enemy lay. They realized that this was not the end. The resulting fiery ball shook the air, causing fright to all those present. The fire wolf Cerberus also appeared here, a huge beast with three wolf heads. It was furious. Someone commanded again, attack. The participants held weapons in front of them, preparing to resist. Cerberus grinned angrily, standing face to face with the test participants. One guy noticed that this is really the Royal Academy, since such a dangerous monster is used here only for the test. The wolf opened its mouth, throwing fireballs at its opponents. Some reached the target, some hit the floor with a noise. One such fireball flew straight towards Yulman, but he continued to stand still, believing that such a weak attack was not worth paying attention to, even though the others made so much noise out of it. A scream was heard from the side. A girl was rushing at Yulman. He was looking at her in panic and embarrassment. The girl who rushed straight at the guy saved him from the fireball. He, as if spellbound, looked at his savior, which is now hanging over him, lying on the floor. She asked to be careful, because he was almost hit. The agitated girl looked at Yulman and asked if everything was alright with him. The apostle, blushing all over, stammered that everything was fine. Next to them, the noise of the fireball touching the ground was heard again. The girl looked in the direction of the sound and began to get up from the floor. Once on her feet, she turned to Yulman, asking him to be more careful next time. Now she, leaving Yulman behind, rushed to the center of the battle, intending to deal with this monster. The guy, still confused, looked after the savior. He was touched that she was really worried about his condition. Looking at the girl, he trembled. His heart began to beat faster. What is this strange feeling? The girl, in whose hand an ice boomerang began to form, threw it at the opponent. The boomerang flew to the target and hit the monster, causing him only irritation. The furious gaze of Cerberus pierced the offender. The girl sat down on the floor, touching the surface. The monster growled. Fire was firing from its mouth. The green vine hit the monster again. Three participants appeared, saying that they would also be able to help. We should not forget about them. Their faces were serious. The girl asked everyone to distract Cerberus for a while so that she could apply a restraining spell. The swordsmen listened. They rushed straight at the monster to give the magician time. The fire wolf, growling loudly, scattered everyone who was nearby. The girl pushed off the floor, soaring up, now she was hovering over the beast, creating a spell. However, Cerberus was not stupid. He immediately saw her and, angered even more, raised his heads up, hitting there with fireballs. The girl managed to jump back in time. She created ice fetters. The monster's legs were blocked by ice. Chains with collars descended from above, which turned out to be on the necks of Cerberus. She seems to have succeeded. Yulman thought that the test would be over soon. He wanted to be sure to talk to this lady when it was over. Someone in the crowd smiled. A jet of fire swept past the girl who stopped the monster. She, surprised, cast a glance at the monster, at which the blow was aimed. Everything was ablaze around Cerberus. The ice chains and shackles, colliding with the flames, shattered into pieces. The girl who tried so hard to stop the monster was almost knocked down. She thought only about the flames and the consequences. Some guy shouted with displeasure, because someone present is a complete fool. Once he thought of using fire magic. The magician created a wind barrier to block the flying fragments of ice and flames. Others were surprised by his wind magic and how he wielded it. Cerberus growled, enveloped in the currents of the wind. Yulman noted that the wind will not be able to extinguish the flame, but in this way it is possible to restrain it. 
The wind magician must have calculated this. Now the fire wolf was coming straight at the girl who had recently come to the aid of Yulman. She stared at the impending danger, her eyes wide. Her magic hadn't recovered yet, which was why she couldn't attack. The apostle decided that this was his chance to prove himself. He quickly found himself next to the girl, who only looked at him questioningly, wondering why he had come. Yulman put his arm around the magician's shoulder, hugging him to himself. He asked the little younger sister not to be afraid, because this wild dog just needs to be kicked. Flashing his eyes and putting out his foot, Yulman really kicked the wolf with it so that he finally stopped talking. Cerberus flew away. Yulman was standing next to the girl with a smug smile. He was thinking that he was able to charm this lady with this for sure. But, looking at her, the guy found that she was about to cry. He did not expect such a reaction. He imagined a completely different one. The apostle hurried to find out from her about this. He asked if she was hurt, fearing that he had touched her when he kicked this dog. The girl with tears in her eyes replied that everything was fine and asked Yulman to let her go. Only now the apostle came to his senses. He felt the softness and elasticity in his hand. The girl, closing her eyes, again asked not to touch her there. Yulman immediately recoiled, raising his hands in the air, as if to show that he was no longer touching her. He began to apologize and say that it didn't happen on purpose. Both stood confused and confused, the girl turned away, and the guy awkwardly scratched the back of his head. Other guys who witnessed the situation said that he caught the moment to touch the goddess, wondered how he managed to approach her, and at the same time envied, wanting to be in his place. After a difficult test for everyone, an announcement thundered, this is the end of the test. A woman appeared in the hall in front of the test participants, who looked quite strict. She congratulated the guys and said that their test was over. A guy from among those present asked who she was. The woman introduced herself. It was Claire, the deputy director. The student started asking what the hell happened here. The woman asked uncomprehendingly. The student pointed to the dead students, saying that the usual test at the Royal Academy brought so many deaths was so dangerous. The woman chuckled. The dead students that were lying on the floor began to gradually disappear, moving to the deputy, in whose hands the cards soon appeared. She asked what it had just said about the students. Everything fell into place, it was the magic of puppets, all the dead students are fakes. Someone said that, according to rumors, the deputy director of the Royal Academy can control objects with magic. Now that everything was settled, the deputy director was going to say a few words. First of all, she wanted to congratulate everyone on passing the test and entering the ace class of the Royal Academy of the Fram Empire. Yulman Eves dropped on the conversations of the girls, who were discussing the ace class among themselves, which is led by some great wizard. But Yulman's thoughts were about something else. He hoped that this wizard would turn out to be some cute little sister. Claire decided to immediately introduce the students to the person who will lead the ace class. Yulman, seeing this girl with red hair, was amazed. Sierra Charlotte, the ace class leader, will now be in charge of the guys. Some were surprised that the fire witch herself would be their leader. The deputy director noticed that it seemed that everyone had already heard about the reputation of Sierra's teacher and told them to contact her directly if they had any questions. Claire said goodbye to the recruits, saying that it was time for her to return to her duties. The students crowded around Sierra, asking what they would do now. Yulman, lost in the crowd, tried to be inconspicuous. Sierra, looking sternly at her new students and crossing her arms over her chest, said that they could be free for today and tomorrow at 7 o'clock everyone should gather at the training ground for practice in combat. She also shared her hope that they would all get along with each other, and told everyone to disperse if there were no more questions. Only one person had a question, so he asked Sierra, who was already ready to leave this place, to wait. She turned around and asked what was the matter. The guy said that they all got into the ace class because of their strength. Pointing his finger at Yulman, he asked why he got into this class, why he passed. Yulman tried his best to appear calm and to keep himself in control. Sierra asked what was wrong with this guy, and a barrage of criticism and complaints fell on him. He did nothing. He was too lustful. He was inactive and only sneaked up on other students. He was just terrible. The girl who saved Yulman and who was later saved by Yulman himself began to justify him, convincing him that everything was wrong, he was there to help her, and everything else was just an accident. This attempt to protect another student aroused the admiration of other students, who immediately considered the goddess very kind. With an invariably stern expression on her face, Sierra went straight to the apostle. He was excited. He was comforted only by the thought that the girl should not recognize him, because last time he erased her memory. Sierra stopped near Yulman and began to look thoughtfully at his face. It seemed very familiar to her. Is it possible that they had crossed paths somewhere before? 
The guy started to brush it off, claiming that it was simply impossible. She probably confused him with someone. However, even his words did not convince her that they really had never met. Is it accurate? Yulman tried to convince her again. This is absolutely certain, because he would remember such a girl, and definitely would not be able to forget her. The other guys were outraged by such shameless behavior. How did this guy dare to approach the fire witch herself? One of the students turned to Sierra, saying that she should not allow such a student to enter the ace class. Sierra Charlotte turned to the students, hurrying to calm them down. According to her, she will only temporarily place him in the ace class. She also added that the previous girl explained to them that what happened during the test was just an accident, and he didn't do anything wrong. Besides, he is the only one here who dared to help that girl, and stood up against Cerberus. This courage is not like an ordinary person. Yulman was touched, he thanked the teacher Sierra for such a compliment. The teacher herself turned to other students, saying that those who are against her decision, they can try to convince her. They were dissatisfied people, but there were no people willing to argue with the fire witch. On the night of the same day, Ace, the director of the Royal Academy, was informed that everyone who participated in the battle against the Ice Dragon got into the Ace class. Sierra and Claire were standing in his office. Sierra confirmed everything that was said by the principal and asked if it was possible that the Apostle would be among these students. The director did not answer her question. He only asked how the entrance test went. The deputy reported that there was a student on the test who was able to stand up against Cerberus, but the fact is that no one saw what happened. This disciple was standing right in front of Cerberus, and then Cerberus flew to the side as if his body was out of control. Aces suggested that if Cerberus just flew away, the student could simply use the magic of talent. Talent magic is spells that ordinary magicians will not be able to use. Only a few capable magicians can use them. Talent magic is the rarest kind of magic. Sierra wondered if that was really the case. The director told the girls not to think too much about the apostle. It was already quite late, so he told them to go back and rest. The girls bowed and said goodbye to the director, asking him to go to rest too and wishing him good night. The door slammed shut behind the girls. Aces was left alone. He pulled out the cabinet of the table, where there was a hellfire in a bottle, the one that was found near the Sierra on the battlefield with the ice dragon. The director picked up this object and just looked at it, sighing. In the morning, Yulman walked through the territory of the academy and complained that he had to get up so early. He was not at his best and, yawning, complained of wanting to sleep. However, despite his fatigue, the guy quickly perked up when he saw the girl ahead. It was yesterday's little sister. Yulman's eyes sparkled. He realized that now was the right time to talk to her. The guy started running, greeting the girl on the way. He seemed determined to talk to her, his face a little flushed with embarrassment. Hearing a man's voice, the girl turned towards the guy, completely hitting him. He already felt like in paradise and almost fell off his feet. When Yulman came closer, the girl, straightening her hair, asked what he wanted from her. The apostle spoke again about the situation that happened at yesterday's test, repeating that it was an accident. The girl was embarrassed, and then remembered that she had to thank the guy for yesterday, because she could not have escaped from that monster. But, according to her, everyone misunderstood the situation. Yulman said there was nothing wrong with that, because he wasn't worried about it at all. The girl smiled sweetly, and then said that she still did not know his name. In turn, she also introduced herself, Aisha, and then asked what her interlocutor's name was. Aisha's question drove Yulman to a dead end. He thought about it, and then said that his name was Yu, only his first name, no last name. Aisha said that this name suits him very well. Scratching his head, Yulman laughed at her words, and then offered to go to the place of study, because their class must have already gathered there. The guy who had been unhappy since yesterday that Yulman had gone to Ace's class, watched these two from the side and for some reason was angry. As Yulman had expected, everyone was already assembled. The lesson could begin. Sierra announced that at today's lesson, the students will not fight against each other. Their opponent will be. A fiery beast appeared in the hall, Tiger Yong. Although he is the most common summoning fire-type beast, he has great fire power. Someone chuckled, is it fair to the tiger that they will all deal with one tiger? But Sierra didn't say he'd be alone. She said that a lottery will be held, according to which students will be divided into pairs. Two people with the same number will form a group, and within an hour, the couple must defeat the monster. The lottery started. Yulman got the number seven, which upset him because fate does not favor him. His number did not match Aisha's number. Her number is one. Aisha's partner approached her. It was the same guy who disliked Yulman. He bowed, saying that he was very lucky, because he could unite with her. He introduced himself as Kyle, the eldest son of the Bollet family. 
Aisha replied that they didn't have much time, so they should first discuss the battle strategy. Kyle confidently said that, compared to the others, one person would be enough for them to defeat Tiger Yong, so he volunteered to deal with it for her. Aisha wanted to object and seemed upset, but Kyle had already turned around and was walking away. His thoughts were occupied with the fact that with his strength and the strength of the Bollett family, he would deal with Tiger Yong, and then this girl would take care of him. Now Kyle was standing in front of the fire tiger, who had already seen his victim in him. But for the guy, this monster was a small animal. He attacked him with a wind blade. Sierra watched what was happening, drawing some conclusions for herself. Kyle's talent magic is a broken limiter. It can increase the outgoing magic attack by one level. Now it seemed that along with the effect of the increase, his attack level had increased to intermediate or even advanced. The fire tiger clawed the floor and glared at the boy, spewing fire from his mouth. Gathering his strength in his hands, Kyle, calling the tiger a pathetic insect, attacked him again. After the blow, a reaction followed. The air clashed with fire and enveloped the enemy. The other students were almost blown away from their seats. Such a strong wind was raised. Smiling, Kyle said that, as he said, he dealt with it quickly. The guy went to Asia, saying that this training was very simple. Aisha didn't seem cheerful, she looked behind her partner's back, and then said that the monster was right behind his back. Kyle turned around, the tiger, eyes flashing, flew straight at him with its mouth open. It seems that the guy did not expect such a turn, because he was quite surprised. The animal knocked the guy to the ground, hanging from above, which caused Kyle's displeasure, who began to scold this beast. The tiger opened its mouth and breathed flames on Kyle. Other students were agitated, someone was addressing the teacher. Sierra, frowning and thoughtful, silently watched. Kyle, using magic, threw the tiger away from him, he flew to the side. The guy got to his feet. Now he has definitely won. All battered and dirty, the guy apologized for the trouble and said he wasn't going to die here. Kyle returned to Asia, asking how she liked his battle with the tiger. He added that their team should be the first to cope with this task. Sierra turned to the two students standing opposite each other and congratulated them, saying that they were the second of those who completed this task. Now they were allowed to rest. Kyle was stunned by this news. He asked again, are they second? It seemed impossible, so the guy started protesting. No one could do it faster than he could. Here, in his opinion, there is clearly some kind of mistake. Sierra stood her ground. It's not impossible. She pointed out to the first team that she had finished the test. They have already completed the task and were one step ahead of the second team. Kyle was even more puzzled when he saw which team he was talking about. Yulman and his partner sat next to the tiger and were touched, stroking him like a little pet kitten. The observers also looked at this sweetness with joy. Fifteen minutes ago, Yulman stood upset and could not believe that he was so unlucky. A girl addressed him. He turned around, looked at her and asked if she was talking to him. The girl said that she also has number seven, because they will be in the same group. She immediately introduced herself, her name was Augie. Yulman did not answer her, and she was not happy with such a reaction. Yulman's head was occupied only with Aisha. Her name flew from his lips. Augie, getting angry, called the guy a freak and, clutching her weapon in her hands, decided to teach him a lesson. Jumping up, she swung and was going to hit this insolent man who completely ignores her. Yulman, stopping the girl's weapon with one finger, said he could hear everything. The girl was still unhappy with this guy. She said she had heard that Yulman was a pervert. These words were like a knife to the heart. Augie told Yulman not to cause her problems, since she is able to cope with Tiger Young alone. Out loud, the guy agreed with her words, and then wondered if she could really cope on her own. The girl, pushing off with her feet from the surface, flew into the air and struck at the tiger. The tiger looked at her furiously, showing his fangs. The girl looked back at him with the same seriousness, tightly clutching her weapon in her hands. She hit the handle of the weapon on the ground with force. The tile cracked in the place where the blow was struck. With her foot, the girl hit the fire tiger hard, but he wrapped his fiery tail around her leg and threw her aside. Her weapon also flew to her. Augie was squatting on her haunches, gritting her teeth and looking at the opponent. In the jump the tiger seemed even more furious and vicious. He flew straight at the girl, and she, in turn, grabbed the weapon and quickly inserted it into the tiger's mouth between the upper and lower jaw. She resisted to the last, but the tiger did not retreat, it was already hard for the girl to hold him. She thought she could have coped if she had been a little stronger. Yulman's voice came from behind the girl. He turned to the tiger, asking why he was so cruel to his little sister. The guy called him a little kitten and looked him straight in the eyes. The tiger stared at this guy with bulging eyes. Yulman calmly said that the matter with the tiger seemed to be resolved. 
Augie did not immediately understand what he was talking about and then looked at the tiger. There was nothing left of the furious beast. Now he was a friendly and cute kitten. Pointing her finger at the tiger, Augie screamed, asking what happened to him. Sierra noted that the most difficult way to defeat a monster is to tame it. Aisha said in surprise that this was the first time she had seen a person do something like that. Only Kyle was unhappy with this arrangement. Is this a joke? The thought was spinning in his head that he was fighting and Yulman was just lucky to meet a harmless tiger. Now, when Yulman and Augie were making out with the tiger, Kyle decided to voice his thoughts. He said that he really envied Yulman's luck because he was lucky to meet a harmless tiger. Augie wasn't going to be silent. She stood up and shouted at Kyle. Another student agreed with Kyle, saying that he was telling the truth and complaining that their team had caught such an evil tiger that one of them was seriously injured. Without leaving the fiery beast, Yulman said that it was not luck but his magic, the taming of the beast. Sierra was shocked by this statement. Kyle did not believe in this nonsense. He said that he had never heard of such talent magic and suggested that Yulman show it to everyone to prove the truth of his words. Yulman smiled. He didn't mind proving his words at all. The tiger that was lying on its back raised its head. Several of these fiery monsters appeared around Yulman, but they did not touch him. The students wondered what was going on with these animals. The guy said that, as the saying goes, you won't see, you won't believe. The tigers behind him seemed to bow obediently to their master. Yulman added that if someone didn't see something, it doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. He was smiling, showing off his magic. Kyle couldn't understand how this could be. Aisha looked at it with bulging eyes. Augie was surprised that her partner was hiding such strength. Everyone present saw with their own eyes that Yulman was telling the truth. Sierra finally joined the conversation, saying that that was enough, we could finish training for today. She removed the monsters, and then turned to Yulman, asking when he was going to register his talent magic, because it has not been registered yet. The apostle said that no one asked him to do this. Sierra apologized to the students and said that the situation was urgent, so she needed to go to the academic affairs department to bring in new information. Sierra was already leaving. With that, the training came to an end, now everyone could be free. Yulman was looking at her back. He was thinking that once, fortunately, he had read one of the human novels, in which there was the magic of talent, taming, because Sierra should not suspect anything. A bright sunny day. There were a lot of people scurrying around the academy. Yulman was standing in the company of Aga and Aisha. Augie slapped Yulman on the back and, calling him a pervert, said that she did not expect him to have such strength. It was commendable. Yulman indignantly asked not to call him that, because he is not a pervert at all. He has a name, you. Aisha stood silently next to him and smiled sweetly. Then Kyle appeared and started talking about the magic of Yulman's talent again. According to him, now it is not surprising that Cerberus did not attack him at the entrance test. Others agreed with Kyle, his words were similar to the truth. The apostle, it seemed, was already tired of these conversations, it started again. Someone said that with the ability to control a summoning beast, the guy could easily direct Cerberus to attack everyone else. Another student suggested that Yulman deliberately did this and then used the opportunity to grope the goddess. The guy was amazed that the human imagination can be so developed. Augie stood up for her partner, defending his rights. Does the fact that he can do it say that it was so? Besides, would they all have been able to pass the test if you had sent Cerberus straight at them? The students thought about it. Aisha joined Augie to exonerate Yulman. According to her, talent magic requires great abilities and long training. Besides, the wind barrier at that time was unlikely to be able to resist Cerberus, and you saved her in time. So she is very grateful to him and hopes that the students will no longer make erroneous assumptions. Kyle was hurt because of the girl's words that the wind barrier would not be able to resist. He clenched his hands into a fist, his anger was at the limit. This girl, in his opinion, is lying to help that freak. Yulman didn't need anything else, he was melting from Aisha's kindness and from her words. Augie, who also sided with and defended Yu, was deprived of attention. Someone knocked on the door of the director of the Royal Academy. Aces let me in. Sierra rushed in impatiently, claiming that she had found him, a man with the magic of the taming talent. The director, who was sitting at the table in front of an open book, was very intrigued by her words. The first thing the principal asked was how strong the beasts could be controlled by the student in question. Sierra didn't know the answer to that question herself yet, but it looked like this student could instantly tame a Cerberus-type beast. The director of Aces said that Sierra should find out as soon as possible. Yulman, Augie and Aisha were together now. 
Augie, stretching tiredly, was annoyed that the rest time ended so quickly. Checking the notes, Aisha thoughtfully said that it seemed that today they would be going through history. Yulman didn't understand, so he asked again. Aisha replied that, according to rumors, this is a subject that deeply studies many major historical events. Yulman hoped that they would not talk about the cities that he had bombed. Augie noticed teacher Sierra. The other two also looked at her. Yulman had a bad feeling. Strictly Sierra said that Yulman needed to go to the court tower with her. Four beautiful girls were depicted on stone columns inside the courthouse tower. That's where Sierra brought Yulman. They came to the center of the hall. Yulman, laughing, asked why Miss Sierra brought him here. Sierra was going to ask the guy something. Sierra Charlotte said she would only ask him once if he would become a disciple of the Fire Witch. Yulman did not expect such an offer, and Sierra was sure that no one would refuse to be a disciple of the Great Imperial Magician. However, there was one who refused, it was Yulman. The offer was not to his taste. Sierra, apparently not immediately understanding the answer, already ready for his consent, smiled automatically and asked to wait a minute. And then the realization came to her, he refused. At first she asked again, and then she screamed loudly at the whole hall. Pointing at Yulman with her finger, she asked if he had really just refused. Yulman answered honestly and seriously. He is here only to find a wife, he is not here at all to become someone's student and work hard. And then an idea came to him, which he voiced, there is no rule that would prohibit a student and a teacher from getting married. Sierra immediately told him not to even think about it. The guy sighed sadly, regretting such an instant rejection. Sorry, in that case, he was ready to just leave the tower and told Sierra to forget about taking him as an apprentice. Sierra gritted her teeth. How does he think to find a wife with his status? These words struck a chord, so he stopped. Sierra invited him to remember how he lived before he got into this academy. Memories came flooding back immediately. When Yulman first came to the world of people, he found that the price tags here were more than the records of the apostles. Even the cake was too expensive for him. He also faced a large commission. Yulman imagined what would have happened if he had returned to the old days. Aisha would have run away from him. Because because of his poverty they could not be together. Just thinking about it, Yulman screamed loudly that this would never happen. Sierra smiled as if she expected such a result, and then said that if he became her disciple, he would receive status and access to her property. The girl rose into the air. A fire was burning around her. She decided to ask for the last time, is this guy ready to become a student of Sierra Charlotte? Yulman laughed. Did Miss Sierra really think she could convince him so easily with just that? But immediately the guy ran to the teacher and said that he agreed to everything and was ready to become her student. Sierra told Yulman not to jump here, but he jumped up, hugging the girl by the legs. Now they both collapsed on the floor. Clinging to the feet of the master, Yulman said that she should encourage her student. Various signs and objects were reflected on the ceiling of the courtroom. It looked really fascinating. Two people were lying on the floor in the very center, Sierra and Yulman, who had agreed to become her disciple. The girl said that the guy might not worship her and asked him to finally let her go. Yulman asked what was wrong with the student holding the master's hips. The ceiling shone. Yulman immediately drew attention to it and fixed his gaze on the light streaks flying in their direction. Sierra called him an idiot. One of the stone girls from the column reported that the contract had been concluded. A fiery mark appeared on Yulman's forehead. He immediately touched this place and said that there was something strange on his forehead. Sierra clenched her fist. She seemed angry. At the same moment, she grabbed Yulman by the collar and asked if he knew that when a contract is signed between a master and a disciple, the mark of the contract appears in the place where they touched. Yulman said that the girl did not warn him about it. She released him and sighed. Holding her head, she closed her eyes and said that. In any case, this label does not appear just like that. Only now did Yulman realize that Sierra's mark was now on her hip. The academic canteen was noisy. The guys were discussing the latest news. Teacher Sierra had summoned you to the court tower, and he didn't seem to have returned from there yet. Augie and Aisha were sitting at the same table and looked like something had upset them. Augie said that in the court tower, the Royal Academy judges and punishes students. Aisha was upset, because Yulman had done nothing wrong. Kyle just laughed at this situation. He said that apparently Yulman lied about his magic talent taming, and it was discovered. Glancing at Augie, he added that it seems that the lower strata are worried about each other. Yulman must have been expelled yesterday. After all, the dregs remain the dregs. Augie was furious, she yelled at Kyle, asking what he was talking about. Aisha tried to calm her friend down, but Kyle did not let up, saying that there was nothing surprising in her behavior, because she was the same trash as Yulman. 
Aisha angrily turned to Kyle, reminding him that quite recently he himself had seen the magic of Yulman's talent with his own eyes. This is a fact, so the guy should better watch his words. The voice of the man who was being so violently discussed now rang out. He witnessed a conversation about himself. Kyle looked in his direction. Yulman smiled, saying that he had only been away for one night, but they had already missed him. Now he looked somehow different, and there was a bag of money on his belt. Aisha beamed, it was impossible not to notice that she was glad to see her friend. Yulman said that the girl is very nice as always. Augie said that he was still lustful and got the answer, she was called the same cruel and active. Augie asked why Sierra's teacher took him away yesterday, and Kyle, intervening again, asked what they were doing there. He must have been expelled from the academy. Aisha excitedly said that none of this was true. Yulman smiled smugly, saying that nothing had happened, except that Master Sierra had signed a contract with him. Have they signed a master and apprentice contract? Even ordinary passers-by were shocked, not to mention Augie, Aisha and Kyle. The apostle took a step forward, showing others the mark, which was supposed to be proof that he was not lying. Talking about the contract of the master and the disciple with the teacher Sierra, Kyle chuckled again. He said that even if Yulman has the magic of taming animals, he was just lucky that there were animals on the test. If it had been different, would he have got into the ace class? Kyle Bollett suggested that Yulman try to fight him. Aisha intervened, angrily saying that even if so, Yulman still has talent magic. She is strong enough to enter the ace class. The apostle was touched by his defender. She wanted to say something else, but Kyle rudely interrupted her, using wind magic. Augie was shocked, and Yulman was angry. Kyle told the girl not to get into someone else's conversation when she wasn't asked to. Augie immediately ran up to her friend, asking if she was okay. She said that everything was fine and asked not to worry. Yulman asked again about Kyle's offer to fight him. Smiling sweetly, he agreed to it. With a twinkle in his eyes, the apostle expressed his hope that Mr. Kyle would be gentle with him. Kyle and Yulman were standing opposite each other, each of them looking directly into the eyes of the opponent. Crossing his arms over his chest, Yulman first of all asked about the rules. What conditions will their duel have? Kyle said that he would release the maximum of his magical energy and strike. If Yulman survives, he wins. If he loses, he will have to immediately leave the ace class. Augie was angry. This Kyle is so mean. There is not a single monster there now, and it's not at all fair to you. Whose magic is animal control? Aisha just watched in silence. Yulman noticed that Mr. Kyle looked confident. He smiled. Air currents began to appear around him, and then a sword formed in his hand. This weapon attracted the apostle's attention. Aisha jumped up from her seat, saying that this could not be, and stared at Kyle and the sword. Augie excitedly asked what was the matter. She told one legend, according to which one day the ancestor of the Bollett family received as a gift from the king of the elements countless amounts of gold and silver, as well as one of the rarest treasures. If Aisha's memory does not fail, this sword is called Excalibur. Yulman told Kyle that he had a very interesting sword. He offered the guy this, if he, Yulman, loses, he will not only leave the ace class, but also leave the academy itself. Kyle was pleased. He said with a sneer that Yulman finally realized that he did not belong here. But Yulman continued to voice his conditions. If Kyle loses, he will have to give him his sword. Kyle was taken aback. Augie, who was watching from the side, shouted that Kyle was not an easy opponent, but still wished Yulman good luck and hoped that he would cope. Yulman smiled broadly, asking Kyle if he thought he might lose. Kyle gritted his teeth and accepted all the conditions. He asked not to blame him for the fact that there are no beasts here that could help Yulman block his sword. He also ordered you not to dare to ask him for mercy. Kyle held the sword out in front of him, saying something in an unknown language. Yulman noticed that this sword releases magical energy quite well. The two girls watched the progress of the battle with furrowed brows. Kyle screamed and, striking with his sword, used the wind sentence. Yulman only waved one hand and stopped the enemy's attack with it, which shocked him. Because of the rising dust and wind, the girls could not see everything that was happening on the battlefield. And now they were watching and did not understand who had defeated whom. Kyle stammered and asked how Yulman was able to stop his attack. Yulman just smiled, saying that it was not worth wasting time. Kyle did not have time to do anything, when suddenly the sword was already in the hands of Yulman, who said that he would accept it. He thanked Mr. Kyle and praised him for such generosity and for the excellent weapon. Kyle was furious, he clenched his fists, but he could not really answer because these were the conditions of the battle. Aisha and Augie were happy for their friend, it was great that he won, but they were also interested in his well-being. 
Yulman looked at the girls who were shouting something at him and then remembered how Kyle attacked Aisha. The apostle said that he hoped that this would never happen again. His eye flashed red. Yu's behavior scared Kyle seriously. He looked at him questioningly, and then Yulman's hand touched Kyle's chest, striking a magic blow. Spitting blood, Kyle flew to the side, crashing into something and smashing what he came into contact with. Aisha and Augie were looking at what their friend had just done with round eyes again. Kyle, who had just been defeated, lay unconscious. Still with his arm outstretched, Yulman looked at his opponent. He was pleased and was smiling all over. Well, that's it. Kyle, wounded, lay on his back and coughed up blood. He tried to get up. His body was shaking. He did not believe that such a thing was possible. How could Yulman defeat him? Yulman smiled and said that he was taking this sword for himself, as they had agreed earlier. Kyle didn't like it. Yulman was hailed by his girlfriends. He turned around, and they ran to him, rejoicing at his victory. Augie looked at the sword, admiring the fact that Yulman was really taking it. Aisha noted that the guy is stronger than she thought. The girl's words confused him a little. He modestly said that he was actually very strong. Augie suddenly had an idea. She said that since they had no lessons today, they could throw a party and celebrate Yulman's victory. He liked this idea. His eyes sparkled when he presented a large amount of food. While the three were rejoicing and making plans, Kyle was shaking with anger behind their backs. Maybe panic was added to this. He didn't know what would happen to him if his father found out that Excalibur was lost. He shouted loudly to stop the departing students. Yulman turned his head in his direction without a trace of a smile. Kyle was already on his feet. He declared that he could not give this sword to Yulman. Aisha was angry, because the sword was a condition that Kyle himself agreed to. She still hadn't given up hope that Kyle would be able to keep his word. But Bollet decided to go to the last. According to him, Yulman definitely cheated somehow, and only for the sake of justice the sword should be returned to the owner. However, Yulman was not going to make concessions. He refused to return the sword, which seems to have caused Kyle's sincere surprise. Bollet asked if he was definitely refusing. He decided to use magic, saying that in this case, Yulman cannot hope that he will be able to leave unharmed from this site. Kyle used a wind vortex against this company. Augie noticed that it seems Kyle can't afford to lose this sword. The apostle, collecting magical energy in his hand, said that, alas, nothing would come of the guy. Yulman held the sword in his hand, sometimes looking at it thoughtfully. Kyle again ordered him to return his sword, only in this case he was ready to spare the opponent. Yulman, smiling, asked what would happen if he refused. The answer was not long in coming, death. Bollet said that he would die if he did not do as he was told. The wind mage used his spell again, this time wind vortex blade. The apostle was facing danger, but he didn't seem scared. Because of the wind and dust, visibility was zero. Augie and Aisha only covered their faces while in this vortex. Some kind of glow appeared in the air in front of the guys. They looked at what was happening. Even Kyle was puzzled. It was Excalibur that rose into the air. The jewel in it sparkled. Something continued to happen with the sword. All this was accompanied by a dazzling glow, because of which the girls covered their eyes. Yulman watched curiously, standing very close. In place of Excalibur, a girl with long green hair appeared, not a trace of the sword remained. The girl sat down on the ground and introduced herself. Her name is Sylph. She got down on one knee, bowing before Yulman, and announced that she, the sword of the King of the Elements, welcomes the new owner. Augie thought she misheard. Did this girl really just say that she was the sword of the King of the Elements? Aisha and Kyle were just as shocked as Augie. The girl who appeared in the place of the sword knelt before Yulman, introducing herself and greeting the new owner. Yulman, interested, immediately guessed that Sylph was the spirit of this sword. Sylph confirmed his words, yes, she is actually the spirit of Excalibur, according to the agreement of Yulman and Kyle. Now she, the sword of the king of the elements, will belong to the new owner. She hurried to find out what her master wanted. Augie concluded that it was not surprising that this sword was considered a precious treasure, since it even had a spirit. To begin with, the apostle asked Sylph to get up from her knees. She immediately obeyed. Kyle, enraged, said that only he himself is her real master. Sylph looked at the guy indifferently and said nothing. Kyle kept yelling. He was sure that he definitely wouldn't have lost if the sword spirit had shown up earlier. He ordered Sylph to return back to him immediately. Augie was amazed at the shamelessness of this guy. How could he even say such a thing? Aisha also looked without much pleasure at everything that was happening here. Yulman turned to Sylph to find out if she wanted to return to her former master. The answer was given quickly and without much thought. No, she didn't want that. After that, she explained her decision. Firstly, conditions were agreed at the beginning of the duel. 
The old owner put her on the line and lost. Naturally, Sylf changed her master. Secondly, it is up to her to decide whether to change the owner or not. Kyle wasn't satisfied with her words, they were out of his ego. Yulman sternly said that now that Sylph had clarified everything, he was asking Mr. Kyle to stop humiliating himself even more. Kyle's displeased gaze never left his opponent. Meanwhile, Yulman decided to apologize to Sylph for using her as a bet. Ono bent down, stroking her on the head. The apostle also asked if she would help him in the future. The girl was taken aback, and then smiled and gave a positive answer. Of course she would help him. Kyle couldn't calm down, he laughed, saying that they shouldn't underestimate his strength. He decided to use magic again, but this time it didn't look the same as before, now his energy turned red. He said that since this has happened, he will reveal something now. Balit shouted that, as a member of such a significant family, he could not allow such scum to offend him. His hands were raised up, something began to form right above him. He called the spell, Flight of the Phoenix, and a fiery bird appeared right above him. Augie was afraid that with such an attack, Kyle would not leave a single piece of this place. Yulman asked not to worry about it, he was going to sort everything out, but suddenly someone's hands grabbed his hand. It was Sylph. She asked the owner to use her. Smiling, he agreed, telling her to lend him her powers if she wanted to participate in this. A firebird hovered above them, making noises. A sword appeared in Yulman's hands. Sylph became him again to allow the master to use his powers. The apostle saw his goal. He was serious and resolute. With a few sword strokes, he crushed the phoenix, leaving it defeated behind his back. The power of Kyle's spell dissipated. The shockwave knocked him off his feet, he could only scream. Aisha and Augie were also barely able to stand on their feet. Yulman was standing on the wreckage with a sword in his hand. His friends were now standing nearby, looking around. Kyle Bollett, wounded and defeated for the umpteenth time, lay on the ground and said that it was all over now. Restaurant, it was crowded inside. Students were sitting at the table studying the menu of the institution. Aga also had a menu in her hands. She joyfully proclaimed that the victory over Kyle was being celebrated now. Four, Yulman, Sylph, Augie and Aisha were sitting at a table that was bursting with various treats and dishes, among which there were sweets. Sylph looked at it thoughtfully, because she had never seen such food before. Aisha said that Sylph should definitely try something here, because the food prepared in this restaurant is very tasty. Yulman's hair stood on end, he decided that now he had a chance to conquer Aisha's heart, and this chance should be taken advantage of. The guy asked if Aisha knows how to eat so that it tastes better. Aisha suggested that you need to eat everything while it's warm. Yulman's eyes sparkled, because he had his answer ready. He just needed him to feed her with a spoon. Aisha was confused by his words. Augie said that she suddenly felt full, and Sylph was already enjoying her meal. In the office of the deputy director, Claire was sitting at her desk. In front of her were two paper men who depicted a very familiar picture. One was standing with a sword in his hands, and the other was almost lying on the ground. Plyer took a small sword from the little man's hands, believing that in the end Kyle lost his Excalibur to a student named Yu. The paper man, as if confirming the truthfulness of her words, nodded his head. The deputy director exhaled. She told me to tell Sierra and Director Aces about this so that they could decide together what to do and what to do next. Claire thought about the fact that that sword had a spirit. She was afraid that the Bollett family would not just leave what had happened. It was already quite late. It was dark outside. In the dormitory building Yulman was lying on his bed, thinking about what amazing people, since they could create such a yummy from simple ingredients. His smile never left his face. In his opinion, Aisha was so sweet and gentle today. If she had married him, then in his castle. Yulman's imagination was already at full work. He fantasized how Aisha was sitting with dessert in her hands, asking if he was hungry, because today she cooked him his favorite food and after that she was interested in what he wanted to eat first, the dish or her. The apostle was tumbling from side to side on his bed, repeating the name of his beloved. Sylph saw all his throwing. She sat touching the edge of the bed, noticing that her master seemed very happy. The girl appeared so suddenly that she frightened Yulman with her appearance. He jumped up, pulling the blanket over himself. Sylph drooped and immediately apologized, explaining that she suddenly felt strong fluctuations in the emotional state of the owner, and therefore appeared without permission. The apostle hastened to calm her down, saying that everything was fine, she just had to tell him next time when she decided to appear before him in human form. He stroked her head again. Sylph agreed with all his words, and then asked why he was so happy now. The guy replied that he was so happy because spring had come to him, and everything was boiling inside him. Sylph noticed that this is very similar to the desire for physiological needs that she knows about. Yulman closed his eyes, saying that it was almost the same thing. 
The girl suddenly grabbed his clothes with one hand, which caused surprise. Looking at the owner, she suggested that maybe she could help him with his condition. The guy didn't get it at first, so he thought about it. And then, blushing, he said that it was not very good. Sylph insisted, because it is her job to help her master. Yulman assumed an imperturbable look and, raising his fist to his chin, with his eyes closed, said that he did not mind, since she herself sincerely wanted to help him. Sylph conjured scissors, Yulman looked at them uncomprehendingly. The girl, holding this object in her hands, warned that it might hurt a little, but she would try to be gentle. The apostle, realizing what was the matter, immediately fell to his knees, asking for forgiveness and admitting his mistake. In another room, Sierra was sitting on a bed in her night clothes. She was holding a pile of papers in her hands. Among them, she found a surname, Zessi, the same as the general's, but she knew that the general's family did not have a daughter named Aguiri. But the last name is the same. On one of the sheets there was a questionnaire of Yulman. She was looking at his picture and couldn't imagine how he beat Kyle today. However, the fire witch decided to postpone this matter until tomorrow, personally asking Yulman about it. Now she put all the papers on the table and turned off the light in the room. On top of all the other questionnaires on the table was Aisha's questionnaire, from which it became known that she is a noblewoman. Her mother's name is Lilith Lawrence, and her stepfather is Paul Lawrence. Her place of residence is the western suburbs, the estate of the Lawrence family, and also her feature is that she uses close combat. On the shelves of a wooden cabinet there are flasks with various liquids. The sun is shining brightly outside the window and the sound of the wind is heard. On this warm day, a girl with bright red hair is sitting at the table opposite the young man. The girl suddenly hits the table with her hand, thereby causing fright in the young man who is sitting opposite her. She is very angry with the young man because as soon as they signed the contract of the master and the disciple, the guy immediately ran to brag about it in front of everyone. In addition, he decided to arrange a duel with another guy named Kyle. The girl's anger is only growing. She begins to suspect that the guy is deliberately creating problems. The young man tries to calm down his master. He tries to soften her anger by pointing out that sooner or later everyone would have found out about it anyway. The girl is adamant. She demands to explain the purpose of the duel with Kyle. The guy temporarily fell into a stupor. Then he explained the duel with Kyle by saying that he was the first to propose a duel, while glaring at the young man, so he could not refuse the duel. The guy says that Kyle behaved very arrogantly and used various tricks during the battle itself. According to the dark-haired man, he easily defeated Kyle, because he is much stronger than him. The girl notices that the guy behaves much more arrogantly. The girl, looking menacingly at the guy, says that when she signed a master and apprentice contract with him, she felt only the basic magic of a young man without an attribute. She asks him how he was able to master the magic of the taming talent. The guy just grins, saying that he has always been capable of this. The girl drooped after his words. The girl approaches the bookcase, starting to look at various books and telling the young man not to provoke trouble, but to study the attributes of magic. Then she turns around and asks not to call her master. When he calls her that, she feels several decades older. The young man smiles and asks if she will become his wife instead of the master. The next moment, he feels the bottom edge of the book pressing against the top of his head and screams sharply. The girl, holding the book in her hand, says that she did not hear and asks him to repeat what he said. The young man straightens up and says that he will stop calling the girl his master. On the street near the building, bushes are noisily swaying in the wind. A little further from the bushes, a girl with bright red hair is standing on a gray square, and next to her is a gray-haired man in glasses and dark loose clothes. The girl thanks the man with glasses, because thanks to him the issue with Excalibur was resolved. She says that the Bollett family could not find him. The man replies that Kyle's skills are not very good, and the loss of Excalibur is deserved. Also their family, because of their strength, should not consider that everything is permissible for them. Then the man turns completely to the girl and asks if everyone knows now that it was her student. He informs her that there will be a magic meeting next week and asks her to take her student with her. The girl nods and promises to try to ensure that her student improves his skills before the magic meeting. The man brings his hand closer to his beard and, chuckling, says that with age the girl becomes more polite. He says that he remembers how she came to him when she was very young, but now the girl has grown up and has become an adult and independent. And then he starts coughing. The girl jumps up sharply to the man, worried about what happened to him. The man asks her not to worry and explains the cough with old age. Noticing the girl's anxious look, he takes her hand in his and asks her not to worry about him, but rather to focus on the magical meeting. The man says that perhaps it is at the magic meeting that there will be a chance to awaken her talent magic. 
The girl seriously says that if she can awaken her talent magic, then she will be able to help him and the man will not be so tired. The man was delighted with the news and promised that he would wait for this day. The rays of the bright sun penetrate into the room with bookcases. A young man is sitting near one of these bookcases, holding a dark bound book in his hands and a girl with long green hair is standing. The young man puts his hand to his face and says that people use attributes in magic to use natural elements. At this moment, a girl approaches him with a cup in her hands. She says there was no coffee, so she brought the usual green tea. The young man is not upset, saying that green tea is also delicious. The girl with green hair bends down and smiles, and the young man, noticing her gaze on himself, asks if everything is alright. The girl says she does not understand why the young man does not tell anyone the truth, because in fact he is very strong. The young man brings a cup of green tea to his mouth and says that when the power goes beyond the understanding of people, they begin to be afraid and please in different ways. But the most unpleasant thing is that they try to stay away from you, because they are afraid not only of you, but also of your potential. The young man remembers himself in the image of a powerful man, before whom people bow down, greeting him. Once he approached a woman, expressing his admiration for her beauty and offering to admire the moon together. But the girl was only alarmed and tried to come up with a reason for her refusal. The young man was very upset by this attitude. Returning to the present moment, he listens to the question of the girl with green hair. She asks if he has the same acquaintances as him. The young man really had acquaintances, but they have been traveling for a long time, so he does not know where they are all now. Nevertheless, he feels like an ordinary person, the same as everyone else. The girl with green hair only thinks that there were misunderstandings between the young man and people. In a noisy corridor filled with people, various interesting discussions can be heard. Someone has heard that the fire witch has taken an apprentice, and someone is wondering who could have become this very student. Someone suggests that they are just a couple. One young man from the crowd says that they cannot be a couple, since he saw the mark of the master on the disciple on his forehead. The second young man says that he should understand that only a couple of lovers will be able to engrave a mark directly on the forehead. The whole conversation was overheard by a girl with purple hair. It's night outside. In one of the rooms of the two-story house, the lights are still on and sounds are heard. A girl with bright red hair walks into this very room, holding a tray of food in her hands. On the way to the room, she remembers that she forgot to remove the magic seal from the entrance. She is interested in what her student has learned during this time. She goes to the right door, removes the seal, goes inside and asks how her student is studying, notifying that she brought him some food. Then she sees her student lying on the lap of a girl with green hair. She is in shock. On the street, a person passing by a house hears a deafening sound and the next moment covers himself from a sharp blinding flash coming from one room of the house. Inside the room, together with a green-haired girl, there is a young man who asks for his master's forgiveness and promises not to abuse his rest anymore. The master looks at the green-haired girl and asks her if she is the spirit of the sword. The green-haired girl introduces herself as Sylph. She asks a red-haired girl to become her mentor. Such a statement strikes a red-haired girl. She thinks to herself that Sylph is very cute. The silence drags on, so he calls out to the master. The master clears his throat and says that he has come to them to inform them about the capital's magic congress, which will be held next week, and in which they will take part. The young man is a little doubtful and says that the name is too sugary. Such a statement angers the master. The next moment, her student is sitting with a bruise on his head while Sylph waves a book in front of him. The young man apologizes to the master again and asks her to continue talking. The master says that at first she did not plan to take them to the capital's magic congress. She continues, the organizers of the event did not expect that the young man would be able to get the Excalibur of the Bollet family, and in addition, a sword spirit would appear from him. The young man listens attentively to his master. The girl says that it was hard for the organizer to make a decision and still invite them. She does not give a choice, because if they refuse, then the young man's entourage and self could be in danger. The young man tensed. The master continues, she says that the majority at the meeting will try to put pressure on the young man. He just grins and says that the master should not worry, because it is still unclear who will put pressure on whom. The ice sword chops off several blades. The sword was in the hands of a girl with purple eyes, who rolled back into a defensive stance. It was clear from her look that she was determined. A woman outside the ring says that the sparring is over and now the participants can take a break. The girl comes out of the playground and wipes her face with a handkerchief. At the same moment, she hears conversations coming from the crowd of young men. The guys were discussing Kyle. 
They think he didn't come because he angered you. Now he is trying to resist the fire witch. One of the young men had no idea that you was clinging to influential people. The girl with purple eyes hears the sound of footsteps behind her and turns to see you approaching her. He says a lot of different gossips have appeared during his absence. A crowd of guys saw you coming in and, coming up with various reasons for their departure, ran away. They approached the director. She, in turn, was surprised by his appearance. The girl asks you why he came to the playground. She had heard that Sierra's teacher had allowed her to attend training. The guy took out a rose and replied that he had come to visit the beautiful Aisha. The girl is embarrassed and says that Sylph and the teacher are beautiful and charming. The guy doesn't understand what the girl is talking about. The girl, holding a rose in her hands, says that she heard that you should go with the teacher to the Capital Magic Congress. The young man smooths his hair and confirms the girl's words. He says that when he leaves, there will be no need to miss him. Suddenly, a girl appears next to you, who makes a sarcastic comment. The young man answering her, asking if she got it today during sparring. The girl pulls out her weapon, exclaiming menacingly. Aisha stands in a stupor. The sun illuminates the houses. On this sunny day, Sylph and you are standing near a carriage with white horses harnessed to it. The master looks out of the carriage window and asks to go already so as not to delay the departure. The young man says that this morning he wanted to say goodbye to Aisha. Sylph notices that she checked the rooms and Aisha wasn't there. Yu turns to the master and starts talking. But the girl interrupts him and says that he has three seconds to get into the carriage. The carriage starts off and goes at full speed to the Magic Congress. Aisha looks out the window and sees the carriage leaving. She's worried about you. Dark matter appears behind her, calling her. Aisha turns and listens. A voice coming from the dark matter says that there is no one strong left to protect the academy. This evening it will be possible to begin the task that her master gave her. Aisha confirms his words. A voice coming from the dark matter says a guy named Yu loves Aisha very much. If the gentleman finds out about this, he will be very angry. Aisha abruptly turns around and says that everything about you, you can't tell either your father or mother. She's asking for it. The voice chuckles and says that it will make a decision in accordance with how she will complete the task. The sun illuminates the crowns of the trees. A carriage is passing through these trees, hurrying to the capital's magic congress. The annual capital magic congress was held in turn by three main clans, Bollet, Capella, Isis. The master, Sylph and you are sitting in the carriage. The master says that the Capital Magic Congress was the main solemn meeting of the world of magicians, where the best of them gathered to discuss the highest magical achievements and many other important moments. Yu is surprised that the Bollet family turned out to be one of the three main clans. The master asks to underestimate them, since the Bollet clan are descendants of the heroes of the founders of the Empire. They are inferior in status only to the Imperial family. Sylph does not support dialogue. The master continues, she says that the Isis clan controls most of the empire's military forces and have outstanding magical skills. Having sorted out the two clans, Yu asks about the last clan, the chapel. The master says that the Capella clan monopolized most of the empire's trade routes and the pharmaceutical industry, as well as that they own untold wealth. Yu had a feeling that the reigning family of this empire does not control anything at all. The master says that this time the Magic Congress is organized by the Capella clan, so you need to be careful. The young man considers this an ordinary participation in a banquet, so he does not understand what he should be afraid of. Yu says that there will be a huge amount of delicious food at this banquet, so he and Sylph will need to eat as much as possible. Sylph was inspired at the moment. The master sighed and switched to thinking that there was still one problem with the Capella clan that would be difficult to solve. A few days later, Yu, Sylph, and Master arrived at the imperial capital of Fram. They stopped in front of the fountain. A servant announced that they had arrived at the manor of the Capella clan. He also helped them get out of the carriage. Sierra got out of the carriage first. An employee of the estate greeted. Then another employee of the estate came up and thanked them for coming, and also informed them that the owner of the estate had been waiting for them at the gathering place for a long time. Sierra asks to tell the owner of the estate that he should not strain himself, since they still have things that cannot be postponed for a long time. The employee is doubtful, because he was sure that Sierra knew how he felt about her. The girl sharply directed her displeased gaze at the employee, which caused him to immediately tense up. Sierra turned to Yu and Sylph, indicating that they should enter the estate and find a place to rest. In the meantime, she will go and try to report to Director Asses about their arrival. She asks them to be as quiet as possible during her absence. She tries to warn them, but abruptly shuts up. Yu doesn't understand what happened. Sierra asks them to forget the last part of the conversation. Sierra asks the servant to show them the way. 
The servant obeys immediately. The servant asks to follow her. While Sierra went her own way, you fell into a stupor. The servant leads them to the huge doors, saying that they have arrived at the place. They were launched into a huge hall in which there were many tables with various delicious dishes. There were many people in the hall dressed in luxurious costumes. Looking at all this, you and Sylph were inspired. A woman in a pink dress was standing near the table with food. Covering her face with a fan, she expresses her dissatisfaction that two magicians from the Bollet and Isa's families did not come. But the city magicians came and now they eat and drink at someone else's expense. Hugh admires the amount of delicious exotic food. Suddenly, a noise is heard from the side. One of the servants fell on the tables, causing plates with dishes to fall. Hugh heard a man's voice saying unpleasant things about the girl. The man is not happy with the fact that he ordered Sierra to be brought. But his order was not carried out. The girl is looking for an excuse. But another servant intervenes in the conversation, saying that he asked her several times to bring Sierra. Looking at the whole picture, Yu turns to Sylph and gives sarcastic comments about everything that is happening. The man turns around and notices that he sees Yu and Sylph for the first time. Seeing full plates of food and sloppy clothes, he concludes that they are commoners who came to eat at someone else's expense. The man comes closer and introduces the Capella family, the hosts of the organized event. He says that people come to this event only by special invitations. He asks to see their invitations. Yu says they don't have an invitation. There is a commotion in the hall. There are condemnations. Many are dissatisfied with the fact that because of people who do not know etiquette, the empire has ceased to be elite. The man in the blue suit is angry because you did not provide an invitation and asks them to leave the banquet immediately. Sylph is wary, but you stops her and apologizes, saying that there was a misunderstanding. He says that they came together with Master Sierra Charlotte, so they were not given invitations. A man only gets angrier. He does not believe them, considering Sierra beautiful, outstanding. In his opinion, she could not take them as students. Yu doesn't understand why a man is so angry. There was another uproar in the hall. Somewhere in the distance, there is a discussion that the owner of the Vendi is paying attention to the Fire Witch, but she does not reciprocate him. On the other hand, a rumor is heard according to which, once Sierra took as an apprentice, one guy because of what the owner was very angry. A girl with dark hair looks at you, grinning at the fact that the guy does not understand who he is talking to. By saying that he was Sierra's disciple, he only created more problems. Yu points at the servant with his hand and says that if they don't believe him, then let them ask the butler who met them with Master Sierra. The butler begins to justify himself, saying that Loina met them. The man orders silence. He asks if the young man really thinks that he is fit to be Sierra's disciple. Suddenly Sierra comes into the hall and says that Yu is fit to be an apprentice. Everyone stops abruptly and turns around. Sierra confirms her words by saying that Yu became her first student. The man abruptly changes his face and falsely laughing, makes sure that you was a student of Sierra. He wants to apologize, so he asks for permission to show them the achievements of magic over the past year. Sierra says there's no need to show anything. She grabs Yu's hand. The guy is surprised at first. And then Sierra, pointing to Yu, says that she and the groom will see for themselves, which throws the young man into shock. In the hall, people abruptly fell silent. The butler can't believe what he's heard. Sierra says that Yu is not only her student, but also her fiancé. The guy doesn't understand what's going on. He leans over to the master and asks what she is doing now. She says in a whisper that the Capella family is doing wrong. They have used their influence several times to marry her off. And now she saw an opportunity to force them to abandon this idea. Then Sierra chuckles and says that she and her fiancé will look at the achievements of magic themselves. The guy begins to play the role of the groom and confirms Sierra's words. The man is angry because Sierra got involved with a guy who does not have a full-fledged income. But what angers him even more is that she chose an ordinary guy, not him. The butler asks the owner to calm down, because on this day there is a holiday and influential people are looking at them. He also heard that Miss Sierra doesn't have any magical achievements to show at the Congress. The owner grins at such news, and then he asks everyone to go to another room and try his new latest development, a magic medicine. The host of the event claps his hands and the servants appear. They had cups of blue liquid on their trays. Yu pays all his attention to this magical medicine. Many guests have already tried it. Someone noted the bitter taste and its properties that replenish spiritual forces. Someone was simply amazed, calling the drink a real magic potion. The host of the event, smiling, thanked for the approval. He began to talk about the fact that this drink is the result of the development of the Capella family over the past year, a concentrated spirit replenishment potion. 
Then he turned around and expressed his dissatisfaction with the fact that people who do not have any magical achievements are coming to the Congress. He looks at Sierra and waits for her to confirm. Yu grinned and poured out the magic drink in one gulp, which greatly angered the host of the event. The young man just laughed at the man's reaction and pretended to apologize. Sierra also began to laugh softly, which angered the man even more. The host of the event raised his voice and began to accuse Yu of having dared to pour out the potion he had prepared in perfect proportions. He asks if he has any idea how many rare ingredients the man used in the cooking process. The guy begins to list various ingredients, shining stone powder, basilisk scales, angelica, the purest water from under the polar ice. The man was thrown into shock. The young man says that he will be able to collect all the same ingredients for a drink of such poor quality in a day. He asks how a man can call it the latest development with perfect proportions. The man says that he worked hard for a month to create a similar potion. He was able to achieve a perfect balance, and Yu dares to call his efforts a low-quality drink. He offers to see how Yu will make a box of the same potion in one day. Sierra approaches Yu and tries to shame her student for showing off. Yu asks the master to relax. He bends down to her and asks her to help him. Sierra listens to all his instructions and agrees without enthusiasm. She asks how the young man learned the ingredients and the method of making the potion. While the guy was thinking what to say, Sylph helped him, saying that when the potion was just brought in, she prompted him. The guy had no choice but to agree. Sierra mused that since Sylph was part of Excalibur, it wasn't surprising that she identified the ingredients by smell. While Sierra was thinking, you gave five Sylphs to the side. The young man approached the table with a white tablecloth. The man looks at it all, chuckling. He begins to list the ingredients, shining stone powder, carrot, chestnut, saurus. He points to the stove, the frying pan, and then asks if Yu is ready to make a potion for them, while the guests are laughing on the side. Yu grinned and began to tie his apron. He took a silk thread, added fire, actively mixed all the ingredients in the pan. In the hall, people felt a clean smell. According to the guests, this smell seems to transfer to nature, and the heart becomes serene. The man was alarmed, as it was not like a simple cooking. Magic wafted from the young man. The contents of the frying pan really looked like a potion. All the guests were shocked. They couldn't believe there was another way to create a potion. Having finished all the preparations, the young man poured the contents of the frying pan into a bottle. The potion turned out to be the same blue color and it shone. You announced that the potion was ready now. A man came up who wanted to try the prepared potion. Sierra recognized Master Madeline from the Imperial University of Potions who was also known for having powers equal to those of the chief magician Asissa. You invited me to try the potion. Master Madeline raised the cup to his lips and took a few sips of the potion he had prepared. He tasted the taste and was suddenly overwhelmed by the fact that someday he would meet a person who would make a superpower potion. The host of the event screamed sharply, because the superpower potion, which increases spiritual strength several times, was lost almost 300 years ago. Madeline confirms his words and wonders how you learned the secret of making this potion. Madeline put down the cup, bent down in front of you in a bow, and offered to give half of everything he has to find out his way of creating this potion. Madeline offered to give half of his property to find out the secret of making the potion you. The young man is interested in why only half, but the master says that if this is not enough, then he can add. All the guests abruptly raised an uproar because of such a proposal. Although many people understand that a magic potion lost many years ago will definitely return all the money invested in it. The host of the event also decides to bargain and offers half of his wealth for a potion recipe. Madeline exclaims, The man believes that the Capella clan's fortune is much greater, so the young man will not be able to resist such a huge sum. Yu reports that he is not going to sell the recipe, which puts the host of the event, and the master of Madeline into a stupor. Yu says that they have already looked at the achievements of the magicians and now wants to go back. Sierra agrees and they are about to leave. But at the same moment, the host of the event says that he will add a share of the potion sales to half of the wealth. Yu stops. Initially, he planned to refuse this money, but this is too generous an offer which inspires him and Sylph. Sierra is not surprised by Yu's behavior. In the study, in which there are wooden bookshelves, the rays of the sun break through. It is in this office that a man puts a box with rings on the table. He says that these are spatial rings in which the required amount of money is embedded. He suggests you, Sylph and Sierra check it out if they want. The assistant says that after the sale of the potion, 
Yu's share will be credited annually to the account of these rings. The head of the Capella family jumps up abruptly and asks what the potion recipe is. Yu says that the energy contained in the magic potion has never been obtained from the ingredients themselves. It is drawn from the coagulation of the elements contained in the air. And then he puts a package on the table. The man is surprised by the answer. The guy continues, he says that a magic circle is engraved in a large metal vessel that can curl the elements of air. The use of the highest fire magic allows you to successfully cause the resonance of the magic circle with the ingredients. As for the ingredients themselves, in low-level ingredients, the content of elements is low. Therefore, in the magic circle, they interact with highly concentrated air elements, seeping in and filling the void. According to Yu's story, low-level ingredients not only improve the results of coagulation, they also increase the quality of the elements. With complex ingredients it would be more difficult. The man understood the essence of the preparation and was delighted. Sierra said that since Capella had found out the secret of making the potion, now they would not linger at the estate. The man asks the girl to take her time, as they need to discuss something else. He asks if they are aware of the eruption of Mount Lertz. Sierra replies that they have heard about it and believe it was just a natural cataclysm. The man says that they sent a rescue group there, because they also thought so. But the group accidentally discovered traces of a rare magical beast, a fiery unicorn in a mountain cave. Yu asks where the fiery unicorns come from in the west, if they live in the east. The head of the Capella clan confirms his words. He says that it is unknown how the unicorn turned out to be in the near lands. But it can be said for sure that the unicorn protects a jewel raging with fire. Yu thinks about hearing about the raging fire gem. The man is sure that this precious stone is probably an untold wealth from Eastern myths. That's why he decided to send a group there to get the stone, and he thought Sierra would want to join them. He offers to keep the stone for himself at the end, and Sierra and you the unicorn. Sierra agrees and asks when the group is leaving. The man says that the shipment is in three days. He warns that while they are all at the estate, they will have to prepare well. Yu is happy about the new trip, as he just wanted to see what kind of stone it is. When Sierra, Sylph and Yu left, the man stayed in the office with the assistant. The assistant is surprised that it's not enough that the owner gave half a fortune for a potion recipe that you can make in a couple of minutes. So the owner also told about the fiery unicorn. According to the assistant, this will negatively affect the condition of the Capella family. The man laughs darkly and says that although he offered them to go there, he did not guarantee their return. The assistant expressed his approval, calling the man an excellent strategist. Sierra, you and Sylph are met by the servants. She apologizes to them for the fact that during the convoked congress all the rooms in the house are occupied and there is only one left that she can offer. Sierra asks not to worry and dismisses the maid, who leaves the room at the same moment. Yu puts his sword on the near surface, and then, stretching, Sierra asks why they decided to take the unicorn and not the jewel. Sierra turns around and tells that from the heart of a unicorn, you can get blood that can turn any fire obtained by fire magic into an all-cleansing heavenly flame, and by drinking it, you can awaken natural magic. The girl turns her back to him and says that she thought he had already guessed that she took him in order for him to help her curb the fiery unicorn. She says she's sorry and then asks if she's really that selfish. Yu confirms her words. Sierra is surprised for a moment, and then Yu continues and says that really selfish people never face a choice. For example, do they want a stone or a unicorn? Sierra is embarrassed after what has been said and makes sarcastic comments. Then she thinks about it and says that she will have to leave in three days, but she believes that her student is still too weak. So that nothing irreparable happens to you, she decides to give him some of her magical powers. You asks her again. Sierra sits down on the bed, asks you to sit down and show his seal on his forehead. You sits down as he was asked, and then lifts his bangs to show the seal on his forehead. Then abruptly Sierra grabs you by the head and lowers her on her knee, transferring her powers. A seal formed on the floor. Sierra asks you not to move. As soon as it was over, Sierra told me that this is an ancient way of transferring magical powers through a seal between a master and a disciple. Now Yu has received the powers of his master and can use fire magic. She asks to try it. Sierra notices that Yu is not moving and asks if he is alright. She grabs his head with both hands and lifts him up to check his condition. Yu looks happy and says he was very comfortable. A new sunny day has come. The rays of the sun make their way into the room, where there is a huge table, at which the head of the Capella family is sitting. The man asks the butler about the guests who did not leave the manor all the days they spent at the estate. The butler confirms his words and says that screams were sometimes heard from the room. The man gets angry and slaps his hand sharply on the table, ordering him to be silent. He doesn't understand why he's worse than a dark-haired guy. 
He believes that Sierra is wrong and does not notice the best option. The person sitting opposite says that the owner should not worry. The man apologizes for his tactlessness. The stranger, on the contrary, asks why he was called to the estate. The stranger turned out to be the Traveler of the Void Hasidim, one of the four best magicians of the Empire. He is considered to be the only person in history who entered the world of emptiness. In the room where Sierra and you are located, the guy lit a flame in his hand and is trying to find out if he did everything right. Sierra confirms his words and says that he is now free to use inner magic. Yu is amazed at his capabilities. He didn't think he would be able to control fire in such a way. Now he is not afraid that his fire will break out. Sierra thinks about the fact that they don't need incidents during the taming of the unicorn, so the magical power is transferred by her Yu. These forces should be enough to withstand any fatal blows. She reminds the young man that it is necessary to spend his strength wisely. At this time, Yu forms a heart with the help of fire and asks the master to look at the fiery heart, which makes Sierra very angry. A servant comes to the door and notifies that the cart to Mount Lerda is ready and now you can go at any time. Sierra leaves the room with Yu. She notices a shadow in the corner which makes her suspicious. She recognized Hasidin in the shadow. Yu asks what happened, but Sierra felt that she was mistaken and offered to continue on her way. At night, in the Tower of Saint Fu, you can see a man in a hoodie who is in a hurry somewhere. The man stops abruptly, raises his head and tries to catch his breath. Footsteps can be heard, followed by screams. The director turns to the figure in the hoodie, claiming that she has no escape route, so she is obliged to give back what she stole. The unknown figure only turns its head, but does nothing. The director demands to immediately return the stolen goods and uses magic chains. The figure turns around and bounces, planning to dodge the attack, and then jumps out the window and lands on the ground. The director is already running to the window, but after looking through it he sees no one. The figure in the hoodie managed to escape. The criminal hid around the corner. The girl takes off her mask and takes out the box, which she finally found. A few days later at the foot of the fiery mountain lairts, the carriage slows down sharply at U.S. request. All passengers are not surprised. Yu became ill, so he ran out of the carriage. The rest of the people get out of the carriage and the men ask Sierra why Yu is getting carsick and why she didn't tell about it earlier. Because of him, the day trip stretched for several days. Sierra regrets this, but she herself did not know how this trip would affect Yu. Somewhere off to the side, Yu thinks that he feels so bad that he is not ready to return to the carriage. Someone's scream is heard outside, which attracts the attention of all travelers. A young man in a hood runs away from strange creatures and shouts that he is being chased by a whirlwind. The head of the Capella clan says that these are just whirligigs, they are not scary. Fortunately, he brought high-class magicians. The frightened young man says that there are too many of them. Sierra notes that this is a flock of whirling lizards. Yu doesn't understand what kind of creatures they are. A man pays attention to another young man in a hood and notices how a whole flock of whirling lizards is running after him. He begins to get angry since he was assembling a team in order to grab the unicorn and not to stir up the lair of the lizards. The Vaihi lizard is a medium low-level magical beast, moves with incredible speed, spits out poison with its teeth. The man understands that although there is no need to be afraid of them, but there are really too many of them, it is useless to fight with them, just a waste of time and effort. They need to figure out a way to have less contact with them until they can grab the unicorn. The man points to the carriages and tells everyone to disperse as soon as possible, as plans have changed. He plans to first escape from the whirlwind lizards, and then develop a strategy for the following actions. One of the young men asks everyone to stop and look in the direction he is pointing. The man turns around questioningly and sees one of the whirlwind girls licking Yu's hand. Everyone is in a stupor. The man asks where Sierra's fiancé is familiar with the whirligigs. Sierra shrugs it off and says that Yu has the ability to get along with magical beasts much higher than ordinary people. Everyone goes into even more shock. They think that you can ask the whirlwind girls to step aside a little so that the carriages can continue on their way. But Yu says he has a better idea. The whirligigs carry the people who saddled them. The man asks Yu if his idea is really better than carriages. The young man considers this option much faster and more convenient. He's having a lot of fun. Sierra notices this fun and blushes, smiling. Laird's volcano. Yu jumps off the whirlwind and continues on his way on his feet. They get to the cave together with the team. One of the expedition members says that this is the cave where they found the unicorn. A loud sound is heard from the cave, because of which the whirligigs are alerted. Yu concludes that there is something inside. Yu turns to the whirlwind lizards and says that they helped them get to the cave, so they can be free. The whirligigs bow down in front of the young man and make a hissing sound. 
Sierra goes ahead and tells everyone to follow her. Everyone rest forward. It was very dark inside the cave, so I had to get lanterns. A man is visited by the thought that he would never have thought that you could get along with wild animals. But even if he restrains the unicorn, they still won't survive. The expedition members going ahead shout that they see the end of the entrance. The entrance is cut off by lava. Many people are shocked by this. Something bright can be seen inside the lava. The man convinces that this is a treasure. Perhaps this is really the case. A red rounded stone can be seen inside the lava, which burns with a flame. Yu sees a stone and it seems to him that the movement of this gem looks somehow familiar. The man is already approaching the stone, thinking that this is a great chance to grab it while there is no fire unicorn nearby. At this point, the lava begins to gurgle more strongly. Sierra notices this and runs up to the man in an attempt to stop him. Suddenly, a huge ball of lava rises up. The man is covered by the shadow of this ball. He can't move while he's looking at him. The next moment, a huge clawed paw appears right in front of him, which causes him to stagger back and fall on his back. A fiery unicorn appeared, making a growling sound. The fire unicorn is a rare level magical beast. Comes from the eastern mainland, master of fire attacks, deadly strong. All the magicians became alert and took out all their weapons. Sierra says that this fiery unicorn is a rare magical animal, and although its slaughter rate is not as high as that of animals of the level of natural disasters, it will still not be so easy to cope with. She asks you to stand aside first, wait for a good opportunity, and, if there is a chance, he will have to try to use his taming talent. Yu thinks to himself that Sierra is right to say, since unicorns have a stubborn character, if you tame him, he can start to resist. Also, it's better not to show your strength in front of the whole crowd. Ordinary people will not be able to understand what happened. The man lying at the unicorn's feet demands to accelerate and get rid of the magical creature faster. One of the casters uses an ice coffin. Ice coffins appear all over the cave, with which they try to block the unicorn. But the fire unicorn's strength was enough to smash all the ice coffins so that they touched the casters themselves. As soon as the fire unicorn moved to attack, all the spellcasters ran in an attempt to dodge the attack. Suddenly, the unicorn's horn hit Sierra's sword. Sierra shouts that she wants to be his opponent. The unicorn intends to use its powers. His horn lights up, but Sierra manages to react and during the next attack with an explosion, she bounces back. Due to the explosion, the gem flew away towards the lava. The man and Sierra noticed it, and the unicorn only got angrier. The gem was flying straight towards the lava, but you, who managed to run up, grabbed him right over the lava. Everyone was alarmed by such an act. You stepped onto a rock and pushed off from it, returned to the ground. Sierra runs up to him and asks if everything is okay. She says the stone contains a raging flame. She does not have time to finish, as the stone begins to glow. The unicorn behind the young man with the stone growls. The man, seeing the whole scene, understands that if everything continues like this, then in the end you will receive both a precious stone and a unicorn. Yu says that the man was wrong from the very beginning, since this is not a gem at all. Just as he is trying to finish the sentence, a dark portal appears behind him, from which tentacles appear. Yu manages to react and push Sierra away, but as a result, the tentacles take him along with something resembling a jewel. Sierra only has time to see her student being carried away by the tentacles. She screams, and then notices that the unicorn has also been grabbed by tentacles. She finds out the wasteland of Hasidon. The man orders to attack the unicorn and the next moment ice fragments are flying into the unicorn. Sierra is watching all this. The shards crash into the unicorn, emitting steam and holding its body to the wall. Sierra runs up to Vand and asks what just happened. The man replies that it's nothing special. He is surprised by her naivety and then says that he did not even think to cooperate with her. He was very angry because she Sierra initially agreed to be related to him, but nothing ever happened. And at the Congress, together with the boy, she decided to mock him. Fendi's face takes on a menacing look. He says that the Capella clan has already suffered from a Samancy, so it's time to respond in kind. He is happy with his idea to call the Wasteland Master to deal with them. Sierra makes sure that the day before she left, she saw Hasidon in the corridor. The girl is angry. She raises her sword and warns Wen that if anything happens to her disciple, he will have to answer for it. She blocks their way and tells them not to expect mercy. Suddenly, a dark portal appears between Sierra and the Van group, from which a man comes out expressing regret. He says that Sierra's disciple is being held hostage by the Wasteland Master and is most likely already dead. Sierra is stunned by the news of her student's death. Various happy memories associated with you flash through her mind. The girl is more angry and in a fit of anger swings her sword in a jump to strike. 
The blow sends fire waves, but Hasidin opens the gates of the wasteland and blocks their way. The flame forms a spiral. At one point, Sierra hesitated and then noticed that her own flame was coming back. The girl manages to react and jump aside. She started to clear her throat. At this moment, Hasidin approaches her and, grinning, says that the magic of the wasteland exists outside the basic framework of magic. Even such high magic as the magic of the fiery sword cannot overcome it. Hasidin comes closer to the girl and asks Sierra not to resist, as it is useless. And Vendi asks if it's not too easy to leave your opponent in the cave and offers his own version of events. The lava in the cave is getting hotter. Sierra is in serious condition. She is thinking about how she can defeat Hasidim, since even the magic of the fiery sword does not have high effectiveness against higher magic. Sierra looks at the unicorn hanging on the wall. She realizes that there is only one way left to get out of the cave alive and find her student. She gets up and runs to the unicorn. Van screams and tells the master of the void that Sierra has decided to take the unicorn's blood to awaken natural magic. She needs to be detained as soon as possible. Hasidin asks everyone to calm down. He thinks Sierra is just wasting her strength. He slyly grins and chuckles, watching the girl's attempts to get out of this difficult situation. The girl sits down opposite the unicorn, touches his blood and apologizes, explaining her action by saying that she needs strength. The unicorn can only growl softly. The girl drinks the blood and starts coughing sharply. She felt as if her whole body was burning with mortal fire. Then she screams in pain. Cossidan appears next to the girl and says that the girl is too naive. He grins because the girl believed the words of asses. He says that people who drank the unicorn's blood then burned alive. The girl can't believe Hasidin's words. She is sure that the director could not deceive her. Hasidin says she doesn't know the director at all. Hasidin turns to Vand and says that Sierra should be left in the cave and do nothing with her, since in the worst case, an explosion of heavenly fire raging in her may occur. He offered to leave her, because they had already taken the precious stone. Vendi agrees with the offer. Sierra can't let them just walk away. A drop falls into the water. Sierra rises up and her body is enveloped in flames. The girl awakened her natural magic and became a master of a thousand lights. Everyone is stunned. Sierra was able to awaken her natural magic, but she is still upset that she lost her student, so she will not spare Wend and Hasidin. A huge raging flame lights up. Hasidin tries to open the field of emptiness, but nothing comes out. The master of the void does not answer him. With the help of natural fire magic, a fusion takes place and a fiery unicorn appears. Vand, because of fright, does not understand where the fiery unicorn came from. The fiery unicorn crashes straight into the ground at speed, forming a huge explosion that erases everything in its path. Smoke is all around, ashes flying, and Vendi and his men are unconscious. Hasidin did not think that anyone would be able to master the magic of heavenly fire. Sierra lands on the ground. Although she has received the desired natural magic, she is not happy about it at all. Suddenly, clapping sounds are heard from the side. Sierra turns around and sees an older man. She recognizes the director in the man. Sierra asks where he came from in the cave. The director is glad that Sierra has finally awakened her natural magic. But in her opinion, the director behaves strangely. Cossidin's laughter can be heard. He says that the director has been waiting from the very beginning for the girl to awaken her natural magic because he is a demon abductor. The director turned out to be a demon abductor. Sierra does not believe what she has heard, and even more so the words of Hasidin. How the director could turn out to be a demon abductor. According to legends, a monster appeared 500 years ago, capable of stealing natural magic from people, and for 200 years there was no person capable of defeating him. However, the chronicles say that after the battle with the seventh apostle Sarlia, the demon disappeared without a trace. Rumor has it that he has been dead for a long time. Then how is it possible that the director of Aces is a demon abductor? The director reminds Sierra of her own words that if she manages to awaken her natural magic, she will help him with many things, but it's too hard and dreary. Perhaps the best option would be to directly transfer your natural magic to the director. Sierra just starts talking, but the next second the director appears next to her and grabs her. The girl is confused. The director says that if he did not feel that she would be able to awaken the master of a thousand lights, he would not have brought her up so carefully and given her so much of his time. He squeezes his hand harder and says unpleasant things about Sierra. 
the girl realizes that she has fallen into a trap and now she cannot normally get oxygen into her lungs. The director says that the essence of her existence is to awaken natural magic and transfer it to the director. The man pays attention to the girl, who began to be enveloped in flames. She asks him to stop, but this is the only thing she manages to do before she falls unconscious. The flame flares up more and is absorbed by the director of aces. The director releases the girl. He lights a flame in his hand and admires the beautiful natural magic. He looks at Sierra and says that now she is not of any use. At this time, Kossadin lies to the side. He starts to get nervous, because when the director of aces deals with the girl, it will be Kossadin's turn. He does not understand why the master of the void does not respond. Suddenly, a black thread appears near the cliff, which turns into a portal. The portal opens, releasing air vapors. Someone's foot in one of the tentacles lands, and then Yu comes out completely with a sword in his hand. The director, seeing the whole picture of Yu's return, cannot believe that the young man has dealt with the strongest of the world of emptiness, the master of emptiness. Yu kicks off the tentacles and says that he spent a lot of time because the octopus had too many tentacles. Then the young man turns his gaze to the director and Sierra. He notices that Sierra is lying unconscious on the ground, also with wounds all over her body. He immediately asks who did this to his master. The director replies that it was him. He makes a swing with his foot and the next second the girl's body flies towards Yu. Yu looks at her master and realizes that the director has taken away her natural magic. The director confirms his words and says that he should feel proud of his master, because she made a huge contribution to his future victory over the apostle. The director says that 300 years ago, during the battle with Sarlia, he realized that ordinary natural magic, no matter how much it was, could not overcome the apostle. Therefore, he needed even more strength. And for that, he needed high-level magic and the energy left by the apostle. Therefore, he spent his strength to train Sierra and secretly obtain the apostle's energy. Yu touches Sierra, but she doesn't make a sound. At this moment, the director does not finish his monologue, rejoicing that the day has come when he has obtained both the magic of the highest level, the heavenly flame, and the energy of the apostle, the infernal flame. Now the director has many unique abilities and he is ready to fight with the apostles again. But he still needs to finish with Sierra and Yu. The guy became alert and prepared for a duel. The fiery unicorn is still nailed to the wall. The director says that heaven and hell are with him now, so now he doesn't need anyone. He shoots his hand up and a wave of flame appears behind him. Yu gets into a fighting stance and tells the director not to rely on his magic. Yu's sword lights up green. Then the young man moves his sword to the right and cuts through the waves of flame. The flame disappeared. Only steam remained. Hassadin saw the beginning of the fight. He wondered how Sierra's disciple could be so strong. The director says that Yu does not look like a person from a famous family, and he can use sylphs. He wonders who Yu is. The guy grins and tells the director to try to guess for himself. Due to the enormous potential of Yu's power, the ground under his feet is covered with cracks and begins to rise. The young man gets into a fighting stance and says that if the director guesses who Yu really is, then he will receive a prize. The director frowned. Magical energy hovered around him, and a seal was already formed under his feet, which increased and emitted energy. Yu raced forward at speed. He made a swing with his sword and cut through everything in front of him. A funnel began to gather around Yu, from behind which stones were rising. The guy made a new swing towards the demon abductor and sent the funnel straight at him. The demon placed his palms in front of him and formed a shield that protected him from the blow. Yu says during the fight that he forgot to warn the demon abductor that if he does not guess who the guy is, then he will be punished. The demon abductor was taken aback by such a statement. While Yu was trying to inflict huge damage to the deceiver with his sword, the demon abductor defended himself with a huge red energy shield. When two powerful forces collided, an explosion occurred that shook the entire cave. Walls crumbled, stones flew away. Hassadin started to get up from the ground, as he understood that if the magicians continued to release a huge amount of magic and energy, the volcano would explode and then it would be bad for everyone. He completely stood up, making asses to blame for the whole situation. Hassadin does not care who survives, he will not be released alive anyway, so he needs to take advantage of the chance while the magicians are busy with their duel and do not pay attention to him. He's going to leave the cave as soon as possible. The demon abductor was hit and coughed up blood. Yu was very serious. He looked at the demon and demanded that he return Sierra's natural magic. The demon clears his throat and says that the stolen natural magic cannot be returned back. The demon abductor rises from his knees and asks if Yu really thinks he can defeat him. 
He gets angry, clenches his hands into fists, in which dark energy swirls and asks another question. Is he too naive? Hasidin notes that this is not just energy, but the fire of the underworld, belonging to the mythical apostle. He is worried that the man is up to something wrong. The cave is collapsing, rocks fly off everywhere and a rumbling sound is heard. The demon abductor stands in front of you and, chuckling, asks if you really decided that he could defeat him. He bursts the bottle he was holding in his left hand. At the same moment, purple energy envelops his hand. Then it moves to the whole body. The demon abductor says that he now possesses the most powerful power that the apostle left behind. Yu is very lucky, because he will see the potential of this power. Then the demon unleashes huge waves of dark energy that destroys everything in its path. The demon is struck by the power of the apostle. Sylph appeared in front of Yu. It glowed green and was ready to attack. She put her hands in front of her and shouted a storm shield, blocking Yu and not allowing the power of the apostle to reach them. Two powerful waves collided with each other. Yu, standing behind Sylph, asked her to take Sierra and leave this cave as soon as possible. But Sylph refuses, she says that her main mission is to protect the owner, so she will not leave him in a crisis situation and will not allow anyone to harm him. Yu puts his hand on Sylph's head, which surprises her very much. He tells her not to worry, because the fire won't hurt him. Sylph first looks at Yu with bewilderment, and then makes a serious face and says that she understood. Sylph picked Sierra up, threw her arms over her shoulders and carried her to a safe place. Yu at this time turned to the demon, he was not going to retreat. The demon abductor did not expect to see a man who would take care of the safety of his weapons more than for his own life. In his opinion, this is ridiculous. He continues to talk about his hellfire power, and then launches threats, believing that one move is enough for him to cope with you. A powerful wave of energy tried to reach you. The demon has lived in the world for 500 years and can finally throw off his shackles and step on the path of becoming a new apostle. Yu interrupts his speech and asks if the kidnapper is using the flame correctly. Yu gathers all the energy together in his hand and refutes the demon into shock. A guy grins, because the demon definitely did not expect this. And then he turns the collected energy into the red army. The demon abductor asks why Yu can hold hellfire with his bare hands. Isn't he human? He compares Yu with the apostles and realizes that his power seems to be more powerful than them. How is this possible? Yu sprays energy and says that he is just an ordinary student. He comes closer to the demon and says that what is more important is how the demon abductor will pay for what he did to his master. The demon abductor chuckles and says that she ceased to mean anything to him even at the moment when he took her natural magic. He reflects that since you can control the hellfire, then he definitely must have some abilities for this. So in order to make his own control complete, he will steal his abilities. Yu blazes with energy and accepts the challenge. The demon abductor amplifies his energy and says that there should not be a second person in the world who can control the infernal flame. Suddenly, the demon is visited by strange images of a masked man standing on top. He doesn't understand what he just saw. Yu chuckles and rejoices that the demon has finally seen. He says that he sealed his powers so that no one would discover him. The demon abductor is at a loss, he is even more lost. Yu just looks at him with a smile and says that since the demon wants to take his powers so much, he will give him a chance. Yu opens the seal of the first level, and then he says torn and rises up. The demon is still discouraged. Yu directs his hands with all his strength towards the demon and they hit right on target, which is why loud screams are heard. The demon could not even think that Yu had such powers. Yu points his finger at his lips and gestures for silence. He calls himself an ordinary student who is looking for a wife and trying to earn money. The forces completely absorb the demon abductor, gather together and there is a huge, noisy explosion, because of which everything flies off to the sides. Dust is spreading in the cave. Yu is still standing in his place, not moving. The cave collapses, stones fall and rumbling sounds are heard. Yu stands in front of the unicorn. After the battle, he decides to go and catch up with Sylph along with Sierra. He hopes that his master has regained consciousness. But before that, he plans to deal with one last thing. Namely, with a fiery unicorn, which was hanging on the wall with ice blocks in its body. Yu opens the seal under the attentive gaze of the unicorn. At one point, all the ice blocks disappear, and the unicorn is free to fall to the ground. The fiery unicorn growls as the young man slowly approaches him. Yu says that in the last battle, the fire unicorn did not use its full powers. He makes the assumption that the unicorn was afraid to harm the egg because of two powerful blows. The fiery unicorn opens its eyes wide in surprise. Yu asks him not to worry and says that he hid the egg in the spatial ring when it was pulled into the world of emptiness, so it remained untouched. The fiery unicorn first looks at the egg, 
and then rises and presses its head against it. You understood the unicorn's gesture. He says he doesn't know why the unicorn came to the cave with his egg, but the smell of the apostles comes from the egg, so he is undoubtedly connected with them. You promises the fiery unicorn to take care of the egg, and the unicorn takes its last breath, implying gratitude. A volcanic eruption can be heard outside the cave. Sylph, along with Sierra, is standing near the entrance and is very worried about you. Will he have time to return? She shouts towards the entrance when she sees a figure resembling her master. She asks if he's okay. Hugh replies that he is fine and asks about Sierra's condition. Sylph goes down and says that she has not regained consciousness yet, most likely due to the fact that she was very overextended during the fight and has now fallen into a coma. Hugh says that the volcano will erupt soon, so he decides that they need to get out first, and then talk. Sylph claims that Master Sierra is very sensitive. She doubts that Sierra will be able to accept all the events that have happened when she wakes up. A few years ago, Sierra went to the hospital. The nurses near her ward were discussing what they had heard about the extermination of the Charlotte family, which is an initiative of the Apostle's henchmen. One of the sisters can't believe it, since the Charlotte family was very strong in fire magic. How could they take such a step? Of the Charlotte family, there was only one Sierra, whom the nurses pitied, because she was still very young. A stranger came to Sierra's room. He talks to her about the intruders who decided to exterminate her entire clan. Sierra raises her head, and the man says that they have common goals, so if she wants to take revenge on the attackers, she can become his disciple. Sierra asks who the stranger is. The man rubs his beard and introduces himself as the chief court magician of the empire. At that moment, Sierra really believed that the teacher sincerely wanted to help her take revenge on the intruders for the extermination of her entire clan. A sharp flash clears up another memory, as the same teacher says that Sierra can still be useful, because it's not for nothing that he taught her for so many years. She couldn't even think that it was a demon abductor, who's trying to steal her natural magic. Sierra remembers the silhouettes of her parents and apologizes for not being able to complete the mission of revenge for the entire Charlotte family. Sierra regains consciousness. It is in the hands of you. The first thing she feels after waking up is cold. Sylph turns around abruptly and says that there is no mana in Sierra's body. Yu looks anxiously at the master. Sylph continues and says that Sierra's vital energy is fading at a high rate. Yu, along with Sylph and Sierra, arrived at the hotel. The guy is doing his best to help Sierra recover. He understands Sylph was right. In Sierra's body, even her own magic is not felt. Her power is rapidly draining away. If this continues, then Sierra will not wake up. Yu turns to Sylph while she tells him that he still has the magic that the master gave him. Yu decides to give Sierra's magic back to her to help restore her strength. Unfortunately, this is not enough to return to the reverse level, but it's better than nothing. Sylph pulled out the book and started talking about how there were no magical powers left in Master Sierra's body, so they should not use the seal to transfer it to them, in which case they would have to use the traditional method described in the ancient books of people. Yu wonders where Sylph got the book from. Sylph then says that magic can be transmitted with a kiss. Sylph says that this is the only possible way to transfer magic. Use the mouth, and the saliva will be the intermediary transmitting magic. But she doesn't have time to finish the sentence, as you embarrassingly interrupted her. You tensed. Even if a kiss is necessary to save Sierra, the young man has a feeling that they seem to be taking advantage of her serious condition. Sylph took into account Sierra's vital signs, so she thinks that after all, Sierra will worry more about her magical powers. Sylph is sure of this, since it's been a long time since the old man took the magic from Sierra. They need to hurry up. In the worst case, Sierra's magic level will drop to zero and she will become an ordinary person of the level. Then nothing will help her for sure. Yu doesn't like the tense situation. Although there is no direct threat to Sierra's life, but she can wake up as an ordinary girl, and this will be hard to accept. After thinking about it, Yu still agreed with Sylph. Sylph bows and says he will wait outside. She leaves the room and closes the door behind her. Yu sits on the bed, lifts Sierra's body and sits her on his lap. He understands that there is not much time, so he needs to act. It doesn't matter what happens next. He has made a decision and now he intends to go to the end. Take full responsibility for himself. He lifts the girl by the chin and leans towards her. During the kiss, the couple is enveloped in light energy. Sierra wakes up. She asks if she is still asleep and why she is so warm and pleasant. She sees you in front of her and takes reality for a dream. But then he abruptly realizes that everything is happening in reality. A rumble is heard in the room and Sylph immediately becomes alert. She runs into the room and sees Sierra standing on the bed, holding her fist up, and Yu is kneeling in front of the bed, whining in pain. 
Sylph calls out to the owner. Sierra indignantly tells you not to think that since she once said that he was her fiancé, you can immediately touch her, even if you wanted to help. Then Sierra turns her attention to Sylph and sees her writing something. Sylph raises his head and tells that he diligently keeps records of the duration of kisses and the events following them. Sierra is even more embarrassed. She pretends that she does not understand what kind of kisses we are talking about. She says that you was just restoring her strength. It was a kind of ambulance. This does not need to be recorded. Sierra turns to you and points her finger in his direction, demanding that he forget everything that happened in the ward. Hugh nods his head in agreement. When the situation becomes calm, Sierra takes a cup of tea. After another sip, she sets the cup aside on the nightstand. Sierra asks you and Sylph what happened to Aces and Capella as a result. How they, along with you and Sylph, were able to get out. Hugh says that when he ran after the Sylphs into the cave, he saw Aces and the wounded magician fighting with all their might. He claims they broke off a whole cliff during the fight. Sierra thinks that the magician is probably Hasidin. She didn't think he would have the strength to fight him. Yu says that it happened just at the time when he saw her with Sylph and began to get out. But before the volcano started erupting, no one else came out. Sierra considers everything that happened ironic. Yu asks if Master Sierra has regained her powers and magic. The girl squeezes the sheet and then raises her hand and looks at it carefully. Although you returned Sierra's powers, the current level is not even average. She turns to you. The guy looks at her questioningly. Unexpectedly, Sierra asks you to take the Sylph and leave. Sierra, you and Sylph are still at the hotel, but apparently some of them will leave this place soon. Sierra asks you to take Sylph with her and leave. The guy doesn't understand why they have to leave. Sierra explains that as soon as the other families find out about the death of asses in Capella, the balance of power in the empire, established in the last hundred years thanks to the balance of power of asses and the three great families, will be disrupted. Sierra is afraid of terrible consequences. She is sure that now there will be a coup in the country, but the current level of Sierra's forces is still not even up to the level of an average magician. In such a situation, she cannot lead people. Suddenly you refuses. Sierra sees how confident the young man is in his words. She raises her voice, asking if he heard what she just said to him. She explains that they have lost the protection of Aces and the Bollet family will not leave them alone so easily. And the Isis family will not be allowed to live in peace either. You asks that if he and Sylph leave, what will become of Sierra? The girl does not have time to answer. You says that he heard her perfectly, so they especially can't afford to leave her alone. Yu says that if they can't escape together, then they will fight together. Moreover, Yu is Sierra's successor, and also her fiancé, so he can't run away and leave her. Sierra is embarrassed again and tells him not to take seriously the statement about the groom. Sylph enthusiastically says that he will also support the owner and will always be there for them no matter what happens. Sierra is amazed by their loyalty. She turns away and pretends that she doesn't care, saying that if they are really in danger, then she won't care about them. Yu then shows Sierra the egg of the fiery unicorn, telling her that the creature gave it to him before he died. Sierra is surprised because it turned out to be an egg and not a gemstone. Yu says that Capella made a mistake. The fire unicorn was not guarding the jewel all this time. He was guarding his egg. Sierra is shocked by this turn. Sylph points to the egg and says that since the egg now belongs to the owner, it needs to be given a name. Yu agrees, believing that it is impossible to call him a unicorn egg all the time. The young man thinks that calling him the Apostle's Egg is also not a good idea. I ask the girls what they will call him after all, and Yu says that since he came from the Eastern Mainland, there is a custom there to give popular names to children so that it is easier to raise, then he will call him an Iron Egg. The egg suddenly lights up. Yu panics. He does not understand why suddenly a fire started from an Iron Egg. Sierra says that's how the egg wanted to make it clear that he didn't like the name and Sylph just grunts. Yu then suggests calling the egg a chimney sweep, but the creature immediately reacts and lights up again. The guy got burned again. It's dark and quiet outside. From the side, someone is heard grunting. A man walks on trembling legs through the dark streets. The man turned out to be Cossidan. He reflects that Yu, Sylph and Sierra have decided that since the Master of the Void has died, there is no way he can escape, but he can still use the void field to move through space. Hasidin is glad that at least he runs fast, otherwise he would have ended up as an ace. After seeing the duel, he realized that it was better not to feel Yu's anger on himself. He is approaching the estate and thinks that he will be able to get a huge sum for the news of Capella's death. A week later, Sierra was sitting on her bed reading a newspaper. Apparently, Kossidin was still able to get out of the volcano alive, and he also spread the news about the death of the chapel. 
she sums up that the days of Capella as the strongest family are numbered. Sierra finds it strange that Hasidin did not tell anything about Assessa and his connection with them. Sylf chuckles. Sierra is comforted by the fact that Hasidin does not know that the jewel is actually the egg of a fiery unicorn. Sierra tells Sylph that they should be careful and not give other people cause for suspicion. Sylph holds a unicorn egg on her lap, stroking it. She accepts Sierra's warning. The girl decided to ask Sylph where you went. Sylph replied that the owner rarely goes anywhere, so he decided to go and look at the big city market and at the same time look for medicines to return Sierra's magical powers. You walk through the busy streets. Women in beautiful and rich clothes passed by him. He looked at some of them and was embarrassed. The streets near the huge city market were filled with people. You admired the fact that this place is full of various beautiful girls. The young man notices a man who came out of the store with huge bags. You remembers that he had to buy medicines for the master. You approaches a shop with a sign on which a snake is engraved and decides to see what can be bought inside this shop. As soon as you goes inside, a bell rings near the entrance. The young man is greeted by a girl. She thanks him for visiting Rudel's trading house, and then he asks what the gentleman would like to buy. She offers a helmet and armor of high strength or special magic stones. Yu comes closer to the counter and says that he would like to buy oriental materials for medicines, but the ones he needs are very rare. Before he has time to finish, the girl already asks him not to worry, since Rudel's trading house is a company with the widest range of goods throughout the empire. Yu is very happy with this news. He thinks that if he manages to buy everything he needs in this shop at once, he will not have to run to other shops, and he will be able to spend the rest of his time on the beautiful girls around. The girl behind the counter begins to worry about the gentleman. Yu takes out a list of necessities and gives it to the girl behind the counter. The girl is going to see what needs to be brought. She sees a whole list, millennial ginseng, dragon grass, tine shan bittersweet. The girl tensed and it was visible on her face. Yu asks if everything is fine. The girl just says that everything is fine, but there was uncertainty in her voice. Ingredients that are necessary for you even on the easternmost mainland for a thousand gold and you will not get it. You came to this place as if to a vegetable shop. Then, after thinking everything over, the girl is very sorry because the ingredients from the list are really very rare, so it will be impossible to find them in their store. You thought about it. He did not imagine that plants, of which the Palace of the Apostles is full, are considered very rare in the human world. If he had known about it earlier, he would have ripped off a couple of hundred more there and would have taken it with him. The girl notices the ring on the young man's finger and her eyes immediately begin to shine. She recognizes an interdimensional ring encrusted with a top-level magic stone. Just as the guy is about to leave, the girl already runs out from behind the counter and runs after him, trying to stop him. She tells you that at auctions you can buy things that he needs. Yu is thinking about auctions. The girl says that once a year, large auctions are held on the black market for the sale of stolen goods, ranging from ghost slaves to the only military means in the world. Yu is a little confused by the fact that the girl just talks about the auction of stolen goods. The girl takes out a golden ticket and says that if the gentleman is interested in this, then he can take this entrance ticket. Yu thinks that it will definitely not work to get to the eastern mainland quickly, but there is a chance that he will find the right ingredients at these auctions. Yu agrees to the offer. He holds out his hand to pick up the ticket. The girl says that the ticket costs 100 gold, and notifies that the auction will begin this afternoon at 7 in the evening. She also tells that the auction will be held in the south of the city, in the Tavern Imperial Horse. As soon as the girl accompanies the buyer, she raises her head and instantly becomes serious. She takes off her white apron and puts it on the table, sighing along the way. And then she puts her hair in a ponytail. A man comes into the room and calls the girl behind the counter Linda. He swears that he has already handed over the payment for the roof on time. The girl turns and enthusiastically asks a rhetorical question, saying that she came to catch big fish. The sun is already setting in the city. Utak is standing in the middle of the street looking for the Imperial Steed Tavern. Suddenly an unknown person in a hood runs past him and hits his shoulder. Yu stops and apologizes, assuring that he didn't crash on purpose. A second later, the guard comes running and tries to find out from an unknown person if everything is in order. One man of their guard utters unpleasant words to Yu. Yu trying to explain that he did not crash on purpose, so the guards should not be so angry. An unknown person in a hood raises his hand, thus showing that everything is fine. One man of their guard addresses a figure named Man. The gentleman says that apparently you did not crash into him on purpose, so they can safely continue on their way so as not to be late. The guards accepted the instructions at once. You, because of the voice, it seemed that a beautiful, cold-blooded girl was hiding under the hood. 
One man from the guard turns to you and says that they made a mistake. Next time they will look around carefully. You just chuckles and while watching them leave, thinks that he met strange people. At night, you arrived at the Imperial Steed Tavern. There were a lot of people in various costumes in the tavern. Someone was talking, someone was drinking. You abruptly put a huge mug with an alcoholic drink right on the table. And then he gave a compliment to the local rye beer. He decided to have a couple of beers before the auction started. Voices can be heard from the side discussing the auction. The man at the table says that the main lot of the upcoming auction is an amazing thing. He wonders who will get it. The second man says that it is difficult for him to even guess, because a lot of big people gathered in the tavern, hunting for this jewel. The first man asks again about big people. He is told to take a look at the man in the white coat who is the cursed king Zus. His strength is almost equal to the strength of the best magicians. The man then points to Razorar, Diamond Ale and Diamond Stan, trying to convey that there are many jewel hunters gathered in the tavern. It seems to you that this little thing from the auction attracts the attention of many famous personalities. Suddenly someone touches you from the left side. A girl from the tavern approaches him. He calls her sister and asks her why she came to the auction. The girl replies that she does not want to miss the auction, which takes place once a year. Then the girl snuggles closer to you. She says that her sister sounds too cold and aloof, so she asks you to call her Linda. The guy says that you can just call him you. Linda thinks to herself that you fell for her tricks too quickly. She wants to wait for the auction to get you's ring. Linda tells you that everything will start soon, so she can be his guide and tell him everything about the auction. The men who are talking about big people notice Linda and you. One of them recognizes old man she's precious daughter. They assume that there is another important person next to her. They do not recognize you, but assume that he is a member of a wealthy family who has fallen for Linda's tricks. In the hall, on the wall of which there is a drawing of a snake in the center, there is a table and stands filled with people. You ask Linda why there are so many people and if they are afraid that someone will reveal their secret. The girl says that this auction is being held by old man she whom no one in the city would dare to anger. Also, quite influential people make purchases at this auction. A man appears on the stage. He welcomes the guests. There was a commotion in the hall. The man on the stage continues. He says that tonight is the final one in their auction series. He hopes that everyone can't wait to go home with their jewelry. A girl in a rabbit costume approaches the presenter. She holds a box covered with a red handkerchief. The man says it's time to start and removes the handkerchief from the box. Inside the box is the first lot, the Hand of Black Magic. The initial price of this lot is 50,000 gold. You thought about the fact that a pen that can only summon black magic or curse others is considered so valuable. People immediately began to offer the amount, increasing each time. Someone shouted 55,000, someone 60, someone 70. Linda turns to you and says that in addition to the ingredients that he is looking for at the auction, there are many more worthwhile things that are worth paying attention to, especially considering that he rarely goes to auctions, so he should not miss the chance. Yu leans back, agreeing with Linda based on the fact that he still came to this auction. Linda points to the next slot, a valuable hairpin that was found in a thousand-year-old cave. Yu considers her too gloomy, so he refuses. Linda then offers the ring, which is a relic of the Hanging City. When Yu hears Hanging City he becomes unwell, so he refuses. Yu asks why there is nothing worthy at the auction. Linda thinks about why the guy doesn't buy anything. If this continues, she won't get the ring. But Linda has a backup plan that needs time. She is serious. The presenter says that the time has come for which everyone has been waiting for so long. He asks to be allowed to proudly present the last slot. He slowly tears the canvas off the box, calling its contents a real treasure of their auction. Steam and strange sounds can be heard throughout the room. People are very excited. Among the crowd, you can notice a mysterious person in a hood. And then the canvas is torn off the box completely, and the last slot is shown, an ice jasper bracelet with a lotus. Its initial price is 2 million. A man with a scar on his face and a white hood immediately jumped up, offering 3 million. New offers were heard in the crowd, 3 million 500, 5 million. The amount grew with each offer. Linda was thinking about why you was still sitting and doing nothing. Had she made a mistake? Maybe you doesn't have any money. But then you gets up from his seat, smiling, which attracts Linda's attention. And he says that his bet is 10 million. There was silence in the hall. Linda went into shock. The presenter started counting down. After counting to the end, the presenter said that as a result, the slot was sold to you for 10 million. There was silence in the hall after you offered an amount equal to 10 million. The presenter asked again even louder to make sure that there was a person who would invest such a huge amount in the last lot. 
Yu confirms his words. There was talk in the hall that Yu did not look like a member of a rich family. So where did he get such money from then? Many assume that he made a bid at old man Shi's auction without having any money. In this case, something bad may happen to him. The presenter repeats again to make sure, and then starts counting from 1 to 3. Another offer was made to the side, 13 million. A surprise squeal is heard from the side. Someone is struck by the ongoing bidding. Linda watches all this and can't get enough of it. Even if she doesn't get Yu's void ring, these auctions will provide her and her father with a fortune. The young man looks at the one who offered 13 million and sees a security guard there, whom he met on the street while he crashed into a man in a hood. Apparently, that man from the street of the place with his guards came to the auction for an ice jasper bracelet and a lotus. Yu grins, thinking that he doesn't have much time anyway, so he won't delay the bidding and will offer a much higher amount. He takes the ring off his finger and says that he will give his interdimensional ring along with 30 million. The guard is shocked by such a statement. People in the hall are also starting to make a fuss. One person in the crowd thinks that Yu has gone mad. On the other side, a person notices that there is an S-class spatial ring inlaid with a magic stone of the highest level. The presenter starts counting again, but with the sum of 30 million. The guard turns to the Lord of Man and asks if they will continue to raise the price. Vladika Man replies that it is not necessary, since the enemy does not look like the local people at all. Most likely, he, like them, has learned the real value of the Jasper Bracelet and the Lotus. Man believes that since he calmly calls such a price, it means he definitely has the means to increase it. Vladika Man says that the best option would be to wait and see how events will develop further. From the center of the hall, the words of the presenter sounded, which announced the results of the auction. The deal is perfect. The last lot will be given for 30 million and a spatial ring between. The host congratulates the gentleman who took the lot for 30 million and the S-class spatial ring of emptiness between. It was he who received the main treasure of this auction. The host asks you to come backstage a little later to resolve issues with some formalities. Linda is happy that a large sum will come to her after the auction. She tells you that she can help him get behind the stage if he doesn't know the way. Yu already jumps down from his seat and tells her not to bother, as he is in a hurry, so he will go there the shortest way. Linda rushes towards Yu and asks him to stop, not to climb over the stands. Yu approaches the presenter and hands him the ring, saying that all 30 million are in it and he can check it. The presenter takes the ring, a little nervous. Yu turns to Linda, asking what she said from the stands. He didn't hear her. Linda was trying to tell you that there is one crucial rule at the auction. If the buyer steps on the stage without permission, it is regarded as a violation of the rules. If someone has violated this rule, then he must pay for all the lots that were put up for auction. Also, if this rule is violated, then any person at the auction has the right to take away what this violator has acquired. People at the auction are ready to jump from the stands to the center of the hall. One of them gives the command forward, and everyone rushes straight to you with the leader. There is a huge explosion in the very center of the hall. One of the auction participants noticed a lot that was lying untouched. He's going to pick it up right away. Another participant noticed King Zeus, who overtook everyone. King Zeus approaches the lot with the bracelet and says that it will now belong to him. Suddenly something stops him. He sees the other participants being grabbed by a man called the Lund Fighting Machine. He is surprised by the appearance of the military at the auction. Suddenly the ground is covered with ice. King Seuss feels the ice reaching his feet. The ice lady appears. She pulls off her hood, under which a black-haired girl was hiding. Melina Isis, one of the best magicians of the Empire. People call her the Ice Lady, a warrior girl. Melina Isis approaches the lot and takes its contents, but she is suddenly grabbed by the hand. You grabbed her by the arm. He tells her that although she is very beautiful, it is wrong to take other people's things. The building collapsed after the magical attacks of the auction participants. Debris is everywhere and steam is coming out. Melina Isis looks at you in surprise. The guy tells her that she takes the thing without even saying hello, and this is very impolite. Melina Isis pulls out her hand. You at this moment turns to the presenter and says that he is in a hurry, so he takes the Jasper bracelet the lotus and leaves. Melina Isis looks at the empty lot and throws it aside. She had such a hard time getting a jasper bracelet that could take her magic to a new level. She can't just let you go. She gathers all her strength in her hand and starts attacking with ice blocks. The boulders are rushing straight towards you. All the participants realized that it was not just ice blocks, but an ice prison, so they decided to run as fast as possible. Linda sees what is happening and understands that there will be irreparable consequences later. The icy forces of Raspberry Isis blocked the way to the exit. There was only sparkling ice all around. 
people just stood there, not knowing how to get out. Melina Isis looks at you and says that it will only take a couple of minutes and he will never be able to leave this building. You chuckles in response, he says that he does not believe in such words. You takes the sword from some guy, to outrageous cheers. It turns out that the man, whose name is Diamond Stan, he asks if you really expects that the rusty sword will help him get out. Diamond Stan hits the ice with both fists and jerks towards you. You gets into a fighting stance and opens the first level of the seal. He makes one swing with his sword. The blade of the sword is the last thing that Diamond Stan sees before flying away for a huge distance. He crashes back into the ice blocks. After the impact, there was only steam and a huge crack on the wall. Linda, watching all this, cannot understand who you really is. You tells all the participants that he is in a hurry very much, so they must attack all at once, otherwise one by one it will be too long. All the participants froze. Only one of the raspberries began to fold the seal. Ice blocks began to appear from the wall of ice, which immediately flew straight at you. The young man stands motionless. Right at his head, the ice blocks stop. Melina Isis says she only needs a jasper bracelet. You can keep the ice lotus for himself. You does not agree with the girl. The guy smiles and says that he will take the jasper bracelet and the lotus with him. The crack of the ice wall is heard. The participants stood frozen in place and watched the ongoing duel between you and Melina Isis. The ice lady says she is giving you one last chance to give her the ice amulet. All the ice blocks are directed towards you. You says he refuses. He wants to finish as soon as possible, as they are waiting for him at home. Melina Isis tells him not to be offended because she will take the ice amulet by force. Abruptly, all the ice blocks flew into you. The guy grins and puts the sword point into the ground. Light energy appears around him, which breaks all the blocks flying into him. Melina Isis thinks that her technique against you is useless, but she still achieved her goal. Linda exclaims in surprise, not understanding what is happening. Something huge and dangerous appeared in front of you. A huge block of ice is flying straight at him. Melina Isis used the icy deathly hallows. The ice block, without stopping, flew straight into you. The ice block landed in you's place, letting off steam. Fragments flew in different directions. Melina Isis orders Lund to go and find the ice amulet, since you most likely hid it in his interdimensional ring. The guard immediately executes the order. You appears out of the steam. He says that he really put the ice amulet into the interspatial ring. But you himself is not at all under an ice block, which affects raspberries from the sea. She turns around and sees him alive. Melina Isis didn't expect you to be able to escape. You says that she pronounced her spell so loudly, anyone would have heard. He continues and says that a huge piece of ice is surrounded by an aura of icy air. It will not be possible to hide this. It seems to him that Melina Isis has not yet mastered the art of hidden attacks. Melina Isis starts to get angry. You asks her if she really wants to continue the fight. The clothes on the body of Melina Isis tore a little. You makes one swing with his sword, and Melina Isis remains practically without clothes. Many participants were confused by this. Melina Isis fell to her knees, not believing what was happening. The guard runs up to her and throws a raincoat over her to cover her. By Raspberry Isis passed you. She couldn't help but think about this man. He was indestructible. You turns to the other participants and asks if there is anyone else who would like to try to take the Jasper bracelet and the Ice Lotus. If not, then he takes it and leaves. The rest of the participants from fright began to turn their heads from side to side, showing that there were no takers. The guard turns to the Lord of Man and asks if it is necessary to send people to catch you. The girl replies that it is not necessary. The Lord of Man had just realized that you was so strong that he only needed one second to deal with her. Yu raises his sword, makes a swing and splits the ice wall. Fragments are flying everywhere. He turns to the auction participants and says that now they will be able to get out. Then Yu finds Linda and thanks her for telling about the auction. He asks her to help him return the sword to the person from whom he took it. The girl takes the sword and agrees. Yu turns to Linda. Linda listens to him attentively. He tells her that the girl really looks better with her hair gathered than when it is loose. The girl blushes after the guy's words. Yu is going to the exit and says that they will see each other again. The girl asks him not to forget to visit her again. She will leave him all the materials on the list. Linda is approached by other participants. They ask what happened to her and where the heartless beauty Linda has disappeared. One of the young men asks her who Yu is and where he came from. The girl herself thinks about who such a beautiful, rich and strong person can be. Then she says she will get married in the future. She promises that in this life, in the next, and even the next, she will marry only him. A young man walks through the dark streets. At some point he sneezes. He thinks about what his teacher Sierra is thinking there. 
He needs to get back soon. Strange sounds are heard somewhere in the corner of the street. Someone's voice says about someone that I didn't think she was so stubborn. And then the voice offers to teach someone a lesson. Yu pays attention to the voices and walks around the corner. He sees there two men with guns and a woman who is hiding from them. The man brings the whip up, saying that there is no other choice left. At this moment, Yu grabs the whip. The man does not understand who prevented him. Yu says that if a man treats women like that, he will bring trouble on himself. The other men were alarmed and asked you not to interfere in other people's affairs. One of them rudely demands you to leave. Yu grabs the man's whip and throws it aside. Everyone else was scared and froze, watching what was happening. Yu turns to them again and says he didn't hear them. He asks me to repeat what they told him. Men immediately begin to justify themselves and shift responsibility for words to each other. One of the men says it's too dark and it's time for them to leave. They found a reason to leave and not get into trouble, and then very quickly ran away, fearing you. Yu leans over to the hooded girl and asks how she feels. Suddenly he recognizes her and is surprised. At night, Sierra and Silph are sitting in the hotel. They are waiting for you to return. So much time has passed, and he has not returned. Sierra is very worried about him. Sierra gets up and tells Sylph that they should go and look for him. Sylph agrees. Suddenly the door opens and Sierra sees you with Aggie. After a while, they sit down at the table and feed Aggie. Aggie says that Aisha has disappeared, which makes Sierra start to worry. To be more precise, Aisha said that she would take a break from her studies and return home. But from the moment she left, she could not be contacted. Aggie thinks Aisha is definitely in trouble, so she came to tell teacher Sierra about it. She asks them to go to Aisha's house and ask if she is alright. Yu asks before Aisha left school if anything unusual happened. Aggie answered in the negative, specifying that Aisha was saying goodbye with an unusually sad face. At dawn, a carriage was already standing near the hotel, in which horses were harnessed. Yu comes out of the building and tells Master Sierra that he has prepared a potion. He asks Sierra to drink it on the way back to the academy. Yu says that it will not be possible to completely restore magical powers instantly, but it will increase the speed of recovery. Sierra regrets that she needs to go and report the passing of Master Asasa. Otherwise, she would have gone with Yu, Sylph and Aggie to explore Aisha's house. Sierra asks if he is sure that it is worth going to explore with Aggie. Yu doesn't understand what's wrong with that. Sierra says that in their current situation, they need to stay away from the three great families and the people associated with them. Sierra says the girl's full name is Aggie Isis, coincides with the family name of the general. Sierra says she's worried, but you interrupts her. He says that even if Aggie Zero is one of the general's people, it still does not negate the fact that she is a trusted friend of you. Sierra knew you would say those words. She asks him to be careful on the way and return soon. The carriage is on its way. Aggie falls asleep immediately, and Yu thinks that he wants to take back the words he said earlier. On the other hand, Aggie had come a long way from the academy to find them with Sierra. Yu remembers a dark street covered with cracks from the impact. He remembers finding Aggie and asking her what she was doing in such a place. Aggie raised her head and began to cry. She throws herself at Yu's feet and rejoices that she has finally found him. Yu asks Aggie why she is alone and if she is injured. Aggie is abruptly embarrassed and moves away from the young man to the side. Aggie says she's fine, just overexcited. She has one very important matter that she would like to tell teacher Sierra about. Aggie asks you to take her to the teacher as soon as possible. Yu notices that Yu has a wound on his shoulder. He immediately becomes serious. Yu sits in the carriage and looks at Aggie, thinking that she has done a great job, so she needs to get a good sleep. A couple of days later, they arrive at the western outskirts of the town of Gorst, at the estate of the Lawrence family. The estate's windows are dirty and scratched. The walls of the house are crumbling, there are cracks everywhere. Aggie asks if this is exactly the Lawrence estate. Maybe they took a wrong turn and arrived at another place. The man says there can be no mistake. This estate definitely belongs to the Lawrence family. Then he tells me that the Lawrence family completely disappeared 10 years ago, so the estate is empty and now looks so old and abandoned. After a while, you and Aggie looked up at the estate, and from below, it was true that no one had been in the estate for a long time. But it is obvious that the address of Aisha's family is exactly this place. Suddenly something falls and a loud sound is heard. Aggie gets scared. Something fell, covered with a white cloth. Aggie pulls off the white canvas, and together they bend down to see what kind of thing is there. A portrait of Aisha's family was hidden behind a white canvas. Her father and mother, Yu does not know, but he is sure that the woman in the portrait is definitely not Aisha. Apparently, Aisha has moved, but why is there still an old address in the archive? He offers to stay for a couple more days to find out what happened to the Lawrence family estate. 
Aggie remembered Aisha. She says that before leaving, Aisha asked her for a favor. You asks what the favor is. Aggie takes out a small box and says that Aisha asked her to hand it over to you, so the girl hands the box to the guy. In an unfamiliar tavern, people are sitting everywhere and talking about something. You and Aggie are sitting in this tavern. You open the box and saw a golden ring inside. He asks Aggie if Aisha really asked me to give him this box. You examines the drawing on the ring and realizes that it does not belong to the Lawrence family. Then whose is this ring? Aggie and you went to the workshops of the city together to find out about the ring. But none of the masters had met this image before. A tavern worker notices the ring and asks if the family coat of arms belongs to the Count. You and Aggie immediately started up. The employee says that the owner of this ring is Count Theodore, a very elegant aristocrat. The worker still remembers how beautiful the day was when the Count entered their tavern. At that moment, she was comforting Lily, who had lost her husband, but this did not prevent her from clearly seeing this very ring on his hand. You and Aggie look at each other. The employee is angry because the Count liked Lily, and not her. Aggie says Aisha's mother's name is Lily. You remembers and confirms her words. Aggie asks if the worker Lily mentioned is the same girl who disappeared from the Lawrence estate. The employee says she doesn't think Lily has disappeared anywhere. It seems to her that Lily ran away with Theodore, falling in love with him as soon as she saw him, and she took the baby with her. They should understand how hard it is for a single woman to raise a child without a husband. You asks where this Count Theodore is now. The worker recalls that the possessions of Count Theodore were located somewhere in the east of the Empire of Nanaya, far enough from the tavern. One of the tavern's visitors asks for beer. The employee listens. She finally tells them not to go there, because lately there have been a lot of demons in the southeast of the Empire. The visitor asks the employee again, and she hastily responds. Aggie doesn't understand where the demons got divorced from there. Yu thinks that they are returning to the issue of motion sickness on trips again. Aggie looks at Yu questioningly. He grunts, puzzled. The girl asks him if you will teach her to rip off anger. If they really meet demons, then Aggie's skills will not be enough to resist them. But she wants to find Aisha together with you. The guy doesn't understand what it means to rip off anger. Aggie explains that her tearing off anger and relying on the magic bestowed by nature are not the same thing at all. This is the internal energy that appears in the process of tempering and cultivation. Combining it and natural magic, you can release the power of a huge volume. The guy nods at the end of the narration. Aggie asks you to stop and asks if he knows what it is to rip off anger. She asks about how he was able to defeat Kyle if he didn't know about her. She also remembers that the guy is not subject to natural magic. In this case, new questions arise. The guy is alarmed and says that he didn't ask her about anything. Aggie says that she has answered all his questions and now he must teach her to take out her anger. The guy is a little uncertain, but still agrees. In the house of Assessa, someone scattered things in search of some specific thing. Sierra is looking for something. She approaches the table, assuming that apart from the Hellfire, all the other things of the Apostle Asses had to collect and store somewhere in this place. She notices a hole in the table and realizes that someone violated the ban and took everything. Sierra believes that in this case, it is all the more impossible to let people know about the death of Aces. Otherwise, the Empire will be in serious danger. The girl sighs. She pulls out a bottle of blue liquid. The championship of five schools will begin soon. She wonders if you and Aggie will have time to find Asia and return back. A cart with horses harnessed to it rides along the forest edge. Strange sounds are heard in the cart. Aggie sighs, turns her back and says she forbids touching her. The young man says he should try. He puts his hands on her waist and pulls her up. The girl is embarrassed and then kicks. The guy is angry because he helps her to awaken anger from the outside, and she kicks. The girl started rolling on the floor and laughing. She apologized to him and explained that she just couldn't stand it because she was tickled. Sylph had been sitting across from him all this time and watching what was happening. Yu asks her to help him deal with Aggie. Sylph turns away and says she hears nothing and sees nothing. You can tell by her look that she's not interested. The guy starts to get angry. He asks if Aggie still wants him to help her awaken the Force. The girl confirms his words several times and asks him to try again. The man who is driving the cart hears everything that is happening inside and grins at the fact that the guy is full of strength. Two weeks later, a wagon arrives in Nanaya, in which you, Sylph and Aggie are. Aggie looks out the window of the wagon and explores the city center of Nanaya. There is silence all around and people look suspicious. The carriage started off again. Aggie says it looks like they got the wrong address. Aisha can't live in such a place. Yu thinks that the driver could not have been mistaken, but in this place even the most ordinary shops are closed, and everything is very strange. Yu points to the crowd that has gathered in the square. 
He asked the cabman to stop to find out what was going on. The sun is shining on the building that belongs to the Adventurer's Guild. People gathered at a huge table, which was placed right next to the building. Yu leaned on the cart while Aggie watched the people who had gathered around the Adventurer's Guild. She goes inside the building and asks the girl at the table if anyone knows a count named Theodore. The girl answers that there is and then asks for what purpose they are looking for him. Aggie just started talking, but Yu did not let her finish and said that they needed to leave for a couple of minutes. Aggie gets angry and asks why Yu didn't let her finish. She just wanted to ask if Aisha is here. Yu tells her to think that if Aisha's mom really married Theodore, but the residents of Gorse think that she disappeared, then she didn't want people to know where she was at all. Aggie immediately saw the light. She realized that she couldn't ask directly. They come back to the girl at the table. Yu says that in fact, they found Count Theodore's family ring on the road, so they wanted to return it, and at the same time get some kind of reward. Aggie actively agrees. Yu asks again where this count lives. The girl replies that his castle is far away in the suburbs. To get there, you need to overcome the forests of Nanaya. That's just something wrong has been going on in them lately. Aggie screams, asking if there really are demons there. The girl confirms her own words. She says that six months ago there were a lot more local animals. Then rumors began to spread about the appearance of demons, and only recently their traces were really discovered. Yu makes the assumption that the Adventurer's Guild are demon hunters hired by Count Theodore. The girl says that even with this, that this is the Count's land, but he did not react at all to the appearance of demons. So this time the reward is announced by the Imperial Adventurer Society itself. The girl says that the one who kills one monster will be able to get 5 million. Aggie and you were immediately inspired. For them, this is just a huge amount for which they are ready to cope with the monster. Yu thinks that if Count Theodore is now Aisha's stepfather, then he will help him clear the domain of demons and at the same time get a huge amount of money. And then he wonders if the Count will marry Aisha to a young man. Aggie asks if all the demons were destroyed a long time ago, why they reappear. The girl says that they themselves do not know anything about it yet. Literally this afternoon, a detachment of a hundred hunters left, and he has not yet returned back. Yu remembers, even before this human civilization, humans and demons coexisted peacefully for quite a long time. But for some reason a war broke out. In the end, this resulted in a confrontation between the defender of the people of Arma and the demon supporting Kapasis. This was the first war that occurred in the time of the Apostles. The battle was over, but no one saw Arma or Kapasis anymore. Demons also did not appear in the sight of people. Yu thinks that if Arma and Kapasis hadn't fought so fiercely after all, Humanity wouldn't have to be so afraid of the apostles. It's still unclear what might be going on in the forest. It's already evening in the forest of Nanaya. There are bodies of hunters everywhere. One of the survivors is running at full speed. Someone is chasing him. Suddenly, the survivor stumbles over the roots of a tree and falls to the ground. Demonic animals are catching up with him. The surviving hunter asks not to touch him. But a huge white clawed paw swings and strikes him, so that blood gushes onto the tree trunk. The monster looked like a white werewolf. Aggie and you are still in the Adventurer's Guild. The guy clarifies that the girl said about sending hundreds of brave men to hunt for demons, so there really are a lot of demons in the forest. The girl at the table says that there is actually a werewolf demon in the forest that they are trying to get rid of. Yu chuckles. He believes that a werewolf is not a scary monster at all. He asks if such a thing is not solved in a couple of strokes of the blade. The girl is very surprised by the young man's statement. She assumes that the young man is an adventurer of the golden level or higher. Yu says that he is at the iron level and shows his badge, which at the moment causes tension in the girl at the table and laughter from one of the hunters in the building. The girl says that this werewolf is very insidious, his movements are lightning fast. They say that he owns the magic of shadows. Rumor has it that this werewolf even copes with gold level hunters effortlessly. Therefore, she is very worried about Yu. Yu doesn't understand such a fuss about one werewolf. In his opinion, werewolves are not very smart. The only thing they differ in is that their limbs are more developed. How could they disappear for a while and learn shadow magic? A man approaches them and says that Yu does not understand what is happening at all. He advises him to pick up his girlfriend and go back to where they came from. Aggie indignantly says that she is not his girlfriend. The man grins at her shyness. Aggie turns to Yu and says she thinks people know what they're talking about. A werewolf can really be very strong, so they should change their route. Yu asks her to relax and says that even if the werewolf really owns shadow magic, it still won't complicate their task. Since they found out about where the Count's castle is, they really should hit the road. He thanks for the reception and is about to leave. The girl at the table just nods. Yu and Aggie reach the forest closer to night. 
It was already dark. Aggie suggests the guy to return to the forest in a day since it's too late. She asks why they have to go today. She's worried that something terrible is going to happen. Suddenly, some strange sounds are heard. Aggie immediately became alert and raised her edged weapon. But it was only a hare that jumped out from behind the bushes. Aggie sighs with relief that it was just a hare. But from the side, a panther is already flying at Aggie. Yu manages to react and puts a block, and then kicks the animal so that it flies away a huge distance, and then dissolves like a haze. Aggie and Yu are watching this. The girl asks what else it is. Yu says it's a black panther that was created by a demon. A growl is heard from the side. It turns out, a whole pack of panthers. The girl gets scared, and then a huge white werewolf comes out and starts talking. The werewolf says he didn't think anyone would recognize his black panther. There were more and more panthers. The werewolf grins and tells the young man that he is not so bad, and then invites him to join them. The time will come, they will conquer the continent and then they will save the lives of Yu and Aggie. Yu tells Aggie that the werewolf has decided to take over the entire continent. The girl confirms his words. The werewolf is angry because of such carelessness and asks if these two listen to him at all. Yu says he won't be able to join because he doesn't like the way the werewolf and his minions treat people. The guy thinks it doesn't suit him. In addition, he can't let them conquer the entire continent. The werewolf got more angry, but then anger turns to laughter. He says they are interesting and wonders if they really think they can beat him. The werewolf says that the entire group of hunters sent in the morning was destroyed by him. One by one, Yu is not very surprised. He only gives out sarcastic comments, because of which the werewolf got angry again. The werewolf, growling, asks how Yu dares to mock him. And then his black panthers fly into the attack. Yu commands Aggie to move forward. Aggie gets excited at the moment. It was her turn. It seemed strange to the werewolf that Aggie was ready to attack. Just a second ago, she was trembling with fear. Aggie holds her weapon in front of her and concentrates while the light energy envelops her. Then Aggie opens his eyes and, making a wave of his weapon, lets a wave of light energy directly into the pack of panthers. The panthers cannot dodge and are defeated. The werewolf is stunned by the fact that all his henchmen were cut down with one swing. Then Aggie sighs and says that it's not for nothing that she pretended to be so scared all this time. The werewolf assumes that the girl and the guy wanted to lure him out with their acting. Yu smiles rapaciously and pretends to say that they were able to figure them out after all. Apparently, the young man has some kind of plan. In the forest, someone is heard shouting angrily. The werewolf is very angry because it turns out that Yu and Aggie wanted to play him and lure him out from the very beginning. Yu says that in fact, not from the very beginning, but only along the way they were able to come up with this plan to breed him. He is inspired again and says that if they can deal with the werewolf, they will receive a huge sum of money. Yu also hopes that Aisha's father will marry her to a guy. Aggie looks at all this with doubt. The werewolf admires the guy's audacity. He says it's okay to try to deal with him, but deceiving him is already too much. The werewolf thinks that if they agreed to join him, he could spare them, but unfortunately, his offer is no longer valid. The next moment, the werewolf jumps up and rushes forward to attack. Yu also jumped up and kicked the werewolf in the stomach. The werewolf did not expect such a blow. He coughed up blood. Despite the blow he received, he managed to group up and land. Yu tells Aggie that he wants to deal with the werewolf himself, since he still needs to ask him something. Aggie agrees. The werewolf stands up and chuckles darkly. He says he understands everything. They deliberately angered him to find his weak spot. The werewolf gathers all his strength. He shouts that he didn't think you and Aggie were so strong. Now he definitely won't let them go alive. The werewolf becomes stronger by gathering all his magical powers. A shadow covers him. Aggie asks what else it is. Yu says it's shadow magic from the afterlife. The young man asks about who taught the werewolf such magic. The werewolf jumps, trying to attack again. He shouts that Yu can try it himself, but he will have to go down to hell. Yu evades and says that, in principle, why not? And again the werewolf attacks, trying to grab the young man by the leg. But Yu manages to jump away. While Yu dodges the blows, he says that he would be happy to go down to hell himself. But there is one annoying guy there. The werewolf swings for another blow, strikes directly at the place where Yu was standing. As a result of this impact, the earth cracks and collapses. The werewolf doesn't understand why he can't touch Yu. The guy jumped back and started saying that he thought and decided to ask the werewolf one thing after all. The werewolf says that Yu forces him to answer his questions, while he did not answer the werewolf's questions. It's not fair, Yu thinks about it. Then he pulls out his sword, which is already blazing with green magic and makes a swing. The werewolf does not have time to blink, as a smooth dissecting sword strike is inflicted on him. The werewolf gets hit. Aggie looks at all this and covers herself from the bursts of energy that spreads throughout the forest. 
The werewolf stands for a while, and then falls to his knees, unable to move. Yu directs the tip of the sword directly into the face of the werewolf. He tells the werewolf that if he wants justice, he will have to answer all the questions or he will die. Yu says he will spare the werewolf, but in return from now on he will follow all his orders. He orders the werewolf to first tell who he is and where he came from. The werewolf obeys him and tells him that they demons were preparing to conquer this continent under the leadership of the Prince of Darkness Akla. The prince sent him to scout the local situation before the invasion. He believes that humans are much weaker than demons. They wanted to capture the neighborhood first, and then come back and report everything. But he didn't know that he would meet the two of them and be defeated. Yu asks again why they wanted to return to the mainland. Where, in this case, is the abode of demons? A werewolf under threat of deprivation of life says that one gentleman created a small world for them, gave them the opportunity to accumulate strength and improve. Aggie asks how strong the gentleman is since he can create new worlds. The werewolf begins to tell that the gentleman has stressed many times that they should not give out information about him. He is the savior and benefactor of their kind. The werewolf says they can kill him, but he still won't tell anything about his master. Aggie gets angry. Yu thinks about it. The Lord created the whole world to protect the demon race. It seems to him that this is all the work of Arma. After all, he has incredible wisdom and unsurpassed magical skills. If it really was Arma, then you wouldn't be surprised. Yu asks the werewolf why then the master allowed them to go out and invade the human world. Yu suddenly stiffens. Aggie asks if he's okay. Yu felt that someone had opened the gate of the limit. The gate of the limit is the gate connecting all the worlds with each other, human, afterlife, paradise, the world of elements, the palace of the apostles. Someone knocked on the room with the wooden door. The voice said that it was possible to enter and the door opened. Aisha is sitting in front of the mirror. Her mother came into the room. The girl asks her mother what happened. Mom tells her daughter that the gentleman sent a man with a gift and he is waiting for her in the living room. Aisha gets up from the table and says that she will clean herself up, and then she will come down. She walks around the room, leaving a rose on the table. The moon shines on a dark night. Yu with Aggie and the werewolf is still in the forest. Yu thinks that for sure this is the world in which the demons are hiding, has just connected with the human one. One thing is not clear why this world exudes such a barely discernible strange smell. Aggie calls out to Yu, and the young man refuses, saying that he was a little distracted. Yu asks that if the werewolf needs to report the situation to Akla and that gentleman, then he will need to open the gate of the limit or need someone who knows how to transfer information between the two worlds. The werewolf says not to think he can know such things. He says that they cannot directly return to the demon world, so they need the help of messengers to transmit messages. Yu says that he needs the werewolf to take him to one of the messengers, let him give their lord a few words from him. But first they need to go to another place. They are walking through a dark forest. Aggie looks at the map and says that they need to go directly in a certain direction, so they can get to the castle. The werewolf asks if this is the castle that is located off the coast. Aggie asks how the werewolf knows about him. The werewolf says that this is the castle of their messenger. Aggie was immediately worried. If Aisha is really in that castle, then the ring may be her signal for help. Yu understands the girl's worries. Yu approaches Aggie and says they need to hurry up. He picks her up in his arms and jumps up. Yu shouted to the werewolf that they would go ahead and that Carrick would catch up with them. The werewolf obeys. The waves are beating against the margins. Yu landed near one of them with Aggie. The castle was right on the cliff. Someone suddenly comes out from the side of the castle. Aggie and Yu immediately pay attention to him. A man with blonde hair greets them and says he is happy to learn of their arrival. He points to the castle and says that the gentleman is already waiting for them in the castle. Near the castle on the cliff are you, Aggie and a blonde man. He points to the castle and says that their master is already waiting for them, so they should follow the servant inside the castle. Aggie whispers to you that this is most likely a trap of the same messenger. You doesn't know, but they wanted to go inside the castle anyway, so he decides to go there and find out everything. Aggie agrees and follows him. They go inside the castle. The blonde-haired servant asks to follow him and wait for the gentleman in the living room. You suddenly felt something. Aggie asks what happened. Yu makes a serene appearance and puts his hands behind his head, saying that he was just distracted for a second. Aggie approaches Yu and tells him that she feels some strange, barely perceptible smell. They climb a huge staircase, passing a portrait depicting a blonde man. The servant brings them into the room and notifies his master that the guests have arrived. A figure sitting in an armchair puts a cup on the table and says that the servant can go. The servant immediately leaves. The figure sitting in the chair rises and turns to Yu and Aggie to greet them. Yu and Aggie are shocked that they see Aisha in front of them. The woman says that she is actually Aisha's mom. 
She asks to be called Lilies. Aggie confirms her guess that in fact their family moved, not disappeared. The woman approaches you and says that he is the guy for whom Aisha has feelings. You asks where Aisha is. The woman laughs. She puts her hands on Yu's shoulders and says that if he plans to take Aisha away, then he will not succeed. But if he is looking for pleasure for one night, then she herself can help him. Yu abruptly grabs the woman by the hand, saying that there are too many succubi. Aggie is shocked again. She can't believe that the woman is not Aisha's mother, but a succubus. Then the girl makes the assumption that the woman is a messenger. But the woman immediately refutes this assumption. She says that she is very interested in how you realized that he was a succubus. Yu says that he and Aggie had just arrived at the castle gate, and she already knew that they had arrived, and also invited them to enter. Only people who possess black magic could do this. The abilities of ordinary magicians will not help here. The woman says that she is an unusual magician. Yu asks how she will then explain that decades have passed and her appearance has remained the same. People usually get old. Also, another confirmation that a woman is a succubus can serve as a charm of seduction, just used by her. The woman confirms that she is a succubus. She also says that Aisha is her daughter. The woman is a pure-blooded succubus and Aisha is a half-breed. As a reward for the fact that Yu was able to restrain her charms, the woman decided to tell that Aisha was in the back room on the second floor. Yu turns to Aggie and tells them to go there for Aisha. The girl says she'd better wait downstairs. She believes that Yu is the person Aisha wants to see the most right now, so she won't interfere with them. Yu asks the girl if she is sure that she wants to stay downstairs with the succubus. The woman asks the guy not to worry, she promises not to touch Aggie. The succubus tells you to go to her daughter as soon as possible, since it's late and most likely her daughter will go to bed soon. Aisha points at you again and tells him to go faster. The guy warns her to be careful anyway. The succubus tense for a second. Yu goes upstairs and asks if Aisha is sleeping. He notices that the door is not locked, so he decides to go inside. The room is empty. Yu is embarrassed and worried about going into Aisha's room. He notices a rose on the table which he gave to the girl before leaving for the magic congress. The door opens, Yu turns around and sees Aisha, who came out of the bath in a towel. The girl comes out of the bathroom and asks what Yu is doing in her room. The guy got worried, he tried to explain that he had just come to her room and did not know that. A girl in the shower, he says he didn't have any bad thoughts. The girl smiles, the girl remembers the words of Dark Matter, who said that if the majesty finds out that Aisha is dating someone, he will get very angry. Yu says that he and Aggie came to find her. He mentions that Aggie is waiting for them downstairs. The girl looks down and tells them to leave. They shouldn't have come. Yu didn't understand, so he asks the girl again. Aisha says that the ring was just at her fingertips. She just left it as a souvenir, not thinking that they would be able to find her. Yu says that the girl left school without telling anyone, so everyone was very worried about her. The girl clenches her hand into a fist. She wants you and Aggie to leave as soon as possible before something irreparable happens. Aisha says that she will soon marry the honorable gentleman. Of course she does not need anyone now. Very soon she will own untold riches and fame. You asks her why she is crying then. Aisha is at a loss. How can she cry if she's holding back so hard? You sighs, approaches the girl and says that before deceiving someone, you need to deceive yourself first. Yu tells Aisha that she has a weak acting game and he did not believe that she wants to marry a gentleman. Aisha starts crying harder. She says it's all because of her. She shouldn't have passed the ring through Aggie. In that case, they wouldn't have been able to find her. She starts to say something about the gentleman, but abruptly stops. Yu thinks, the gentleman Aisha is talking about is the Prince of Darkness, the Lord of Demons. Aisha says that she and Aggie do not understand how dangerous that gentleman is. He is a real ruler of demons. If he finds out about them, he won't let them go alive. Even if there is no master, Aisha will still not be able to go with them, since she is a succubus, and the essence of succubi is the absorption of human human lives. The girl is embarrassed for a moment, saying that even if there is a relationship between them, nothing will work out anyway. Yu says that it doesn't matter to him whether she is a human or a succubus, or maybe even a demon, but he thinks that Aisha remains Aisha anyway. As for that gentleman, Yu has no plans to worry about him yet. He asks the girl if she is ready to leave the castle with them right at this moment. Aisha wants to take Yu's hand. The clock can be heard ringing all over the house. It's exactly 12 o'clock. Aggie was a little worried. The moon was covered by clouds. Strange sounds were heard all over the castle. Aisha also heard the clock that struck 12 o'clock. Time flies very fast. Yu says that the time spent with Aisha always flies by very quickly. Aisha orders Yu to turn around so she can change her clothes. The guy was alarmed. The girl asks him to speed up, otherwise they will all get into trouble. Yu turns away. Yu asks what's going on. 
Aisha says she doesn't have time to explain. She tells him that they will have to fight a fierce battle, and then notifies that she changed her clothes. The girl takes off her towel and shows that she is wearing a white dress with red patches, a corset and a ribbon. Yu compliments the girl. Aisha tells Yu to follow her. The guy stops the girl and puts a bracelet on her arm. The guy says it's a Jasper bracelet he bought at auction. This bracelet is perfectly combined with the magic of ice, so he thought it was perfect for her. Aisha thanks Yu and says that she really likes the bracelet. In addition, the bracelet will not wither like the rose that you gave earlier. Aisha blushed with embarrassment. She says they should get back to Aggie as soon as possible. Opening the door, the young man and the girl notice the fog coming from the corridor. They leave the room and do not understand where they are. The whole corridor is covered with a strange fog. Aisha and you don't understand where they got to. Aisha says it's most likely a maze of thought created by her stepfather, Theodore Pierce. His natural magic is the change of worlds. Every midnight, at exactly 12 o'clock, he can transfer the entire castle to the world created by himself. Yu understands why he could not feel that the gates of the limit were opening when the worlds were changing. The castle is the outer shell, and the labyrinth of thought is its main filling. Immediately Yu remembers about Aki. Yu says that they urgently need to find Aki. Aisha should know about how this maze works. The girl thinks, and then hears a sharp loud sound. She turns around and sees something in the fog. Aisha pulls out her ice sword. An unknown figure came out of the fog and said it was already 12. It turned out to be Aisha's mother. She says it's time to go back to the room and fall asleep. Otherwise something terrible will happen. Aisha retreats for a moment. Yu is trying to talk to her. The succubus smiles, thinking that her daughter will not disobey. Then Aisha turns to her mother and apologizes, which shocks her mother. Aisha raised her sword hand and said that she had already decided everything. She wants to be together with you. She plans to leave with you this cage that calls home. Yu thinks that the real Aisha is very cute. She says that mom should understand her, her feelings. After all, her mother and father once did the same. A piece of ice flew into Aisha, but did not touch her. The mother doesn't want to listen to this anymore. The mother says she understands her daughter, that's why she doesn't want Aisha to repeat her mistakes. Charm is charm, for them, people are too weak. Yu does not understand why he is mistaken for a person and immediately tries to explain that this is not the case. Aisha asks why then her mother secretly constantly sighs about her deceased father. The mother is in a stupor because of her daughter's words. Then the stupor is replaced by anger. Aisha turns to Yu and says that this is their conversation with her mother, so she would like to sort everything out herself. Mother cooks ice blocks. She had already told her daughter that it was too late and Aisha should go to bed. Aisha puts up an ice shield that covers them along with Yu from the mother's attacks. Mom again does not understand that her daughter is resisting. Aisha was able to fight off the flying icicles. Even though her mom didn't use all her strength, but it's usually enough to drop her to the floor and immobilize her. Aisha's mom thinks that her daughter still deserves a Jasper bracelet from the ice collection, but she doesn't understand where it came from on her daughter's hand. Aisha turns to her mother. She says that if mom continues to interfere with them, then she will have to answer for it. Aisha will no longer restrain her strength. Aisha is preparing ice icicles for a new attack. Her mom chuckles and asks if her daughter has forgotten that she is a pure-blooded succubus. Aisha's mother uses her powers to the fullest. Black demonic wings appear on her back, and she soars up with them. Aisha's mom says that there was no opportunity to show them before, so her daughter can now look at the real power of succubi. Aisha gets angry, and Yu gets more serious at the moment. Fog is spreading all over the castle. Aggie walks in this fog and tries to find Aisha together with Yu. She noticed that for some reason, as soon as the clock stopped striking, the living room turned into a cursed place and Lilith disappeared. Suddenly, a dark portal appears above Aggie's head, from which bats began to fly out. She doesn't understand where these animals came from. Someone's voice grins at the fact that someone got into the maze and can't get out. The girl was alarmed. A man in a red raincoat with blonde hair appears in front of Aggie. He asks her not to be afraid and welcomes her into the maze. The man introduces himself as the master of the maze, Pierce Theodore. There's a strange fog everywhere in the castle. In this fog there is a struggle between Aisha and her mother. Yu says that apparently Lilith was mistaken. The young man is interrupted and told that it is too late. The woman says that before she gets to Yu, she will do something. Aisha is tense at the moment. Her mother continues, she says she will punish her daughter first. Aisha pulls out her ice sword again. She says she's not going to get down on her knees in front of her mother. Yu asks to be listened to, he wants to say something. But Aisha and her mother no longer listen to him and rush into battle. 
Lilith uses her powers to deflect the icicles that Aisha sends at her. Aisha decides to bypass Lilith. She jumps up and flies straight at her, but she can't do it. Lilith asks if her daughter thought she would let her counterattack. She grabs Aisha by the throat and soars up with her, to the screams of Yu. Yu is standing in the fog. Sylph asks him why the owner can't come to Aisha's aid. The guy replies that he doesn't know how to help Aisha. Lilith is her mother, and maybe his future mother-in-law. Suddenly he does not calculate the strength and accidentally touches her. He does not understand how it is possible to move in the fog at all. Lilith is flying with her daughter. Aisha thinks about the fact that her mother is flying up very strangely. On the contrary, it falls down. Lilith says that because of this principle, this place is called the Labyrinth of Thought. Aisha tries to concentrate. She pulls out her sword and is about to strike, but Lilith notices it and lets the girl go. While Alice disappeared into the fog, her daughter is preparing for a new attack and runs straight into the fog. Aisha stumbles upon a huge stone maze. There are vines with various dangerous plants on the walls of the maze. And also there are knight's armor. Lilith lands near the maze. She thinks that Aisha is in the maze for the first time, so most likely she will not run far. Lilith says that even if they run away from her, then where can they go together with you? It won't be so easy to get out. While the girl is hiding somewhere near the wall of the maze, her mother continues to say, if Aisha really decided to escape, then in the future only endless suffering and complete despair awaits her. The fog still doesn't disperse. Lilith notices that the fog is only getting denser. If her daughter does not obey her mother, then very soon there will be a gentleman from whom nothing good can be expected. Aisha was going to go to the side, but something grabbed her leg. The girl was scared at first, and then looked up and noticed that a lot of dangerous vines were flying into her. The vines grabbed Aisha and lifted her off the ground. Below, the fog lifted a little and Aisha noticed that a gentleman had come, who was grinning at the fact that another mouse had fallen into his trap. Aisha demands to be released. The Prince of Darkness asks her why he should let her go, because then she will run away. Aisha starts to get angry. She gathers all her strength in the hand on which the bracelet is worn. The Lord of Darkness is not happy with such behavior. The Lord of Darkness asks how Aisha dared to resist in the labyrinth of thoughts, of which he is the master. More vines are moving towards Aisha. They entangle her more strongly, which is why she starts screaming. The Lord of Darkness says that since Aisha is a future member of the family of that gentleman, he will stop there for now. If someone else had been in Aisha's place, he would have been in the collection of victims of the labyrinth of the Lord of Darkness long ago. Aisha says that even if everything goes as the Lord of Darkness wants it and the girl gets into the family of that gentleman, she will still find a way to return and take revenge. The Lord of Darkness grins. Because of what Aisha said, he remembered one thing that he had forgotten to tell her all this time. He says that that gentleman only liked Aisha's flesh. When a girl gets to him, he will erase and throw away her current soul and personality. Aisha started crying after hearing this. The vines began to envelop her more strongly. The Lord of Darkness said that now she could take a nap in his cramped cage while waiting. Suddenly, an icicle of ice flies straight towards the Lord of Darkness, but he manages to react and blocks the way with vines. Aisha falls right on the floor. He asks what his wife is doing. Lilith asks if he doesn't understand himself. He never once told her that Aisha's soul and personality would be erased and replaced. Lilith is preparing to attack. She makes a jump and flies straight at the Lord of Darkness. He directs his vines in her direction. Lilith cannot repel the attack and as a result, due to the blow, she flies into the wall and falls, coughing. The Lord of Darkness approaches her and asks what is the meaning of all this attack. He tells us that in this world, all beings except him have their limits. There is no man in this world capable of defeating him. In addition, it is worth sacrificing one girl, because you can win the favor of that gentleman. Lilith says that she gave Aisha to that gentleman to make her future life much better. There is no difference between erasing the soul and death. The Lord of Darkness grabs Lilith by the head and hits her on the floor, and then picks her up again and says that if the main condition of that gentleman was not chastity, then he would have given his wife, because he held on for so many years and did not touch her. Vines envelop Lily's entire body. The Lord of Darkness says that everything is going on as usual and he already knows what he will do with Lilies. Lilith apologizes to Aisha. She had to let her do what she wanted. She asks God to save them, if he still exists. The vines weaken for a moment. A new attack is flying straight towards the Lord of Darkness. Yu is going to attack him. The blow hits right on the spot where the Lord of Darkness stood. Lilith looks surprised. Yu comes out of the fog and says that he seems to be safe and alive. But the landing was not very safe. While the Lord of Darkness holds lilies in his vines, somewhere to the side, Yu coughs after not the most successful landing. 
The Lord of Darkness is surprised that Yu was able to land unharmed in the Labyrinth of Thought. He thinks Aisha wanted to land with him. In that case, everything is fine. He's going to crack down on him and solve the problem. Yu didn't think there would be a maze garden. He feels something flying at him, intending to attack, but he manages to dodge. Then the vines split, increasing in number, they moved again towards Yu. But the guy took out his sword with lightning speed and cut them all down with one swing. Sylph made a strange sound. Yu asks what happened to her. Sylph says that these shadows corrode her and she begins to rust. Yu didn't understand why it was rusting. The Lord of Darkness chuckles. He says that shadow magic is designed to absorb the most beautiful things. It seems to him that the spirit of the Yu sword is very good looking. Yu didn't understand. He says that the Lord of Shadows is very similar to Count Tepa's, whose portrait hangs on the wall in the Great Hall. Count Pierce Theodore doesn't understand what kind of Count Tepa's is. He chuckles and calls Yu a daredevil. Count Pierce Theodore gathers his shadows into one huge braid. He tells Yu to wait for the moment when he will deal with him. He tells Yu to remember his name before he dies. He also says that the sword of Yu, along with the spirit, will pass to him and then the real fun will begin. The man shouts his name and swings his scythe to strike Yu. The scythe hits the place where Yu was standing. Count Pierce Theodore chuckles, but abruptly breaks off as he notices something. Yu stands and holds the scythe blade with one hand. Yu says he doesn't care what the man's name is. He squeezes the blade of the scythe and a strong explosion occurs. Yu says that trying to take the sword spirit of a stranger in front of that person is just a terrible act. The men lower their hands to see what's going on. A second later, all the fog clears and Yu appears in front of Count Pierce Theodore, who says that he will not allow his sword to be taken away. Count Pierce Theodore does not believe in what is happening. In the labyrinth of thought, the impact force of all other living beings, except himself, decreases many times. This is the law. Yu says that, apparently, Count Pierce Theodore is the messenger between the worlds. And this maze is entirely created by a man. Yu asks the question, where is Aisha and Aggie? Count Pierce Theodore grins and finds out that the girl he caught is called Aggie. The fog envelops the whole space again. Count Pierce Theodore tells Yu not to worry, as he will allow them to see each other soon. Yu doesn't understand what Count Pierce Theodore is up to. At one point, a knight in armor swings at him from the side. Yu manages to react and evades the blow. The knight's axe hits right on the ground. Yu notices that the knight is holding Aggie's axe. Knight and Yu move away from each other at a decent distance. The guy looks at the knight and tries to figure out if Aggie is standing right in front of him. Many other knights in armor appear behind the knight's back. Yu feels that the smell of dead souls is coming from these knights. The knight gives the command and everyone else starts moving towards Yu. They try to damage him, but nothing happens as the young man constantly dodges and evades. And then he counterattacks, taking a huge hammer from one of the knights. He hits another knight with his hand, so much so that he flies away. Another knight appears behind Yu again. Yu grabs the axe and tries to remove the helmet from the knight. It seems to him that Aggie can be inside the armor and she can be controlled. Yu observes that Aggie really turned out to be inside the armor. She really was under someone else's control. Count Pierce Theodore appears. He laughs, holding Aisha and Lilies in his vines. He sees that Aggie is not at all indifferent to Yu. He says that if Yu does not interfere with the engagement of that gentleman and Aisha, then he will return Aggie's soul from the world of the dead. He then confronts Yu with a choice between Aggie and Aisha, whom Yu decides to return, and whom he will leave to the Count. Lilith tells you not to listen to the Count, as he will definitely not fulfill his promise. If you give Aisha's soul to that gentleman, she will still lose her soul and identity. Then Count Pierce Theodore tightens the bonds on Lilith more, which causes her to start screaming in pain. Count Pierce Theodore speaks unflatteringly about Lilies. The woman loses consciousness. Count Pierce Theodore says he's going to have to make a deal anyway, and he says not to blame you for not warning him. Count Pierce Theodore pays attention to Yu and notices that he is enveloped in overwhelming energy. Yu says that he chooses and with the help of the fourth seal, he removes the effects of someone else's magic. Count Pierce Theodore is shocked that someone from the human race is able to become so powerful. Count Pierce Theodore tries to escape, as he realizes that Yu is not a person. He drops Aisha and Lilies. Yu catches them both. Lilith apologizes and admits her mistake. She asks to take Aisha and leave. Yu asks her to relax, as he plans to pull out not only Aisha, but everyone at once. And they will all be alive and well. He then says that as for Count Tepas, he will make him regret coming to this world. Count Pierce Theodore is trying to escape using a portal. He thinks that as soon as he gets out, he will ban the maze forever. He thinks that no matter how strong Yu has, he still won't be able to get out. A huge energy beam hits the Count. He's coughing up blood. He doesn't understand what's going on. 
In his labyrinth of thought, he is the strongest person. Yu appears in front of the Count, who is not going to let him go. Count Pierce Theodore understands that Yu's strength exceeds the limit. Yu looks at the Count menacingly. Count Pierce Theodore feels the danger. He is not going to put up with his fate. He shares his shadows. Count Pierce Theodore thinks that if he has his three shadows with him, he will be able to move freely into any of them. He can't believe that you will be able to cope with everyone. Count Pierce Theodore sees you catching up with him and gets scared. Then he notices that you is already next to him. The guy asks him where the man is going. Count Pierce Theodore says that you can't handle him. He says he has connections in the world of the dead. He tries to save himself by referring to threats, but nothing happens. Mentions Aggie. You says that. Firstly, Aggie is not his girlfriend, so there is no need to talk about her in this way. Secondly, it so happened that you also has acquaintances in the world of the dead. Count Pierce Theodore feels an energy that is very similar to the energy radiated by the boots of that gentleman when he first appeared to trample the empire. This energy is the source of all life on earth. The energy of the source. You says Harvey, and then throws the count away and shouts come out. There is an explosion in the castle. Count Pierce Theodore was lying practically unconscious on the ground. The Count recognizes Harvey. Terrible loud noises were heard near the Count. Skeletal hands began to appear from the ground, tearing the earth in half. A huge hand rose from the ground, in which there was some kind of demon. Count Pierce Theodore sees how the King of Darkness Harvey really came out. You appears next to him. He's floating in the air. Harvey sees you. They say Harvey has a very bad character, and most of all he does not like rude people. Count Pierce Theodore thinks that what you has just done will make Harvey very angry. His source energy is great, but he's finished anyway. Harvey approaches you and apologizes for not recognizing him because of the outfit. You asks that Harvey has left him behind, and Harvey says they haven't seen each other for several thousand years, which is why he's so glad to see him. Count Pierce Theodore did not expect this. You asks Harvey not to make any noise. He asks for his help. Harvey grins when he hears that he needs help. You and Harvey approach Aggie. You asks Harvey to bring Aggie's soul back. Harvey looks at the girl and says he can help, but he wonders why Yu wants to help her. Yu says Aggie is just his friend. The girl stands looking at the floor with empty eyes. Harvey doesn't understand such feelings, but then he smiles and says that he will help him without any problems, but he wants something special as a reward. Yu raises his hand, showing that his strength. The guy asks if Harvey didn't mix anything up. Looking at all this, Harvey says he will be happy to help him. Harvey calls out to his powers and a book appears in front of him with a face in the center, which says that Mr. Harvey is great. Harvey tells him to shut up. Harvey orders his book to scan Aggie's body and find a matching soul. The book very quickly begins to scroll through its pages, looking for the necessary information. As a result, Harvey sees the name and surname he needs, Aggie Isis. Harvey seems to have found her soul. Harvey has a pen in his hand, and he writes out the name from the book with it. As a result, Aggie's soul returns. Aggie glows a little. She turns to you, who called out to her. At first Aggie couldn't understand what was going on, and then tears came to her eyes. You began to say that he was very happy about the girl's return, but he was interrupted by a kiss. Aggie remembers her last seconds before she died. She remembers thinking only about you. It was at that moment that she realized who she wanted to live her whole life with. You likes Aggie. Aggie thought she would never be able to see you again. She thinks that she has gone to another world, so she decides to take advantage of the moment and confess her feelings. Aggie doesn't care if you loves her or not. The main thing is that after the confession she will have no regrets. Aggie thinks that the guy also felt what her heart wants. Yu says that because of her feelings, Aggie expressed her joy at meeting two old friends so beautifully and naturally. Aggie grabs Yu by the collar and says he ruined a romantic moment. Harvey tells the girl to finish and return to her body as it is not worth staying. Aggie asks Harvey who he is. Then Aggie's soul notices her body, which stands like a pillar. She asks if her body is standing aside. Yu asks her to calm down and listen to him. Yu says he was too rash and put her in danger, but everything is fine now. Yu has found the King of Darkness Harvey, who will help her resurrect. Aggie asks again about the King of Darkness and resurrection. Aggie gets suspicious, and she asks who he really is, since he knows the King of Darkness. Yu apologizes and says that he did not hide from everyone on purpose. Aggie looks at him and listens very carefully. Yu admits that he is the one whom people are very much afraid of, the first apostle, Yulman. The young man falls silent and waits for Aggie's reactions. The girl suddenly starts laughing, not believing that Yu is an apostle. Aggie says that if she hadn't been in the world of darkness, 
she definitely wouldn't have believed what you told her. Aggie didn't think that such a strange guy would be the first apostle. She approaches Yu's face and speaks and thanks him. Yu is amazed. Harvey says that it is necessary to revive her as soon as possible, and then chat. Otherwise, the body will soon stiffen. Aggie's soul flies up to her body. She turns to Yu and says that they will talk about the rest after the resurrection. Aggie says she doesn't care who Yu is. The main thing is that he is a person she likes. Aggie's soul returns back to her body. Yu touches her shoulder and the girl's body leans on the guy. Harvey says the resurrection was a success. Harvey says that since the memory of the soul and the memory of the brain cannot function at the same time, after her awakening, she will forget everything that happened to them while she was a soul. Yu goes into shock. The guy asks Harvey why he didn't tell about it earlier. Harvey offers to kiss him as compensation. Yu hastily says that he forgives him. Harvey says that the matter is settled, so he will go, he still needs to make an evening face mask. Yu calls out to Harvey. Yu says he has an interesting case. If Harvey wants to listen, the guy will tell you everything. Harvey grunts questioningly. Yu looks behind him and, pointing at Pierce, says that, to tell the truth, it's not such an interesting case. He just happened to meet a vampire capable of using dark magic to summon souls. And it also smells like a dungeon, the herb of immortality. Harvey, hearing about the dungeon man, is furious at the moment. An overwhelming aura appeared around him. Count Pierce Theodore noticed this, but before he could do anything, his soul was already being separated from his body. Harvey grabs Pierce's soul. He asks who pays him with souls for the dungeon. Count Pierce Theodore says he doesn't know why, but the spirits really like the underground from the human world. He exchanged herbs for souls for them, and never asked for names. Harvey glares at Pierce, but Count Pierce Theodore only says in horror that he really doesn't know anything. Harvey realizes that he really doesn't know anything. He says that Count Pierce Theodore will go with him to the world of the dead for identification. Count Pierce Theodore begs for mercy from Mr. Harvey. But the gentleman does not listen to him and is about to leave. Harvey turns to Yu and thanks him. Yu also thanks in return, saying that it was Harvey who actually helped him. The portal closes and Harvey and Pierce disappear. Harvey is a deity born in the world of the dead. But every time he hears about the dungeon, he reacts quite sharply. At best, he's out of his mind. At worst, he's lost his magic. If there are people in the world of the dead who collect this herb, then someone wants to put a seal on Harvey, so he's angry. It's already dawn outside. Yu stands and watches, thinking that Harvey will settle things in the world of the dead himself, so it's better for him not to go there. Yu turns around and sees Lilith holding Aisha in her arms. He notices that Lilith has regained consciousness. The guy tells the woman that she is still a pure-blooded succubus, such injuries will not harm her. Lilith looks at him suspiciously, and then she tells him that she brought him a lot of problems, and he was still ready to help. She says that the nobility of Yu will always remain with her. Yu approaches the woman and tells her to move slower, as she has not recovered from her wounds yet. The woman thinks that the fierce first apostle from myths and legends suddenly turned out to be so sensitive and meek. Warm hugs remind a woman of Yulira. She hopes that Aisha has found her happiness. Lilith drops a couple of tears. She asks if she can entrust Aisha to him with a calm heart. Yu smiles. He says that even if a woman doesn't do it, he will still take care of her. Lilith agrees and starts crying again. Lilith's daughter will no longer have to depend on others. She will not have to endure ridicule because she is a mudblood. She will not have to be afraid and suffer. Lilith is sure that now her daughter will find the most important thing. She will stay with her loved one forever. Lilith and you are standing near large golden pillars. The woman says that the intermediary between the worlds, Pierce, is already dead. So if you need to establish a connection with the magical world, you will have to wait for someone from the other side to open the portal. Yu approaches the golden pillars. Previously, they had hoped for a messenger, but now no one will say for sure when the gate will be opened. Yu says you can't just sit and wait. There are still a lot of things in this world that he has to deal with. Lilith says it would be better if she brought this case to an end. She tells Yu to take Aisha and the others to go on the way back. Yu asks if she is sure that she wants to stay in this castle. The woman says she can't leave because Pierce died and now she needs to explain everything to people. If she doesn't say anything, then her tribesmen will be very bad. Yu looks at her with understanding, and then says that since that's the case, she will have to pass something to the emperor. Lilith asks if it's a magic stone. Yu asks to tell everyone that the first apostle Yulman solved the issue with the peer. Everyone will understand what we are talking about. Lilith thanks Yu for the last time. The carriage rides on a sunny road. Various memories arise in Aisha's head, how Pierce grabbed her mom. Then various images began to appear of you asking Aisha to run away or how Pierce grabbed you because she resisted him. 
After imagining the worst-case scenario, Aisha regains consciousness. Yu notices that Aisha has regained consciousness. The girl was embarrassed. She asks how the young man is feeling. Yu does not understand such attention to his person. Aisha jumps and hugs Yu. She cries with happiness. She can't believe that she and Yu are alive. Yu asks Aisha to calm down first, and then he changes his mind and says to sit a little longer in this position. In the castle, located in the magical world, Lily stands in the middle of the hall. The demon sitting on the huge throne doubtfully repeats what the woman said, namely, that the first apostle Yulman won from the pier. On the throne sits a formidable man who is the emperor of the world of darkness, Akla. He is sitting right in front of a woman and does not believe in what is happening. Lilith confirms everything she said. Pierce was defeated by the first apostle, Yulman. Akla grabs the edge of the throne and shouts that she does not believe in such news. No one has ever seen the first apostle alive, so it's not a fact that he exists at all, it's just a legend. Akla asks why the first apostle, Yulman, would appear and personally solve problems with the peer. The man in the hood says that this is all unfounded and without foundation. Pierce was strong only in the world of his thoughts, outside of him, he is very weak. The man assumes that Lilith has learned the truth about the price Aisha will have to pay to get closer to that gentleman. She exposed Pierce and dealt with him herself. The man in the hood turns to Mr. Akla and says that he assumes that if she is not tortured, she will not be so obedient, and will not tell them the truth. The executioners began to laugh. Then Akla makes a decision and tells the executioners to wait. Lilith says that she has evidence that will prove that she is telling the truth. She turns to Akla and asks him to look at them first, and only then make a decision. The hooded man asks what the evidence is. Lilith says that the first apostle asked her to give one thing to Mr. Akla. Akla orders the man to accept the very thing. The man says they don't even know what kind of thing it is, what kind of stone it is, so he's worried. Akla says that one magic stone cannot contain a huge amount of magical power. He is confident that the power of the stone will not be able to hurt him. The man in the hood says that everything is so he was worried in vain. Because the blood of the dragon flows in the veins of the great Akla. He is the most powerful emperor of the world of magic in its entire history. A man in a hood brings a magic stone to Akla. The emperor of the world of darkness carefully examines the stone. The stone suddenly flared up. The man was confused at first, but then realized what kind of stone it was. The magic stone exudes a huge amount of power. The hooded man is dumbfounded. The executioners can't watch because of the power of this stone. A fog rose in the hall. A man in a hood asks Akla if he is alright. Akla is in a state of shock. He understands that the power of the magic stone is many times more powerful than that gentleman. In his condition, he has no chance to resist. Akla says that Lilith apparently did not lie. The first apostle really defeated Pierce. He won't ask Lilith anything since it's not her fault. Pierce reflects that they have allowed Lilith to come back freely, so they are protecting her on purpose. Akla says that since Pierce is no more, from this day on, Lilith will look after his estate herself. She thanks the master. Akla thinks that before his flawless plan finally comes to fruition, he first needs to calm Lilith down. The carriage is traveling along a forest path. Yu tells Aisha not to worry. Everything she remembers really happened. Aggie is lying unconscious on the seats in the carriage. Suddenly she wakes up and hears that Yu is glad that they are all alive. When Aggie fully opens her eyes, she sees how Yu is very close to Aisha. Aggie immediately flies up to Yu and asks him what he was going to do with Aisha. Yu notices that Aggie has regained consciousness. Aggie says that if she hadn't woken up, something strange would have happened. Then she turns to Aisha and tells her to behave more carefully with Yu. Aisha was embarrassed. Aggie just falls into a stupor. The carriage has a very strange situation. Aggie notices that the atmosphere between Yu and Aisha is kind of strange. Aggie also feels bad when she sees them together. She thinks she likes Yu. Then he shakes himself up and realizes that this is nonsense. Aisha turns to Aggie and thanks her for her help. Aggie came to a new conclusion, that Aisha is cute and she likes her. Aisha didn't understand. Yu is happy that Aggie has also discovered Aisha's charm. Aisha jumps up and remembers one important detail. She asks you how they finally managed to get out. She also wonders where her mom is. Aggie says she saw that vampire from the portrait in the castle, and then immediately lost consciousness. She's wondering what happened. Yu says that the vampire she saw attacked them, but he's already dealt with it and saved her mom, so she's fine. Aisha doesn't believe that Pierce is gone. She thinks her mom beat him. She remembers that Pierce hid the fact that he would have to erase her soul for the sake of that gentleman. She assumes that mom found out about everything and decided to punish him. The girl continues her reflections. She assumes that her mother was afraid to involve her daughter in this case and left her, running away. 
After all, they defeated a close servant of that gentleman. He will definitely not forgive them. Yu says that her assumption is full of factual errors, but there are coincidences on the main points, so he won't argue. He looks at Aisha and says that she is very cute when she thinks about it. Aisha looks at him and is silent. Aisha turns to Yu and says that since things have taken such a turn, she needs to say something. The girl says that, having coped with the peer, they became blood enemies of one very scary person. This man is very dangerous, and he is one of those great apostles standing at the top of this world. Yu asks which of the apostles he is and why he is so strong. Aisha says she's not joking right now. The girl says that they will have to confront the twelfth apostle, the ruler of the polar knight, Kapasis. Aisha continues and tells that the apostle is above the being who stands on the same level with the gods. They will definitely fail, they are doomed. Yu says he's been hiding something from her for a very long time. He tells that he is the first apostle, Yulman. The girl fell into a stupor after what she heard. Yu is waiting for her reactions. Aisha asks him to be serious at least at this moment. Now his jokes are inappropriate. Yu says that he is not joking and that he really is an apostle. Suddenly Aggie breaks into the conversation, which is why Yu and Aisha have to switch their attention to her. Aggie asks if Yu and Aisha feel that it has become very cold in the carriage. Both cry out at once and approach the girl to check her condition. Aggie sits with her legs drawn up to her body, shivering from the cold. Aisha asks what happened to Aggie. Ed Pierce managed to cast some kind of spell on her. Yu says it's neither magic nor a spell. He calls it pure dark energy. Aisha asks what kind of dark energy. Aggie is very unwell. Perhaps it has something to do with the fact that recently her soul returned back to her body. Aggie's soul was baptized in the dark energy of the afterlife. Some of this energy penetrated into her body and remained inside. Yu understands that if the dark energy is not urgently removed from Aggie, then she will turn into a walking dead or something similar. Aggie sits and shakes, either from the cold or from fear. The girl is not getting better. On the contrary, a strange haze envelops her body. Yu thinks that his source energies will be enough to dissipate this dark energy. But for Aggie, the energy of the source is an even greater threat than the dark one. Yu is desperate. He can't think of what to do in the end. Aisha also watches Aggie and thinks about what can be done to help her. Thanks to Aisha's touch, some of the energy falls off Aggie. Yu notices that she has managed to contain the dark energy. Yu grabs Aisha's hand and notices a strange smell. He asks Aisha if she has touched the dungeon. Aisha says that since childhood, her mother made her baths with a dungeon. Lilith had told her that these dungeon baths would warm her body and increase her feminine attractiveness. Yu remembers that Harvey was born in the dark energy of the afterlife. He is afraid of the dungeon, so dark energy is afraid of this grass. Yu asks Aisha to hug Aggie as tightly and strongly as possible. Aisha asks the guy again. She gets as close to Aggie as possible and hugs her. Yu notices that it really works, but it's still not enough. Yu turns to the coachman and asks where the nearest big city is. The man says that the nearest city is Astana. If they accelerate, they will arrive before sunset. Yu says that now their target is a stand. The driver says that selections for the pentagram are being held in this city, so most likely all hotels with adequate prices will be filled with people. Yu asks the coachman to drop them off at the most luxurious and refined hotel. He tells the coachman that he will have time to deliver them before sunset, then his fee will double. The coachman does not believe in such generosity. He immediately asks the carriage passengers to fasten their seat belts and accelerates. The sun was already setting in the city of Astan. Yu, Aggie and Aisha arrive at the most luxurious hotel in Astana. There are many people in the hotel dressed in luxurious clothes. The interior also looks very expensive. Yu asks the girls to wait for him in the hall. He wants to go get a room and come back. Aisha agrees and says that she will stay with Aisha and follow her. Yu approaches the receptionist and says that he needs two rooms with bathrooms. The girl behind the counter says that she is very sorry, but this week too many magicians have arrived for the selections at the Magic Academy. Therefore, the situation with the numbers is very complicated. Only the Imperial Suite remained. Yu is surprised that there is only one number left. He thinks that now there is a chance to be in the same room with Aisha. He pretends to get upset and says there's nothing to be done about it, he'll have to make room for a bit, so he's going to take the last number. However, Yu is interrupted. Someone decides to take the Imperial Suite faster. A blonde-haired young man with a girl came up. He asks the girl to process the documents as soon as possible and settle them. The girl behind the counter looks at the couple in love and says that Yu was the first, so she will issue documents for his settlement. The young man doesn't care. He says he has a lot more money that can solve the problem. He doesn't understand why Yu stood there for so long and couldn't make up his mind. 
the young man asks about 500 gold pieces. He is a VIP client of this hotel, is friends with the director of the hotel, so the girl behind the counter is obliged to check him in. The girl behind the counter is talking about an amount equal to 2,000. The young man is shocked, since usually the amount is equal to 500 gold. The girl says that the amount had to be increased due to the high flow of customers, due to the occupancy of all rooms. The young man thinks that he is an aristocrat, he cannot disgrace himself in front of some boy, without even imagining who this boy really is. The young man agrees with the offer of 2000 for the room. Yu thinks about where the two annoying characters came from. He can't give him the room, because if they have to go to the hotel again, they will lose a huge amount of time. Aggie can't wait that long. Yu starts to speak, but is interrupted again. The girl with a familiar voice comes around the corner. The girl asks who is preventing you from settling. Yu turns around and notices Linda. The girl immediately takes his hand and rejoices that they have met again. The blonde young man turns to Linda. The girl looks at him threateningly and says that since he knows her, he knows what she can do to him if she does not make concessions. The blonde young man grabs his girlfriend and rushes away, saying that he understood everything and gives the number to Yu. Yu asks Linda how she ended up at the hotel. Linda says this hotel belongs to her family. Linda turns to the woman behind the counter and says that the last imperial suite should belong to you. She must provide the number for free. He can live there as long as he wants. The woman obeys and draws up the documents. Yu says she doesn't have to help him. He is very touched. Her family still has a business. You can't constantly make losses. Linda says his behavior is too polite. Yu thinks about the moment when they move to the level when their own and someone else's are not divided. Yu says he would rather ask her for help in another matter. He asks where he can find as much dungeon for sale as possible. Linda says that the dungeon is a very rare medicinal herb, although there are in ordinary pharmacies, but definitely not of the first grade. She says they can rely on her. Yu is very happy to help. He says that, if possible, restorative potions are also needed. He will give the money later. Aisha holds Aggie in her hands. Aggie never regains consciousness. Aisha wonders why Yu hasn't returned yet. Aggie makes a strange sound. Her neck is covered with a black shell. Aisha runs to Yu. Linda notices Aisha and asks if she is the lady of Yu's heart. Aisha asks who Linda is. Yu says that Linda is engaged in business. It was only with her help that he was able to get a Jasper Ice bracelet. Now he asks her to buy some dungeon. Aisha introduces herself and says she's glad to meet you. Linda asks where Aisha was in such a hurry. Something has happened. Linda notices that Aisha is very nice, but she will not give in to her. Aisha tells you to run quickly to Aggie and take a look at her. She can't handle the dark energy. You asks if Aisha's hugs help. The girl says they don't help. She saw the energy he was talking about begin to creep up to her neck. Yu turns to Linda. He asks the girl to go and find the dungeon as soon as possible, buy everything she can and immediately run to the room. He asks her to hurry. Linda is listening. Yu turns to the woman behind the counter and asks to take them to the room as soon as possible. Everyone moves to the room and puts Aggie in the bathroom as soon as possible. After placing Aggie in the bathroom, Aisha asks if the girl will really feel better. It seems to you that you can't get rid of dark energy at once. For the next few days Aggie needs to soak in the bathroom. Every day they will change the dungeon. Aisha turns back to you. She says that Linda is still in the lobby, so she will look after Aggie, and the guy can go to Linda. Linda is sitting in a luxurious armchair and drinking tea. The girl notices you and asks how Aggie is doing. The guy says Aggie is much better, all thanks to Linda. Linda says that since she helped you, he will do her a favor in return. At the Yulman Musical Theater, Yu says that he managed to invite Yagao Fu Shuai to visit. The guy greets everyone. As far as Yu understood, Yagao Fu Shuai is a tall, rich and handsome guy. He asks to share his secret. Yagao Fu Shuai says that this is not the case at all. Yu wonders how this is possible, because there are so many attractive girls around him. Yagao Fu Shuai points to Yu and says that he is not the only one. Yu says that they switch to another topic. You need to change the vector of the conversation. Yagao Fu Shuai agrees. Yu agrees, as Linda has rendered him a valuable service and asks her what he can help with. Linda is surprised that he didn't even figure out what to do at first, but he immediately agreed. Yu says that he could not refuse since the ice bracelet and the dungeon are entirely her merit, so he will help with everything that will be needed. Linda remembers the last time she lured him to an auction to steal a ring from her hand, and now he is so grateful to her. Yu tells her to tell him her problem and not be shy. He says that her problems are his problems, which he will definitely help her cope with. Linda wants to talk about the problem, but someone interrupts her. A man comes into the room and says that Mr. Shej has received an invitation and who has already gone to the banquet. 
He told you to get out of Jayashin as soon as possible. Linda didn't think he would leave so quickly. You doesn't understand what it's about. The girl says they have problems. She grabs you and pulls him along while he tries to figure out what happened. You and Linda get into the carriage. Linda asks the servant to bring them to the banquet as soon as possible, to which her father has left. The servant says that Mr. She ordered something completely different. Linda tells him to shut up, as this is her decision, and she is responsible for it. They get into the carriage and drive at speed to the banquet. You asks what happened after all. Linda asks you to save her father. You still does not understand what her father has to do with it and why he is in danger. Linda says that the old man she was talking about is her father. You is surprised to learn about the relationship between Linda and the old man she who organized the auction. Linda says that his status as the head of the mafia will soon pass into the wrong hands, and most importantly, that without their help he is unlikely to be able to survive this night. You asks why. Linda says that if he doesn't mind, she will tell him the whole chain of events, and then asks all the questions he is interested in. The girl says that the area south of the imperial capital to the north of Gorst is traditionally called the Jayashin Belt. The girl's father is the main one among the mafiosi of this belt. However, he enlisted the support of only one of their three large clans, the Chapel. He helped them build underground trade routes, and that's how he gained control of this region. The laws of the Mafia are such that there cannot be two dominant leaders on the same mountain, and when the time comes, the old one must resign. Yu asks if old man she is not the head of the local Mafia. After all, he should have a lot of people under his command, so why should he be afraid of a novice then? My father's accomplices are also not stupid, as they saw that my father had no support left. They got closer to the gang that arrived. The leader of the new gang has long been hatching plans to overthrow old Shi, and the banquet is just a feast before the subsequent execution. Linda's father hoped that she would be able to escape, but she can't just afford to wait and watch in silence as her father is removed from his place. Linda understands that it was not necessary to involve you in this dirty and dangerous business, but only he can help her. Yu puts his hand on her shoulder to calm her down. He understood the situation and asks the girl to relax. The carriage pulls up to the estate in the suburbs. The coachman notifies the passengers that they are in place. Linda notices that people are approaching them. At one point, she tenses up, realizing how their trip may end. The girl walks through the crowd of people, and then goes to the doors and opens them to see the long table at which her father was sitting. Old man she immediately pays attention to his daughter. He asks why she came, because he sent a man to warn her that she needed to run. Yu thinks about how old she, so healthy and uncouth, suddenly had such a beautiful daughter. Yu notices that there is a lot of delicious and appetizing food on the table. The guy thinks that he hasn't eaten anything special for a long time, constantly being on the road. Linda says that she, as the daughter of old man she, cannot leave her father at the most important moment of his life and run away. Someone said loudly that her phrase was perfectly said. This was said by a huge man sitting in the center of the table. He says that the girl has a lot of energy. It's not for nothing that she is the daughter of old Chi. The man says that he invited the whole family to this wonderful feast. So the girl came up very timely and he did not have to send his people after her. He continues to talk about the appearance of the girl, but is interrupted by you. The guy asks Linda what kind of drink he is holding in his hand right now. Isn't it juice and why is it so delicious? Linda replies that this is a fruit wine from the western mainland. They get drunk quickly from it, so the young man should not lean on it. Hugh asks again about the wine and then says that it is excellent. People in the hall began to discuss you. They laugh at him, took one sip and was already drunk. And they are perplexed that he dares to interrupt who. Hugh stands in a stupor and then a fist hits him in the face so much so that he flies away a long distance. Linda didn't expect you to get hit, so she gets scared and opens up, hoping that the guy is alive. At the Yulman Musical Theater, Yu asks why Gao Fu Shuai is still with him. Gao Fu Shuai said hello. Gao Fu Shuai asked to return to the topic of discussing their relationship with the girls. Yu thinks about why the guy suddenly became active. Gao Fu Shuai thinks that a handsome and strong man like Yulman should have a lot of experience. Yu says that's not the case. Gao Fu Shuai asks about kissing. Yu is confused and replies that there were only two of them. Gao Fu Shuai chuckles and says that Yu blushed a lot while answering this question. Yu does not understand what kind of strange feeling has visited him. Yu lands on the floor with his back after being hit. The man who struck him gets into a fighting stance and says that he hates those who interrupt him the most. Linda is preparing to attack, but whose people want to attack her from the outside? Old man she covers his daughter from the blow. During the battle, the furniture shatters into splinters. A gray-haired man is sitting at a table, clearly uninterested in the duel. 
he tells Olshi that the man clearly did not expect to eat this evening. Several other personalities are watching the fight. The girl tells the old man she to give way to the young. He himself should understand everything and not interfere. One of the bandits says that in their world, the weak always obey the strong, and old man she has lost his support, so he should not blame them. Another man decides to suddenly attack from above. He shrugs it off and says he doesn't understand why others are stalling. The man strikes, but misses. Old man she turns around and says that he treated all of them well. Old man she says that if they want to take his life, then he will not interfere with them, but only on condition that they do not touch his daughter. People from his bows apologize and say that according to the order from above, they all need to be dealt with. Old man she gloomily repeats the essence of the order from above, and then tells Linda to stand aside. Linda calls out to her father, but he doesn't turn around. Old man she takes something out of his jacket, namely, small throwing knives. One by one he throws at the traitors. While the traitors are dodging throwing knives, old man she runs up to them and strikes. The first traitor gets a blow from below, the second one right in the face, and the third one he grabs and breaks the blade of the sword while he tries to attack stealthily, then kicks the last one. While the bandit with the broken sword flies back, the rest of the surviving bandits pounce on the old man she. The old man jumps up and pushes off from the bandit who remained below. A man strikes a bandit with iron claws and then puts a blow to the ground a man, thanks to which he pushed off in the air. Old man she stands on the defeated opponent while all the other bandits come to their senses. The old man is surrounded by an overwhelming aura. The servant and Linda are very happy about old man she's victory, who says that his bandits are not capable of anything, who then stretches his arms before the fight. He is preparing to deal with old she himself, saying that he has a couple of good tricks in store, who looks mockingly at old man she, who is preparing for battle. The old man throws his throwing knives at him, who catches one knife with his hand, and the second one hits him, but bounces off without even injuring him. The strength of who surprised old man she very much, who looks at the place where one of the knives hit, he gives out scathing comments, then who abruptly rushes forward directly at she, saying that perhaps he will leave him alive. Old man she is preparing for a blow and gets right in the sternum. After being hit by who, she flies off into the distance, which terrifies Linda. Suddenly, you appears behind she. He catches old man she in his arms, who is surprised by what he saw. You asks old man she in an intoxicated voice if he is okay. The old man is as shocked as the others. In the hall, they began to discuss the fact that you called the old man she daddy, but no one had heard that he had a son. Someone in the crowd says that you is a son-in-law. A stranger would not go with them to a death feast. The servant notices that Linda was embarrassed at the word son-in-law. Who is thinking about what is wrong with you? He has already hit him. How he was able to survive. He needs to know more about it. Who turns to the bandits and says he's giving them another chance to get rid of them. One of the bandits, who had iron claws on his arm, thanks the gentleman. The bandit calls his name, Wolf. Then he rushes forward and says that he will be happy to complete this task. Yu turns around and says that his thirst for destruction is too strong. Then he strikes Wolf and says that Aisha would not like that. Wolf repeats Aisha's name, not understanding who she is and falls to the floor when Yu turns around. Who is shocked, as are the rest of the bandits, along with old man she and Linda. All the bandits saw how you coped with the indestructible wolf with one blow. Everyone is wondering, who is you? You says that such a strong thirst to kill, and even that bandit stank of blood. This is very unpleasant. Aisha and Sierra will definitely not like this. Yu turns to the rest of the bandits and says that they don't smell particularly nice either. Aisha won't like them either. All the bandits decide to deal with you by attacking him at the same time. Everyone runs at him at once. Yu pulls out his sword and strikes all the bandits with one swing. Who? Old man she and Linda were watching all this. Then the guy turns around and says that it's much cleaner this way. Yu deals with all the bandits who wanted to attack him all at once with one swing of the sword. Old man she calls you the king of the blade. He sees and considers legendary his indomitable sword and strong techniques. Yu comes closer and stands in front of Hu, who is already preparing for battle. Who asks you if he understands what kind of enemy he has made. Yu says that Hu looks familiar, but then he notes his bad temper and decides that Aisha would not like him. Suddenly Yu disappears, putting Hu into a stupor. Yu appears behind the man, swings his sword and makes a blow that creates a huge explosion of energy. The sword was caught and clamped between Hu's two hands. Yu is surprised that he didn't cut Hu down. Hu begins to speak, pulling the sword aside. He asks Yu to stop being conceited. Who hits Yu's forehead with his forehead, but the guy does not react in any way. Then the man grabs Yu by the head and hits him on the floor. Who says that although he does not fully understand what kind of strength Yu has, but since he decided to compete with him, 
he will regret it for the rest of his life. Yu asks him to take into account the fact that he has not only Mr. Capella behind him. Yu, who is buried in the ground, asks who who he is, what he says behind his back. Who thinks that a normal person's skull would have crumbled long ago? And Yu behaves as if nothing had happened. Apparently, you need to be tougher with him. Who says that you will get an opportunity to find out who he is right now? A man is enveloped by a strong energy that spreads to the entire hall. Old man she uses magic to summon a shield and covers himself and Linda with it to protect them from the consequences of the you and who fight. Old man she looks and can't believe what is happening. Who laughs? His body has transformed and he is screaming with joy. Who asks you if he knows how lucky he is? Before his end, you will be able to see the true appearance of who. You tries to get up from his knees. He thinks about why he feels so bad. He wants to open the seal. While who is preparing to attack you, the guy opens the first seal. Who notices that after opening the seal, you also gain strength. You stands up, swings his fist and slams into Hu's fist. The man's hands begin to hurt. He doesn't understand how this is possible. Who throws back after being hit, despite the fact that he has become a beast. He realizes that Yu is an even bigger monster than he is. Yu is enveloped by his powerful energy. Who sees this and takes Yu for a monster, so he decides to escape as quickly as possible. Who realizes that before becoming stronger, Yu was already faster and stronger than him, so the man cannot escape. When the smoke clears after the impact, who sees old man Xi and Linda? He rushes in their direction, pushes Xi away and moves towards Linda. Who says he doesn't care who Yu is? He grabs Linda and sets a condition that if Yu won't let him leave, then he will definitely deal with his wife. Linda says that Hu was mistaken and that she is not his wife, not even a girlfriend, at most a friend, an ordinary friend. Who is surprised? He says that she is trying to deceive him, but she will not succeed. If Yu tries to save her, they will both regret it. Who looks with horror at Yu, who asks how a man dares to set conditions for him. The man is even more horrified. Who says that Yu is really smart? Who sets conditions for him? He thinks there is no way back. Yu calls the sylph. He swings his sword, sending a wave of energy towards the man. Who screams? Linda thinks that there is only a place for Aisha in Yu's heart, and she is just a fleeting, ignorant acquaintance for him. If anyone should be blamed, it's herself that she didn't get to know him earlier. The energy wave that appeared after the swing of the sword is carried almost throughout the hall. She demolished everything in front of her. The wall of the house was breached. People on the street see smoke, devastation and do not understand what happened inside. The bandits are confused, as is old man Shi. He notices that Linda survived Yu's attack. The girl looks around, then finds Yu and asks if she is still alive. She demands an explanation. Old man Shi is glad that Yu used the sword to receive at the behest of his heart. He did not leave anything from Hu, while not hitting Linda. While Yu hiccups and apologizes to Linda, old man Shi thinks he underestimated Yu before. The guy does legendary things with his sword. Yu hugs Linda and tells the bandits that they will not dare to cause problems for Linda and her father anymore. Yu hiccups and asks them if they understood everything well. Yu says that from this day on, Linda is his man. If anyone wants to deal with her, then he will become his enemy. Yu, hiccuping, says that if someone thinks that he has a lot of health, then let him come up and try to overcome Yu. Linda is touched. There is a bed in the hotel, on which Yu, Sylph and Linda are located. The guy wakes up and thinks why both his hands hurt and he can't move them. Yu turns his head to the right and notices the Sylph. He thinks she came running to his bed again. Then the guy turns his head to the left and notices Linda. He thinks it all looks a little weird. Then the guy gets up and in a panic tries to remember what they did yesterday and how they all ended up in the same bed. The guy remembers that yesterday he and Linda went to a feast in a rich house, tried to convince the leader of the bandits to let her father go. Yu remembers how he then drank a mug of strange juice. Linda then said that they get drunk quickly from it. Linda wakes up, raises her head and asks if Yu is awake. Sylph gets up next and asks what he's been mumbling since morning. Yu goes to the window and asks to give him time to think. He pulls the curtain aside and tries to remember everything else. Yu recovers in his memory all the events that took place during the night. If he is not mistaken, then he got very drunk yesterday. The guy looks out the window and thinks. Then he comes to the conclusion that everything is fine with the city and this is great news. At least he didn't destroy anything to the ground. Then Yu feels hands reaching out to him. Linda hugs him from behind and asks if he remembers what he said yesterday. Yu panics and asks what he told her. Linda responds and tells him that she is his man now. Sylph confirms her words and says that she has everything written down in a notebook. Yu asks them to stop. He says that yesterday, after he finished that mug, he couldn't remember anything else at all. Linda presses her finger to his mouth and asks him not to say anything. 
She knew that you would take back his words. She's sorry she believed in them. Linda will not insist that the guy is responsible for this. She will wait for the day when he himself wants to accept her. Bandits clean up all the mess that was left after the battle of you and who. The servant and the old man she turn around when they notice you, Sylph and Linda. Old man she says he hopes that you has had a good rest. The guy laughs and confirms his words. Old man she says that you helped him yesterday. The guy says he's glad it's over, despite the fact that he doesn't remember anything. Old man she says that the remaining people have fully recognized the power of you. Everyone discussed everything and decided that you should become the head of the Jaoshan Mafia. You refuses, because it will be too troublesome to manage the Mafia. He is not interested in this. Old man she says that if he doesn't want to go into all this, then he can. To be just their roof you will have to do nothing. They will do everything. Linda tells you to accept the offer. Now everyone knows that she is his person. Yu calms Linda down and agrees. He asks her not to cry, because he can't stand it when young girls cry. Linda is happy with this news, she knew that Yu is the best. It seems to you that he got into some difficult cases again. He hopes it doesn't go too far. Two weeks later, two mysterious personalities walk down a long corridor in the castle of Bimo. One of them asks if the job is done. The second person takes off his hood and it turns out to be a blonde girl. She says that she did everything as her uncle told her. The thing is already with Princess Luna, she did not suspect anything. The man is glad of this news. He says that the blonde girl should be in the laboratory and work harder on her experiments. The girl listens. A man notices a bird with a letter. He holds out his hand to her, pulls out the letter and grunts questioningly. The girl comes up to him and asks what happened. The man says that who is no longer alive. The girl is stunned by the news. Did the Capel clan secretly covering their affairs smell something? The man says that they coped with Hu in a one-on-one -on -one fight. It is still unclear what kind of person did it. The girl says that Hu was their prototype, endowing people with superpowers, cultivation. The man decides that they will consider it an industrial marriage. The man turns out to be the Imperial Sage Chester Bollett. The man says that they need to follow the killer, soon he will be on the altar of the five stars. The girl is angry because she was supposed to represent the Imperial Institute at the competition. The girl asks her uncle when they will be able to return the sylph. Would they allow the Bollett family's main jewel to be in the hands of a terrible man? The man blames the girl for everything, since she allowed him to take the sylph. He reminds that Aces protects him, so they don't need to hurry in this case. The man says that there has been no news at all from the old man lately. The search continues, but for now, he has only heard that Sierra Charlotte is acting as the Academy. The man is sure that very soon Aces will realize that he cannot protect anyone at all. Sierra stands on an elevation. A man approaches her and says that everyone has had enough rest. Sierra is pleased with this news and she asks the man to inform everyone that they are continuing the passage. Sierra peers into the distance. It's been a whole month, and she still doesn't know if her student has found Asia. No news has been received from her, which is why the girl is very worried. Yu is being captured by Aggie. He asks her to stop. Aggie says she's been in the water forever. The girl wanted to check on Aggie how much she recovered, but he couldn't stand a minute, starting to suffocate. While Sylph is wiping Yu's nose, Aggie asks what kind of cold has covered her body. It seems to her that this is something difficult. Aisha says that the magic of the afterlife. Pierce was as familiar as the vampire of the underworld. For sure it was he who left the dark energy in Aggie's body. Aggie remembers how during the fight with Pierce she felt her body getting colder and colder. Apparently, the man was already trying his tricks then. Yu says that since Aggie's body has been cleansed of dark energy, it's time for them to return to the academy. Aggie asks about returning to the academy. They've been in this city for so long, but they haven't even had a good time yet. She suggests taking a walk through the streets before leaving. Yu chuckles. Aggie tries to persuade him, promising that it will not delay them for a long time and will not affect the time of their journey in any way. Aggie heard people at the hotel praising the local evening market, and it is nearby, and there is a lot of fun. The girl asks you if he wants to go on a date with Aisha. Aisha was embarrassed by what she heard. Ah Yu agreed very quickly. There are a lot of people in the city in the evening. There is noise all around and lanterns are shining. Yu and Aisha are walking along one of the streets. Aisha asks why she and Yu are walking together and where Aggie and Sylph are. Yu says that they are very busy, so they let them go for a walk together for a while. Yu is grateful to Aggie. Aggie and Sylph are watching Yu and Aisha. Sylph says that Aisha hasn't been in a good mood in recent days, so they took advantage of the moment and decided to give her a chance to relax properly. Aisha notices the cotton candy, grabs Yu's hand and pulls to buy it. Then they watch the fakir. All evening they walk between the bright lanterns and smile at each other. Yu notices that Aisha is very happy. 
Then at some point Yu starts looking at Aisha excitedly. He asks her what she's worried about. Aisha turns her attention to the guy, chuckling questioningly. Yu says that when she walks alone, she is always very sad. Her friends are worried about her. Aisha says she's fine. Then she pauses and says that she thinks that one day the Twelfth Apostle will come for them to take revenge. Aisha is worried about what they will oppose him, how they will fight, because they are too weak for the revenge of the legendary Apostle. Yu turns Aisha around and says that she should believe him instead of worrying about revenge, which is unclear when it will happen. Yu suggests that she just enjoy the joy that they have now, and he mentions that he is not weak at all. Aisha is amazed at U.S. words. She believes that the guy is right, the main thing is to be with the person you love, and even if she has to lose her life, she will not be afraid of it. Yu notices something unusual. He understands that the situation corresponds to the moment for a kiss. Someone's voice is heard from around the corner, who says that he did not expect to see such a beautiful innocent girl in the market. Aisha turns away from Yu, while an unknown person says that running away together to have fun is a wise decision. Groot Capella appears. He introduces himself as a humble servant of the Imperial Academy of Magic, fourth year class trumps. Groot turns to Aisha and asks if he can invite him to spend this evening alone with him. Aisha doesn't understand where the Imperial Academy student came from. The guy only confirms that he is a student of the Imperial Academy. Yu is gloomily surprised by such a coincidence. He turns around and says that they are also students of the Imperial Academy of Magic. Groot is a little confused. He says he's talking to Aisha, not a guy. He asks you to know his place and step aside. Yu turns around menacingly. The guys behind Groot are starting to defend him. The one on the left says that they have passed the selection at school competitions and will now participate in the pentagram. The guy on the right says that their captain is generally recognized as the strongest in their school. Yu grins at the fact that Groot is the strongest. Groot asks if Yu wanted additional problems. Yu says that they are scammers. They dared to hide behind the name of the Great Imperial Academy of Magic. They go around and deceive everyone. Aisha does not understand how he determined that they were deceivers. Yu tells Aisha to look at these guys. Students wear uniforms only at the academy, and cheaters are right on the street. Moreover, the way from Astana to their academy is too long, so who would think of walking in this place in uniform? Aish confirms his words. Groot calls the seals and demands you to explain how he dared to dishonor him and call him a deceiver. Aisha warns you about the attack, but the guy appears next to Groot in a second and kicks him with his foot. Groot flies a huge distance away. His minions are screaming. Yu grins at the fact that they say they are not liars. He asks the question, how can the strongest student of the academy be the weakest? Yu turns to Aisha and asks if she saw it and if it looked amazing. He tells Aisha that she cannot worry, because the first of the twelve apostles is really him. But no one heard the last words, because Groot's henchmen see a man who asks what they are doing in this place. The guys call the stranger the director and tell about the terrible behavior of Yu. The guy grins at the fact that they complain about him to the director. Suddenly, Yu hears a familiar voice and goes into shock. He sees Sierra in front of him, who says that they have a very long conversation ahead of them. Yu is amazed at the appearance of Master Sierra, as well as Aisha. It's already night outside. Inside the house, Yu asks Master Sierra if she is angry. The girl doesn't understand how she can't get angry. Yu said that he and Aggie would go looking for Aisha, and as a result they disappeared for a whole month. Sierra sat and worried while her students traveled all over the empire. Yu says in a drooping voice that they were just about to return back to the academy. Sierra calms down and asks where they went to look for Aisha. She says she went to Lawrence's estate, but it was deserted a long time ago. Aisha slightly pulls on Yu's sleeve. With this gesture, she shows that she does not want to reveal the whole truth. Yu is only happy about this, because they have spent a lot of effort to solve all the problems. It's even hard to believe. Yu begins to invent. He says that Aisha's family moved to a secluded place in the east, which is why it took them a long time. Yu also reminds that he gets seasick on trips. Sierra is silent at first, and then says that the most important thing is that they returned alive and well. There was a knock on the door. Hotel employees come into the room. Sierra asks how Groot is feeling. The worker replies that there is no threat to life, but he is seriously injured. He will not be able to continue on his own, and he won't be able to take part in the competition. Sierra gets gloomy at the moment. She turns around and looks at Yu, saying that it all happened because of one student. Yu tries to justify himself and says that he did not think that in Astana it would be possible to meet a person dressed in the uniform of their academy. Sierra says that their team passed the most difficult tests and became the best, so the guys had to present their academy at the pentagram. Of course they were dressed in uniform. 
Aisha asks what the pentagram is. Sierra says that this is a great celebration for the whole continent, which is held every three years between the five best academies. The pentagram is held in honor of the great heroes of the past, ancient seals and all that. But in fact it is a competition in the magical art. Sierra is thinking what to do, because there are only two weeks left before the start of the competition, and their best team is out of order. One of the employees offers to let the student replace Groot and perform. He's kind of a capable fighter. The guys from Groot's team are shocked. Sierra is a little at a loss. One of the guys asks not to let this student participate. But Aisha interrupts him and says that she would like to participate in the competition with you. The guy from Groot's team says that each school has only three slots in the competition. The second guy is angry because Sierra decided to choose the first available students and replace them. Aisha is getting more serious. She says she will try to prove that she is much stronger than them and, if she succeeds, she will replace them at competitions. The guy from Groot's team screams how Aisha can be stronger than them. He says she underestimates them. Sierra thinks that Aisha is usually very quiet and calm. Why has she become so impulsive and tries to insert her word? Does she really want to protect you? Sierra says that since that's the case, she's ready to arrange their fight. The guys exclaim questioningly. Sierra says that if it doesn't suit them, then they've lost. Guys become drooping. Yu says that in this case, maybe Aggie will participate in the fight. At this time, Aggie and Sylph are outside and eating Dango. It's already day outside. Aggie asks what's going on. She and Sylph went out for a little walk around the market, and so much has happened. As soon as they returned, for some reason it was suddenly necessary to call the upperclassmen to fight. And after that she also found out that she would have to participate in some kind of competition. Aisha grins, because Aisha says one thing and she wouldn't mind trying her strength on someone at all. Aisha says that participating in the competition is a great experience, because you can compete with the best among the best and hone your skills and practice. Moreover, the reward is good, if they miss it, they will regret it very much. Aggie says she really would like to know how strong she is now, if suddenly they win, she can get permits. Aisha asks what kind of permission. Aggie laughs it off and says that their things will be packed soon, but you is still not visible. Aisha says that the guy left in the morning. You had to say one loud bye to a local friend. Aggie is surprised that you managed to make friends. Suddenly, you appears behind her and asks why it's surprising that he has friends in these places. Aggie gets scared and asks where he came from. Aisha chuckles, and you does not understand why he was exposed to blame. Sierra comes up and asks if everyone is there. In that case, it's time for them to go back to the academy. The carriages start moving and quickly sweep through the city, dispersing the dust on the roads. Linda is standing next to her father. She considers herself the cause of many people's suffering. So God decided to punish her, since he allows her to experience such suffering. The girl tearfully asks you not to forget that she is waiting for him. She tells her father that she wants to leave all these black things. If they fail to quit, then she hopes to solve them the way she wants. The father agrees with his daughter and says that she can do whatever she wants with their business. The carriages are rushing along the path at full speed. Sierra, you, Aisha, Aggie and Sylph are sitting in the carriage. Sierra says that it's still quite a long way to Fenmo. If they have any questions about magic, then they can ask her. She will try to help as much as possible. Yu says he has no questions about magic, but there are some others. He had heard a strange legend about magic seals in Feng Mo. He is interested in whether the pentagram appeared because of them. Sierra is glad that outsiders can't hear them. If someone found out that her student did not know such elementary things, they would be laughed at. Sierra realizes that they still have a long way to go, so she decides to tell them this story to pass the time. At the point of contact of their empire with the kingdoms of Kenny's and Maiduin is the city of Marta. In another way on their mainland it is called Fenmo. According to legend, by about the 2000th year of the existence of the human race, a huge beast appeared there, similar to a mountain ram, all burning with black flames. But he wasn't like ordinary magical creatures at all. He had an intelligence much higher than human, and it was impossible to cope with him, no matter how hard you tried. He almost poisoned humanity, which had so hard won the continent from magical creatures, back into oblivion. People called this creature an incredible, creepy creature a demon. He wondered at the word demon whether they really exist. Then he asks which of the apostles destroyed him. Yu thinks that he acted stupidly. He should have been calmer, he is behaving unreasonably. Aggie intervenes in the conversation, saying that the apostles did not participate in the battle and the people themselves coped with this monster. Aisha is surprised that Aggie also knows this legend. Aggie thinks she heard her mother tell her this story as a child, but she doesn't remember the details at all. 
only something vague, Sierra continues to tell. At that time, the five most powerful magicians of the continent united to apply the strongest enveloping spell pentagram. In the end they imprisoned the demon underground. After that, the five magicians agreed to meet in Feng Mo every three years and check whether the pentagram was intact. The magicians died, and their children continued the tradition, and in the end it turned into the current celebrations and competition. Yu understands that in this way, somewhere under Martha, a terrible demon is now trapped. Sierra says it's just a legend. They won't be able to find out the truth anymore. Then the master says that it's time for them to start preparing, since there is very little time. Inside the building, a blonde girl asks if the Imperial Academy of Magic has arrived yet. The employee replies to her that there has been no news yet. The blonde girl asks her not to worry. She keeps talking, but the next moment she notices the guests entering the building. Yu holds Sylph in her arms, Aggie sings the tune of a cheerful song, and Aisha says that she will go to the reception, register and take the keys. She asks you to take Sylph to the bed right away and not wake her up. The blonde girl says that the hotel is currently providing its services to two participating Imperial Magic Academies. She asks who they are. The girl behind says that the guests have flooded the city during the celebrations, so the hotel has allocated two floors for the participants of the competition, and the other floors receive customers as usual. One of them takes a look and says that there are so many girls around and it's not very good. Yu sneezes. He wonders who is remembering him. Yu, holding Sylph in his arms, passes by the girls. Aggie looks at Yu and asks if he lacks Aisha's attention. As soon as he saw the girls, he was immediately stunned. Yu asks her not to say such things. He explains that he's just looking around. Aggie wants to be feared. Aisha goes to the reception. She goes to the counter and tells the girl that they are participants of the competition from the Imperial Academy of Magic of the Fram Empire. She asks to give them the key to their rooms. The girl gets lost at first, and then turns somewhere to the side. Sierra notices this and asks what happened. The girl says that everything is fine and gives them the key, welcoming them to the city of Mar. She says she has already registered them. Sierra thanks the girl, and then turns to her students and tells them to sort out their luggage, and then come to dinner with sweets. Aggie and you were immediately inspired. Aisha comes up to them and asks what's wrong with you. Sylph wakes up and says that he also wants sweets. There is a whole crowd of people standing near the hotel which creates a lot of noise. You, Aggie, Sierra and Aisha are sitting in a huge snow white hall. The table is filled with various delicious food. Aggie holds a fork with a knife and looks at the food with a huge appetite. Sylph is sitting next to you. They stuck out their tongue and just sits there. Aggie has tasted the food and notices that it has a very strange taste, like the most ordinary. But then a stringency appears. You notices a strange smell that comes from the food. A man who is sitting at the next table turns to them and says that everyone who comes to this place for the first time reacts this way. He says that the peculiarity of local dishes is medicinal herbs in the composition. They both strengthen the body and satisfy hunger. This is new to most people, but as soon as they finish eating, they will feel that both the body and the spirit have been nourished. The mood will become cheerful, and they will want to eat again and again. Aggie says that in this case she will try, but you holds her hand. He says don't touch anything. There is poison in the dishes. If she eats once, she will become addicted. The man is surprised by the words about the poison. Aggie is scared, because she has already swallowed one piece. Aisha starts to worry about her. Yu says it's not a poison that immediately leads to death. A man approaches their table and wants to say something. The man's name is Lazar. He says that he heard them say that there is poison in the dishes, and now he himself will not dare to taste them. He asks you to explain how he realized there was poison there. Yu is silent at first, and then says that everything is very simple, since everyone knows what saxifrage and raincoat are. But no one knows that they can be used to get a poison that causes addiction in a person. Yu says that, getting inside, in the short term it allows a person to fall into euphoria, but with frequent use it causes yellowing of the skin, muscle exhaustion, a person dries up in spirit and body, prolonged depression and withdrawal begins, a person craves only one thing to taste the poison again. The man points to himself and says that he did not do so. While Aisha and Aggie look at him with suspicion, Yu shows that the blue liquid on the spoon is poison. Like oil, it does not mix with water. If they go to the kitchen right now, they will definitely find a lot of interesting things there. Men immediately fly into a rage. One of them is trying to figure out what the chefs of this restaurant are up to. The second man calls the manager of the establishment. 
A slightly plump man with a mustache runs up to them and asks what's going on and why it's so noisy. The manager notices that the guests are very angry. The man is amazed by his impudence. If you hadn't discovered that there was poison in the dishes, then they wouldn't be alive anymore. The manager asks what kind of poison. He points to you and says not to take his word for it, since most likely he also wants to open a restaurant and is jealous of his business. In his opinion, you is ready for any meanness. Aggie is outraged. She asks what he is saying. She gives out scathing comments. Men take out containers with blue liquid and shout that they have found what they were looking for. The manager turns around in fright. Men ask the manager how he can explain it. They ask him not to deceive, as they have been eating in this place for three months and the taste of this food is very familiar to them. The men call the guards and ask them to detain the manager. The manager is in a stupor, he does not know what to do, so he turns to Mr. Lazar. Mr. Lazar looked at his guard and the next second the manager was hit in the neck. While the manager falls to his knees, the man is shouted that he is finished. Mr. Lazar asks him to excuse him. He says that his family invested in this dining room. They did not think that this man would secretly poison the food. On this day he was punished. Sierra asks if the kingdom of Kenny's is his home. Mr. Lazar does not answer the question. Lazar turns his gaze to you and says that he is pleasantly amazed by the guy's knowledge in botany. Mr. Lazar says he would like to invite him to Kenny's. You replies that he is not interested. You says that the gentleman smells of the same poison, and he destroyed the main witness in a second. If you add everything up, then he is exactly the person who started poisoning the guests. Mr. Lazari smiled grimly. He says that you is behaving inappropriately. Isn't he afraid of never leaving this dining room? A dagger flies into Yu's back, but the next moment, he flies off in the other direction. Aisha and Aggie started up. Mr. Lazar asks who it was who interfered in their conversation. It turns out that the person who says that at the moment the city of Marta is under the jurisdiction of the Fram Empire. The blonde woman says that the representatives of the kingdom of Kenny's should not make a scene and deprive people of their lives. She asks Prince Lazar if this is true. Yu finds out the real status of the laser. Mr. Laser says that the blonde girl is absolutely right, while addressing her as Highness Luna. Aggie recognizes Highness Luna, the second heir to the throne of their empire. Sierra thinks that even though she is the second, but in fact there is no first place, because everyone has long known that all the first heir, Prince Mars, is capable of his drinking and overeating. Highness Luna demands not to flatter her, since they have come to defend the honor of the empire on the pentagram and he dismisses his hands. She asks what he wants. Mr. Laser says that Highness Luna is very fond of joking. He came to watch the competition, and their wedding has already been announced, so he's not up to anything. Sierra asks what kind of wedding. She says that Luna is the acknowledged heir to the Imperial throne, and if you marry her to King Kenny's, something terrible will happen. Luna apologizes to Sierra and says she didn't have time to warn her about everything. She says she will explain everything later. Sierra is still trying to find out everything. You asks them not to worry. The guy says that Mr. Lazar definitely won't live long. He thinks that a couple of days will pass after the wedding, and Luna will already be a widow. Mr. Lazar was covered by the guards. He asked you to repeat what he said. The moon people also surrounded her and took out their weapons. Lazar says that he just took pity on you in the presence of Princess Luna and did not take his life, but he simply behaves inappropriately and does not value his life, so he should be responsible for his words. Yu turns to Prince Lazar and advises him to be calmer, because he often wakes up in a cold sweat from nightmares. There is enough air, presses on his chest. The heart beats much faster. How worried he's bleeding. Lazar doesn't understand how Yu knows this. He asks what's next. Yu says that Mr. smells strongly of medicines, and every medicine is known to have side effects. Lazar asks if Yu really thinks he's that stupid. He wouldn't drink obscure medicines. He explains this by overexertion and fatigue. Lazar thinks that he already has several hundred test subjects who are trying various medications. If there is poison anywhere, it is definitely not in it. Yu smirks and asks if Lazar believes what he says. All medications have side effects. It is not necessary that they will take effect immediately. Even if the sediment from the ingredients used, even if it is the dust that rose during the creation of the powder, everything contains a fraction of poison. The danger of some poisons will not manifest itself in the first few minutes, but it accumulates, collects in the body, and only then symptoms appear, but then you can lose your life. Mr. Lazare is very excited. He created a thousand drugs and now he doesn't even know which one is the problem. Lazar demands to save him. You asks him again. Lazar says that since he understood by one smell what people were poisoned with, then he knows everything about his poison. 
Prince Lazar says that if he saves him, he will get everything he wants right away. And if not, then he will have a lot of problems. Aggie and Aisha stand in front of you. Aggie tells you to back off. Aisha is unhappy that they can't even go out to dinner in peace. Something always happens. Lazar's guards are holding him down. They tell him to think better, since the guy may just be talking nonsense. They suggest that they first return to the palace and be examined by the court doctors. Prince Lazar asks them to shut up and says that he knows exactly whether there is poison in him or not. Prince Lazar turns back to you. He says all it takes is to save him from the poison. He promises the honor of the second prince of the kingdom of Kenny's. You will be able to get everything he wants, gold, beauties, titles. You wonders if he can really get everything he wants. He says that if so, then he wants the prince to break off his engagement with Luna himself. For this he will receive a recipe for getting rid of his poison. Prince Lazar is alarmed by the fact that you wants him to cancel the wedding with Luna himself. He says he will never do it. Sierra thinks that now the Fram Empire has unrest inside and aggressors outside, and if Luna refuses the wedding, the outbreak of war with Kenny's is more than likely. If Lazar himself breaks off the engagement, this is just a great option. Sierra smiles and admires that her student can sometimes act wisely. The moon is in a stupor at this moment. Yu says it's their decision, so they can do as they want. Lazar says that he will agree to the terms only if you can heal him. Yu gives two recipes, one of which will help Lazar get rid of the poison, and the second one is for visitors of the institution who manage to eat in this place. The man accepts the sheet and thanks the young man. Yu shows another sheet to Lazar and says that the remedy will help get rid of the poison, but will strike some internal organs. As soon as the engagement is officially cancelled, Yu will give him the second part, a prescription for a medicine useful for internal organs. Lazar is outraged because he does not believe the promises of the prince. Yu smiles and says it's just in case. Lazar snatches the recipe sheet and says that he will cancel the wedding, as they agreed, and as for the things that happened in the dining room. Although he was not aware, but he will reimburse all the losses incurred by the citizens of the empire. Mr. Lazar leaves the institution. He turns around and asks if Yu is really a disciple of the Fire Witch. He says it would be better if his medicine helped, otherwise they will find out how the deceptions of the royals end. It's already night in the city. Luna looks out the window and says that the idea of the engagement belonged to her helpless brother. It is not unknown where he found a strange gentleman who offered to marry Prince Lazare in exchange for asylum in the kingdom of Kenny's. The three clans have already secretly joined forces. Only part of the power is in the hands of Luna's father. The country is controlled by General Isis. The royal family is now in danger. Luna's father cares the most about his daughter and thinks that it is better for Luna to hide in the kingdom of Kenny's than to remain in danger in a crumbling empire. Sierra asks if the Emperor doesn't know what kind of person this Lazar is. Luna says Lazar has a good reputation, and if she hadn't sent people to find out more about him, they would never have found out about his evil and treachery. According to that gentleman's suggestion, if she manages to strengthen her position in the kingdom, then she will be able to use the military power of the country to help the imperial family. Sierra is very angry. She asks if this means that she was actually framed and abandoned. Luna says it's thanks to Sierra's student. She will be able to get rid of an unpleasant engagement, but in this way the crisis of the royal family returns to the starting point. Luna takes Sierra's hands and asks where teacher asses is now. She says he hasn't heard from her in three months. She is afraid that now only a teacher can help them. Sierra reports that Aces passed away due to illness. Luna is shocked by the terrible news. Sierra says that all this time his letters were written to her. She could not let the world know this news. The power of Aces scared the three main clans. As soon as they found out about his death, a big war for the Empire would begin. The members of the royal family would be deprived of their lives. Sierra takes Luna by the hand and offers to go with her to leave the Empire. Luna says that Sierra shouldn't worry about her since she already has a plan. Sierra tries to persuade her, but Luna asks her to trust her and wait for the right moment, and she will tell her everything. Sierra calms down. She knows that the moon won't make noise for no reason. Since she says she has a way, then that's the way it is. Sierra turns to you and says she's going to spend the moon. You wipes his mouth and asks if they're done talking. The moon thanks them for the events of this day. You tells her that she doesn't have to thank them, as Sierra's student. He was obligated to help her solve the problem. Sierra is embarrassed and the moon was silent. Luna thinks that there are rumors that Sierra has a fiancé who is also her disciple. Luna and her guards leave the hotel. One of the guards asks what they should do now. The moon stops and points out that they believe that there was no meeting with Sierra, so they are obliged to act strictly according to the master's plan. The guards obey. 
There are various flasks on the table under the light of the lamp. A man mixes various ingredients in flasks. After three minutes, he will need to pour the liquid and strictly control the amount. The laser lifts the flask with the received medicine. The guards ask if their master is sure that everything is fine with this medicine. Lazar says that he carefully studied the recipe on his own and gave people well-versed in pharmacology to check it several times. In addition, he made it himself. Then the man lifts the flask and drinks the medicine. Suddenly his heart starts hurting and he grabs his sternum. Lazar thinks that it's not for nothing that you so delighted everyone at the Magic Congress. With one sip the chest pain went away. One of their guards asks, since the medicine has worked, then the engagement will have to be cancelled. Lazar asks him again and says that he will not cancel the engagement only at someone's request. He believes that tomorrow there will be people who will also demand something from him. The man says that he has already sent a person to deal with you. However, due to the fact that there are people around during the day, it was difficult for him to do it publicly. Lazar is angry because some guy dared to disgrace the prince, forcing him to beg to tell the prescription of the medicine. He wants you to regret it. The creaking of windows is heard in the hotel at night. A man in dark clothes clothes appears in one of the open windows. A person sees you, who is sleeping on the bed. The stranger approaches the bed with a handkerchief, but the next moment he feels something strange. Aisha is standing in the castle in a wedding dress. She tells you that she wants to return with him to the palace of the apostles and have children. The girl asks the guy if he agrees. You is very happy. He picks up the girl in his arms and tells them to come back soon. But the girl stops him. Sierra turns out to be in his arms and says that it's not like that. You screams in fright. The next moment he wakes up. When he wakes up, he notices that a stranger is standing over him, who wants to cover his face with a handkerchief. You grabs the stranger by the arm and twists him into a grip. You hovers over him and asks who tried to attack him. The stranger tries to escape. He notices a black suit, a mask, a look directed anywhere but in the eyes, carries poisons with him, breaks into other people's rooms in the middle of the night. Yu is grinning because he was lucky to meet that legendary assassin. The stranger thinks what is wrong with Yu, why he is not afraid of him. The stranger says that he is not after his life, so he should not resist and follow him. Yu says that he will not follow anywhere, because he is the one to catch him. A dagger flies at you, but the guy manages to dodge. The stranger jumps out of the grip and says that he accidentally grabbed him. The stranger notes that you has impressive abilities, but according to information, magic is not about him. The stranger folds the seal of the blink of an eye. You is delighted to have seen the assassin's magical abilities. This is the first time he sees a live assassin, a professional killer. The assassin is surprised that the blink of an eye had no effect at all against the guy who was standing in front of her. Yu reminds the assassin that he said he wouldn't kill him. He asks why, then, to seize him and who he is. The assassin points his daggers at the young man. Yu fights off all the daggers. It seems to the assassin that there were serious mistakes in the report. Yu's abilities are incredible. He thinks it's better for them to go their separate ways. Yu asks if the assassin is planning to escape. He does not advise him to do this. He demands to tell everything. Yu shows his hand, in which the energy is collected. The assassin is preparing to defend himself. Then the assassin notices that this is not magic, but a long-lost martial art. Yu overcomes the distance between them and strikes. There is an explosion. Yu says that the assassin wanted to kidnap him, and now he doesn't want to reveal who he is. He asks the assassin not to get angry in this case. Yu falls into a stupor. The assassin turned out to be a girl named Anka. Yu is surprised that assassins take such beautiful girls. While Yu asks Anka to change, Sierra comes into their room. The teacher asks why he made a noise alone in his room in the dead of night. Then Sierra sees the guy giving his shirt to the girl without clothes. Yu becomes gloomy and asks the master to listen to his explanation. Sierra gets gloomy at the moment. Yu says he will explain everything now, so she just needs to listen to him. Sierra laughs at first, and the next moment she says that there is no point in talking to Yu. Yu's cry is heard. While Yu tries to justify himself, the assassin girl tries to escape through the window. At the consulate, Kenny's Lazar chastises Anka for not bringing Yu. The girl admits that she failed the mission, the goal was too strong, she could not defeat him. Lazar gets angry and asks what she is saying. The girl replies that Yu has incredible powers, perhaps even legendary. Lazar asks her to shut up. He says that there are only four people with legendary powers in the Empire at the moment. They have three in general in Kenny's, so she should tell where an ordinary guy has legendary powers from. Anka sends him only the best, failure-free mercenaries. Lazar thinks about how she was able to fail the mission so easily. He assumes that someone stronger is behind you. Lazar throws her some kind of bottle. 
Anka asks what it is. The man says that a failed mission cannot go unpunished. In the bottle is his newest drug, which she will have to drink. If she survives, he will spare her. Anka takes the bottle and thanks the prince for his generosity. She completely drinks the latest medicine. One of the prince's servants asks what they should do with the antidote. The man becomes enraged and sweeps away everything on the table with his hand. He is outraged that his employees also call themselves scientists and pharmacists. So many people in time were investigated, but they could not find the cause of the disease. The prince knocks on the table in anger. Suddenly he feels pain. The servant asks what happened to him. The prince orders the pigeons to be prepared for flight so that he can send a letter to his father. Lazar realizes that this time he himself made a mistake. Broke off the engagement in exchange for the antidote. He promises that he will get even with you. It's already morning outside. You ask Sierra if she wants to drink and bring her a cup of tea. But the guy is ignored. Sierra stands over Aisha and Aggie. She says they are already investigating the assassin's identity and goals. She hopes that after the competition they will be able to find out something about him. She says it doesn't matter who their opponent is or what his goal was, their main task is to strengthen precautions. They must make sure that no one can influence their performance. The girls listen attentively to the teacher. Sierra also says that individual combat training is almost over, and the day of the competition is already approaching, so they will need to decide on tactics this afternoon. The students listen to her. Five schools will participate in the competition. The Imperial Academy of Magic of the Empire Farm. The Institute of Magical Cultivation. The Institute for the Study of Demons of the United State of Manger. The Higher School of Magic and the Research Institute of Magic of the Kingdom of Kenny's. A total of 15 participants. The competition is not one-on-one -on -one fights at all. All participants will be thrown into a huge four-level maze at the same time. From a bird's eye view, this maze is a huge pentagram carved into a cylinder, and at different levels, the tip is turned in different directions. Five teams randomly assign participants to its levels, one for each. The goal is to capture the key to the door leading somewhere in the middle of the level. This is the only way to move to another floor. That is, to climb to the fourth level, you need to connect all three keys from the previous levels. The team that manages to do this will win the competition. So Sierra talked to the other two teachers about their tactics. She tells them to post an objection if there are any. She says that Aisha is the strongest of them, so she needs to go to the most difficult, the third level. Aggie is a crazy fighter, and she doesn't have to worry that she won't have enough magical powers, so she's on the second level. And as for you, being not the most important element of their team, Sierra decides that he will need to go to the first level. Yu has never shown how strong he is, as he has certain reasons. Aggie decides not to say anything, that he taught her everything, but it seems to her that they don't believe in his powers. Aisha says that if Aisha has a sylph, he will be able to defeat the students of other schools. Sierra reports that this is exactly what she wanted to say. Participants cannot carry live objects with them. There will be a check before starting. Everyone knows that the magic sword of the Bollets has a soul, so the sylph will have to be left at home. Aisha is about to offer another option, but Sierra interrupts her and asks her to relax. She already has a way to help you become stronger. Yu thinks that nothing good will come of it. Strange sounds are heard from the room. Sierra asks you not to twitch and push, because this is all for him. Yu's nose is bleeding, but he's happy. The guy is lying on his teacher's lap and is filled with magic. Sierra says her strength is at its limit. They have done a lot for you. The guy says he can't take it anymore. On the day of the start of the competition in the pentagram, a huge number of people gathered in the big arena. The whole team comes to the competition. Sierra sees the entrance to the arena ahead. She says that from now on her students will be able to rely only on themselves. Aggie asks if you really gave the antidote to Prince Kenny's. Sierra told the young man that Luna had already received notice of the breakup of the wedding, so he gave him the antidote, as they agreed. Aggie is unhappy that you gave the prince an antidote, because he threatened to take their lives. Yu says he wouldn't have done it just like that. Two prominent figures appear in the crowd. Sierra recognizes Chester Bollett, who is an Imperial Sage. He says he's glad to see representatives from the Imperial Academy of Magic. They haven't seen each other for a long time. He says that Sierra Charlotte is still bright and beautiful. Sierra says that, as an Imperial Sage, he should have done research. She asks what he is doing at a commercial event. Aisha also notices Chester Bollett. 
The man chuckles and says that lately he has been interested in the history of the sealed city. The maze is closed at the usual time. Everyone knows that it is opened every three years, so Chester Bollett decided not to miss this opportunity. The hooded man standing next to Chester Bollett is very angry. Chester had heard that their academy had changed the composition of the team halfway through, and now there is a certain student named Yu among the participants. Yu chuckles. Chester Bollett looks at him with a smile. Sierra says they have to go to the arena already. Chester says that in that case he doesn't detain them anymore. He says they will see each other again on the podium. The students headed forward, and Chester and the hooded man went to the stands. When Chester walks past Yu, he puts his hand on his shoulder. He asks the guy to hold the sylph for now. Yu didn't answer anything. A table with judges and technical tables can be seen in the arena. The host is sitting at one of the tables and informs that before the start of the competition, the host party received two news, and they want everyone to apologize. The leaders of the Imperial Academy of Magic and the Institute of Magic of the Kingdom of Kenny's have urgent matters. They will not be able to participate. Therefore, at the moment, the leading two teams are being replaced. Sierra wonders where the moon is. The girl from the technical table says that Princess Luna will be speaking from the Imperial Academy of Magic. Sierra is shocked by this news. Just like all the people in the stands who see the princess at the competition for the first time. Sierra grabs Director Decker by the collar and asks him what is going on at all. The man replies that something happened to the health of the originally chosen presenter, and Luna is just a fictitious student of their school, so I had to put her on. The man in dark clothes is called Decker. He is the director of the Imperial Academy of Magic. Sierra is amazed. The girl at the technical table says that the Magic Institute of the Kingdom of Kenny's is changing its host to Prince Kenny's, His Highness Lazar. Sierra and Decker look at the man on their right. He says that he had to choose a leading Lazar. The girl at the technical table says that this time the competition will be fully broadcast on the big screen. Each participant will be followed by a teledrin filming the entire process. At the moment, the image of all 15 participants has already appeared on their screen. The girl notices you touching the teledrin and asks him not to do it. One of these teledrins flies to the entrance to the arena, the first level. You sees the teledrin for the first time. A girl's voice is heard saying that 15 students have taken their seats. The competition is officially open. The competition has begun. All the participants went inside. In the process of searching for keys to another level, they will all have to face low-level magical creatures and competitors from other magical schools. An hour later, on the first level, the girl found a room with a key. She is happy that she has finally found him. A voice is heard saying that he was walking in circles, and the key was in this room. Yu appears, who is glad that he also saw a beautiful girl. The girl is silent, and then uses the magic of the vortex. She gets wings, and she flies towards the key to grab it. Someone's tongue grabs the girl and does not let her take the key. The girl got angry, and then she started screaming, because the tongue threw her a huge distance away. Someone clicks their hands. Yu is amazed. He sees in front of him a huge frog that has placed a girl in his mouth. Yu realizes that this is a magical beast of level B strange steam is coming out of the frog's mouth. Then the girl's body begins to glow. The girl was lying in the middle of the seal. Medical workers were in a hurry. Giant frog saliva is poisonous, so they urgently need an antidote. The girl at the technical tables expresses pity. The girl was just one step away from the coveted key, but the fairy from the Royal Institute of Magic fell into the clutches of the guarding magical guardian. The woman watching the competition says that each participant needs to create a special inscription, kindly provided by their school, in case they can no longer continue the competition. They will be evacuated immediately. The woman tells Sierra to relax. Her student will be taken out before he runs out of oxygen, so he will be as good as new. Sierra scoffs and says that it would be better if they took care of themselves, as if he did not interfere with them. The woman says that Sierra's student is going out soon, then what's the point of working hard there? Sierra doesn't understand what she means. The man with glasses says that the giant frog has an acute sense of its territory, so before the competition it was also hypnotized to properly guard the key. To overcome this, we need the coordinated work of at least two magicians. But only you remained on the first level. The woman is sure that he will not be able to get the key, as a result, they will automatically teleport to the next level, and he himself will be evacuated. Sierra says they'll see how things turn out. The presenter is delighted at the sight of what is happening. She says that the owner of the key of the first level becomes a participant from the Imperial Academy of Magic, Yu. Somehow, the giant frog did not attack him. Lyagba just sat and watched. Sierra and the woman arguing with her are shocked. 
People in the stands also can't understand what happened to the frog, whether it's a hoax. Suddenly the organizers help the participant. Yu turns to Liagban, pointing to the key, asks if he can take it. He asks the frog if she wants to stop him. The creature croaks and falls on its back. The presenter reports that the giant frog has been defeated. She doesn't understand what Yu Yu did to her. Just looks at her in silence. He says that Liagva was a good boy, but he needs to know his place. The presenter informs that the winner of the first floor is a participant from the Imperial Academy of Magic. Now they will move to another floor, which is above the level. One of the men in the stands asks someone to tell him what you did that a giant frog fell on his back. Someone said that you was a disciple of the Fire Witch, that he was not even strong in elementary magic, and he even accidentally got into the competition. One of the students says that on the way to the key, you did not meet any animals. It can't be luck. According to the student, someone from the organizers helps you. The man says that the participants of the first level of their pentagram are the weakest, so he advises to look at what is happening on the third level. On the third level, in the room with the key, a magical creature of level a flaming bear. The keeper of the key at this level fell into the hands of a stone golem. The flaming bear growls, and the next moment the stone golem throws him aside. It seems to Prince Lazar that this year the champions of the competition will be their institute of magic. The girls in the stands admire the laser. The man with glasses says that the stone golem is a concentration of magic. With one blow he could cope with a level a magical beast, it's just incredible strength. The woman says it's not fair. Laser is an experienced magician with excellent skills. She doesn't understand why he was placed with school students. In her opinion, this is too much. An older man says that it is not forbidden for them to have magnificent natural data. He compares him to Princess Luna, the same fictitious student of the Institute of Magic. There is no problem in his participation in the competition. Prince Lazar approaches the key. Suddenly they try to attack him from behind. The magic almost reaches him, but the stone golem covers him with his hand. Lazar didn't think that he and Luna would meet in this room. The girl keeps her weapon ready. The princess comes closer to him, feeling the tension. Sierra watches all this and thinks about what the moon is doing. On the second level, in the room with the key, the beast is dealt a dissecting blow. But the beast is still not defeated. One of the students asks if his brothers at school did not have the subject magical beasts. He explains that this beast cannot be cut, you need to use fire. Another student says that he can do anything, but then he points his hand at Aisha and asks why she is trying to cut the beast. No one knows that. The woman asks Sierra what kind of magic Aggie uses. The girl replies that she only has entry-level wind magic. However, there is something of berserkers in her blood, so she uses their techniques and cold weapons. The woman who asked about Aggie didn't think she would see the power of the berserker with her own eyes. The students shout that the animals still do not end. A beast wants to attack one of the students from behind. The students disappear one by one, which makes Aggie more tense. She was left all alone, but she does not despair and attacks the beast. One of the tentacles grabs Aggie's arm. The rest of the tentacles are flying in her direction to also have time to grab. A huge mouth appears in front of Aggie. She's not scared, but she gets disgusted by the fact that she might be inside her. Suddenly, a fireball appears from the side, which causes a bright flash, followed by a huge explosion. Aggie falls to the ground and clears her throat. She says that you arrived in time. She greets him. The spectators in the stands are amazed at such a powerful fireball. Mid-level magic is also very strong. One of the spectators on the podium does not understand what Yu is doing on the second level. How he got there. The woman turns to Sierra and points out to Yu that he doesn't even have basic magic. How can he fireballs? Sierra says she took all his void rings, and the guards at the entrance carefully checked everyone. He couldn't deceive everyone. Sierra thinks about the fact that she didn't teach him mid-level magic at all, which eventually happens. Yu helps Aggie wrap the wound on her leg with a bandage, and then asks if she can continue the battle. Aggie calls him arrogant and raises his fist up. To the side, you can hear the beast recovering again. Yu doesn't understand why the beast is still alive. The beast rushes forward, mouth wide open. Yu is happy about this, as it is a good opportunity to avenge Aggie. A few minutes before, on the third level, Luna strikes with a sword, but hits the stone golem directly and cannot pierce it. The stone golem tries to hit the girl with the other hand but she manages to bounce away and the golem hits itself. The moon bounces a huge distance. She notices that the tip of her sword has broken. The presenter reports that Princess Luna escaped the blows of the stone golem, but her weapon broke. Lazar turns to the moon and says that if she has already realized the difference between them, then he asks her to leave the pentagram on her own. Lazar says he doesn't want to hurt the girl. 
the girls in the stands admire the prince again, calling him a real gentleman. The moon is angry. She lets go of her sword, and it begins to transform into a much more serious weapon. The girl restores the point of the sword and prepares to attack. The woman is amazed that the girl has mastered the lost legendary lightning sword Asia. Sierra ponders this moment. Lightning Asia and Sylph are two magic weapons of the legendary King Yuansu. But Lightning Asia does not have a soul, so you can take it to the arena. Sierra thinks that the trump card up her sleeve that Luna was talking about is Asia. But even with this incredible sword, it will be very difficult to fight the three main clans at the same time. A huge amount of energy hits the golem. The moon is going to strike a decisive blow and finish off the golem. She strikes and the golem finally crumbles to the stones. The laser is covered due to bursts of energy and smoke. Then he hears Luna say it's his turn. Lazarus grins, calling Luna a domineering princess. The golem's arm, which has remained intact, reaches out to grab the moon by the leg. The girl falls into a trap. The girl is trying to get out of the golem's grip with the help of a sword. She pierces one of the golem's arms, but they transform and only get bigger. Lazar says it's useless since these stones can absorb magical powers, her attacks will only make them more powerful. Even legendary weapons won't help in this case. While the prince asks the moon not to make unnecessary movements, a blue portal appears above him. The prince turns around and grunts questioningly. A huge block of ice appears from the portal which deals a crushing blow. The moon is hit by a surprise attack. Strange crystals appear in front of the moon, from which someone's voice is heard demanding to give a hand as soon as possible. As soon as possible, before Laser's magic power is restored. The moon reaches out to the crystals and a hand appears from there, which squeezes the hand of the moon. Aisha appears before the moon. Lena immediately recognizes the girl. The laser removes the effect of the ice block and shouts who dared to attack him. The prince notices the ice crystals. He doesn't understand how Luna was able to escape with another student. Lazar is looking for the moon. He is trying to figure out where the girl went. He doesn't feel it. Then the guy is suddenly pierced by a sword right in the sternum. The hand of the moon appeared from the portal, which pierced Lazarus with a sword. The prince turns around. The presenter loudly reports that Mr. Lazar was pierced in the chest with a sword by Princess Luna. The prince sees the moon and Aisha in front of him. He doesn't understand why he can't feel the magical power of the moon. The presenter reports that Aisha, a participant of the competition from the Imperial Academy of Magic, helped Princess Luna to escape from the prince and successfully attack him from an ambush. The spectators in the stands are shocked. They want to find out what kind of girl with silver hair appeared, because she disappeared somewhere from the very beginning of the competition and only now appeared. Sierra is proud of Aisha. A woman with gray hair says that although the protection of ice crystals is not very high, but they can absorb light and selectively reflect it. If you look inattentively, you can confuse this with the disappearance of objects. The woman with gray hair continues to speak. She says that something else is important in this technique. Aisha was able to limit the spread of magical powers using ice crystals. No one would be able to feel it. The woman asks if Aisha is really studying only in the first year. Stara confirms her words and says that although her talent is not the same as that of their prince Lazar, but she is really very hardworking. Lazar realized that Aisha had blocked her magical powers so that he could not feel them. He asks if they think they could beat him. The prince turns to stone and begins to melt, which puts Aisha in a stupor. The girls begin to be surrounded, so they immediately get into a fighting stance. A huge number of copies of Prince Lazar appear. The presenter reports that more than a hundred lasers appeared in the hall. Aisha and Luna were surrounded. The spectators in the stands admire the laser. Sierra begins to worry about Aisha and Luna. Aisha is dissatisfied with the appearance of a whole crowd of Lazarus doubles. Luna didn't think he would be so prudent. As soon as Lazar entered the maze, the doppelgangers were already following him everywhere. A crowd of doppelgangers is about to attack and runs forward, straight at the girls. The moon cuts the copies of Lazarus in half, but then they fuse together again. Luna does not notice that many doppelgangers appear behind her, but Aisha manages to cover the girl with her magic. Aisha says they need to seize the moment and find the real prince. Aisha shouts for the moon to act faster. The presenter admires Aisha's strength. She reports that participant Aisha was able to use her ice magic to freeze the prince and all his doppelgangers. The man with glasses says that Aisha controls ice magic in such a large area. He notes the excellent reaction and control of the girl. Luna notices that all the doppelgangers have a piece of the prince's magic. It is almost impossible to find the real one, and they don't have time to check everyone. In this case, the moon takes out her sword and raises it up. 
She gathers all possible energy in order to destroy everything except herself and Aisha. The sword releases a powerful wave of magic that spreads throughout the room. Aisha is covering herself. A woman in the stands notes that Aisha used her sword to the fullest. Sierra, who is sitting next to her, is very nervous. The presenter is also shocked. People in the stands are amazed by the incredible power of the legendary weapon, Lightning Asia. The presenter says that under the power of the legendary weapon, not a single lookalike of the laser participant managed to escape. Did this cunning trick determine the winner of the fight? The presenter says that the moon overdid the blow. The fog has risen too thick, because of which almost nothing is visible. The moon feels a strange smell that does not come from the fog. She understands that this is what laser is most strong in. Poison. There wasn't enough poison mist yet. Luna turns around and notices that a laser appeared in the fog, which brought something behind his back. Luna manages to put a block with the help of a sword. The laser struck a strong blow, but hit the sword of the moon. Laser pretends to regret that if the girl really could block him with her magic sword, then he would definitely be hit. Luna thinks Lazar is a scoundrel. He got rid of the magic powers to avoid being blocked. Suddenly, the girl feels danger. The laser strikes too hard, and the girl flies back. Aisha is worried about the moon. She gathers all her strength, preparing to attack Lazar. Suddenly the girl raises that she has no strength. Aisha falls to her knees. Lazar says she may not even try, since his poison has already penetrated her. Aisha does not believe that the poison has managed to penetrate her. The moon was also exposed to the poison. Lazar says that now he just needs to deal with the annoying teledrons that are bothering him. The presenter does not understand what happened. Why the images from the three TV screens disappeared. The laser is approaching the moon. He says that the people outside will only hear the tragic news. Princess Luna accidentally died in the pentagram during the competition due to equipment problems. Luna grins and says that even the prince was bribed to get rid of her. Lazar asks her not to talk nonsense, it's just their struggle as competitors. And as for the equipment problems that occurred after the teledrin failed, he did not see it at all. A portal appears behind the laser. The young man turns around. Aisha is also watching what is happening. Suddenly there is a powerful explosion, after which fog appears. A beast appears out of the fog. Lazar notices a magical leech. Aisha also looks towards the beast and hears a disciple coming out of there. The student turned out to be you. He holds Aggie in his arms and says that he just wanted to try a little to bring the magic of fire to a critical point. Who knew that he would destroy the whole floor? Aggie shouts at you, asking Na what the keys are for him. Aisha didn't expect to see you on the first level. Sierra gets up from her seat under the woman's gaze. She says she's going to go to the pentagram. The woman asks her to calm down, as this is just some kind of problem with the teledrins and that's it. Sierra says that all the teledrins on the third level turned on at one moment. She can't believe it. The man stops her and says that a picture from the third level has appeared on some screens. Judging by the picture on the screen, someone else appeared in the room. Sierra thinks it's you and Luna. The man is trying to figure out how you was able to break through the floor of the maze. He thinks about the thickness, even the magic of the highest level will not destroy the magic barrier installed inside the floor at once. Compression magic? It only sounds easy, but try to bring it to the end. If the compression fails, the magic pulse response will be terrible. The man with glasses notes that Sierra's student has much more power than they all thought. When the fog clears, you can see you and Aggie standing in front of the Lazare. You notices the prince and the moon. Aggie says the room smells really nice. Aisha says that all the air is poisoned. Aggie cries out in alarm. Aggie asks you what they should do. It seems to her that it has become difficult to breathe. And all because she inhaled poison. Lazar thought that no one would interfere with them anymore. How you and Aggie were able to break into them. The prince plans to first deal with the two teledrins who are watching them. Lazar thinks that if the real cause of all the problems is revealed, then he will no longer be able to cope with Aggie and you. Lazar's sword changes shape, it transforms into a spear. Aggie asks if they need to fight now. She can feel the poison spreading through her body. You says he'll figure it out. Lazar runs with a spear to you. The guy doesn't even move. When the spear reaches you, it bumps into the barrier. Lazar notices that you can still use magic. Although the guy has a good immunity to poison, he still won't last long. You feels that the smell has become sharper. The spear pierces the barrier and almost reaches the face of you. Aisha and Aggie begin to worry about the guy. The moon looks worried, and Lazar is grinning. It turns out that you caught the tip of the spear with his hand and now holds it in his hand. The prince thinks he needs to try something more powerful. The stone on the tip of the spear lights up green and Lazar asks you how he does it. Suddenly, the stone bursts right next to you's face, and the guy starts coughing. 
Laser mocks you and tells him not to bring the spear point so close to him. Because his special poison is there, it dissolves magical powers. So the guy is definitely finished now. Yu clears his throat and asks how it works. He repeats the words about the fact that poison dissolves magic. He notices that Lazar has some secret techniques. The prince doesn't understand how Yu survived if he was poisoned. No one would be able to use magic after that. Yu should have had complete paralysis of the whole body. Then the prince remembers Anka's words that Yu has incredible powers, perhaps even legendary. He thinks about the fact that the girl was telling the truth about the legendary level. Yu remembered something. He says that the drug that the assassin used had the same smell. Yu realizes that it was Prince Lazar who sent the killer. He says that he cured him of the poison, and he not only did not want to thank him, but also tried to deal with him. Lazar says that he did not think that Yu was at the legendary level, he underestimated him. He says that the legendary forces of Yu need to be countered by something equally legendary. Lazar summons several seals, from which stone blocks appear. Yu is preparing for battle. Lazar grins at the fact that Yu has lost half of his powers. He directs the boulders towards Yu. Yu calls for fiery bonds and beats off all the stones that flew at him. A purple glow appears, emanating from the teledrons. The next moment they explode. Yu doesn't understand why the teledrons exploded. Lazar is satisfied that now no one will interfere with them for sure. He's going to move on to the most important part of the fight. Lazar asks a rhetorical question. What is needed to defeat the same legendary opponent? He replies that you need to become stronger than the legend, and everything will work out. Lazar drinks some medicine and a powerful aura appears around him. He says that disrespect for him, threats, coercion to break off the engagement, you will pay for all this. He says Aggie, you, Aisha and Luna will be defeated and lose their lives in these competitions. You notices the black energy, which, as it turned out, is also connected with the prince. You says that they are at competitions and they have seals on them now that will not let them die. He asks how the prince wants to pull it all off. The prince says that he has already prepared everything for a long time. At the moment, there is no use of seals in the pentagram. The prince says they asked for it. If not for the cancellation of their wedding with Luna, he would have saved their lives, but now he is not even considering such an option. Luna says she is not going to marry such a terrible person as Lazar. Therefore, she would prefer to lose her life. The moon approaches the key. Lazar doesn't understand how she got there. The poison has been inside the moon for a long time, but it can still move. Luna says that anyone knows that Laser will use poison in competitions, so she sent a man to steal the recipe and create an antidote. Lazar is very angry, saying that the moon has no shame or conscience. He knew he shouldn't have married her at all. He believes that it was necessary to declare war and destroy everyone. You mocks Lazarus. He says that if the prince wants to say something else, then let him continue. He notices that Yu has something in his hands. Yu shows the teledrin. He says that when one of the eliminated participants was taken away, the teledrin also wanted to fly away. But the guy put it in his pocket. I wanted to explore it when I had time. The presenter hopes that everyone has heard Lazar's speech. All the stands are shocked. Everyone found out that he turned out to be a scoundrel and all this time he was deceiving everyone. One of the teachers says that the competition is over and orders the immediate evacuation of all students from the pentagram. The teacher also asks to check the magic circle and make sure that all the seals of the participants are valid. The presenter says that Lazar did a terrible thing and it's all outrageous. She reports that the second prince Kenny's, who is famous for his virtues, turned out to be a terrible person. The wave of emotions caused by Prince Lazar's self-exposure is much stronger than the desire to find out who won the competition. The organizers of the pentagram announce the end of the competition. They are preparing to evacuate all participants from the maze. Lazar is just furious. He promises you revenge. The guy is standing, holding a teledrin in his hands and trying to provoke him. Luna thanks Sierra's students. Unfortunately, such a result is not enough to change the fate of the Empire. The girl approaches the gate and mentally apologizes to Sierra for trying to change the future of the Empire for the better, but she has no other choice. Suddenly the seals are triggered. Some mechanisms have started working. Sierra and the other teachers don't understand what's going on. Sierra asks if the mechanisms on the fourth level can make such a noise. One of the teachers says that the sound is not related to the maze. This sound is made by seals. In fact, it is impossible to get to the fourth level of the maze if you just open the door. A person will immediately be thrown out of the maze. But if you open not the doors, but the magical barrier of seals, then the demon that almost destroyed humanity will be released. Lazar notices that the exit from the maze was opened by the moon. 
He runs towards the door and tells you, Aggie, Aisha Luna not to even think about running away. Laser tries to damage the moon, but the girl turns and presses him with her aura. Suddenly there is a surge of blood. You watches as Prince Lazar lost his arm and now calls the moon a demon. He begs for mercy. The moon no longer looks like herself, her face is distorted by an evil smile, and her eyes have become much darker. Sierra picks up and prepares to run to her students. The woman asks where she is going. Sierra says you and the others are still in the maze. She has to get them out of there. All people are running out of the maze, because they are afraid that a demon will come out soon. Bolid is watching everything. He rejoices that the moon and Lazarus have fulfilled their roles, the roles of his pawns. The man turns to the hooded man and says that it's time for them to go. They need to complete the next step of their plan. Everyone is watching what happened to the moon. Aisha feels like something is happening to her. Aggie yells at you to be careful. It seems to you that the moon is looking for something. He turns around and realizes that the girl was looking at Aisha. The next moment, the moon is rushing towards Aisha. You swears because the poison is still in them. Aisha screams. Yu folds the seal of the second level and opens it. Then he strikes the moon with a huge magic wave. The moon bounces and avoids the impact. She says strange words. Aisha says she thinks a sealed demon has entered the moon. Luna looks at Yu, who looks surprised at first, but then he smiles, thinking about the demon. The guy is getting more interesting. The guy rushes into battle and thinks that the moon is behaving like this because a demon has possessed her. The power of the legendary sword could not fully manifest itself. The guy strikes and takes the sword until the demon almost falls after the blow. Yu is about to strike again, but the demon does not have time to react and gets hit right in the sternum. Yu says they haven't finished yet. The demon doesn't understand what the guy means. Yu then opens the seal of the fourth level, which blows the demon inside the girl towards the open gate. Aisha and Aggie have been watching the fight all this time. Aggie wonders if the demon has disappeared. It seems to you that the demon is trying to find a new home. Yu says he has to first he takes them out of the pentagram, and then he will come back and look. The girls don't agree. Aisha says the demon is too dangerous. Who knows what might happen if he goes in there alone. Yu asks her to relax and assures her that nothing will happen. He hugs Aisha and says that he is the first apostle. He has the strength to resist demons and protect her, Aggie, Sierra, and humanity in general. Aisha says that even at such a moment, he is talking nonsense. Yu says it's time for them to get out and go back to Sierra. Aggie recalls that Lazar said that their teleports are broken, as then they will be returned. Yu says there's nothing complicated about it, because it's just the magic of transference. Yu says he will create new teleports and the problem will be solved. But first he says they need to get the poison out. Somewhere to the side there is a laser. He asks them to stop. He asks to save him and take him with him. Yu says they've almost forgotten about him. Sierra is standing near the entrance to the maze. She asks the workers of the maze why the entrance is impossible. Sierra doesn't understand what's going on. The girl explains that after all the shaking, the entrance to the maze completely collapsed. All the seals leading inside the maze have broken. The girl says that all the participants, except those on the third level, have already got out safely. Sierra realizes that only Aisha and the others are left in the maze. Suddenly, the teleport near the entrance is activated. Someone was able to get out. Sierra runs and sees Aisha and Aggie. Aisha excitedly turns to Sierra. The teacher is very glad that they are alive. Lazar's voice is heard nearby. He asks to be saved. Sierra notices Lazar and asks where the moon is. Aisha tries to explain, but can't find the words. Sierra understands that the trump card up her sleeve that Luna was talking about is for sure the resurrection of the demon. Apparently, Luna thought that the powerful power of the demon would be able to stop the crisis in the Empire. Sierra is worried that her student thinks that he can overcome the demon alone, so he ran to them. Sierra doesn't understand what's wrong with all of them. Why everyone does what they want. Apparently, nothing will help you anymore. You walks through the cave. The young man steps on the ring. He recognizes the ring of the moon. He looks up and notices something dark flying towards where the moon is. The moon is in the center of the seals. She's trying to summon a demon and it looks terrifying. The demon spirit appears. The girl pronounces a spell in some strange and unknown language. Yu sees inscriptions and spells. He understands that the girl speaks the Naga language. It seems to you that not only five magicians participated in that legendary rite of imprisonment, but also one nag. The girl says she's ready to open the seals in a second. She turns to Yu and asks if he will stand there and interfere with them. Yu says he would like to see a little more. In the end, he would never get a chance to see the princess like this again. The demon inside the girl starts laughing. He thinks people are funny. 
He then says that he hopes that you will not regret his stupidity. Suddenly, the girl began to emit a huge amount of energy. A huge clawed paw breaks out of the stone. The moon begins to fall. Yu takes off his jacket, throws on the girl and puts on her jacket. Yu and Luna stand like that for a while, until everything in the cave begins to collapse right before their eyes. A huge demon appears. He laughs and rejoices that he finally managed to get out. He says that from now on, no one in the world will be able to stop him. The demon wants every creature on the planet to answer for how they treated him. Suddenly, the demon notices Yu. He asks who he is. Yu says he made him wait. The demon grins and asks if Yu knows who he's talking to. Yu directs his hand towards the demon and releases a huge amount of energy. Yu notices that the demon is full of vital energy. The demon was not affected by Yu's attack in any way. There were many copies of demons, but they were much smaller than the real one. The demon asks you how he got to split the demon. Yu apologizes and says he'd better take a look at it. Yu invokes the fire of the underworld. There is a huge explosion that spreads throughout the cave with bright flashes. All copies of the demon disappeared, and the demon itself became smaller and only its head was visible. The demon asks how this is possible, is he really an apostle? Yu asks how he found out, he has already fought with the apostles. The demon tells that once five people in a naga imprisoned him in the Garo's blood prison. Yu asks how then he was able to get out of the prison of blood and what happened to Garros. The demon says Garros is already dead. Yu didn't say anything at first, as he was shocked by such news. And then I asked how he died. The demon says that he doesn't know what happened, but one day he just suddenly stopped feeling his strength. It also became harder to maintain the blood prison. It took the demon a thousand years to break through the wall of the prison of blood and escape back to the world of the living. Yu wonders if the apostle's life is inexhaustible. I have never heard of such a thing, that the apostles died. The demon then says that even the apostle Garros took time to overcome him. Yu says that Garros is only the eighth apostle. The demon asks what kind of apostle Yu is then. The guy smiles and, burning the last remnants of the demon, replies that he is the first. The fire of the underworld destroys only the demon's corporeal shell and cannot prevent its power from flowing into another body. But at least in the short term, this demon will not harm anyone else. Yu wonders how to get out of the cave now. Luna is lying on the floor unconscious. Yu thinks that, probably, to prevent the demon from returning to the human world again, no returning seal is provided. The gates of space open in one direction. Yu thinks about the fact that he left the writing naked, so he was here. And his body is not visible around, so he found another way to get out of this place. Yu decides that he needs to try and find out. With the help of a jump, he goes up and blows up the caves with his blow. Stones are falling and an explosion occurs. Yu finds himself in a strange space. He notices something, and then he sees some kind of lake. People gathered on the third level of the maze. They check whether the students have remained at this level. They have to check every corner. Chester Ballet is also on the floor with them. He finds someone's hair. All the teachers come to the huge gate. One of the teachers puts his hand on the gate. Sierra asks what's the matter. The man says that the seal is still intact. She's even more stable than before. Sierra doesn't understand how this could happen. The man says that, based on the powerful force that they felt earlier, the seal should have already been lifted. However, he keeps saying that it looks like something else. The man with glasses continues for him and says that someone has removed the seal and sealed the demon again. The man continues, the magic that can seal the demon requires sacrifice, and since it is working again, and Sierra's disciple is nowhere around, it is most likely that he was the victim. Aisha begins to cry, they say that this simply cannot be. She starts calling you and asking him to come out soon. She asks him not to make them worry. Sierra asks her to stop screaming. She assures Aisha that Yu is definitely alive. Sierra demands confirmation from the Sylphs. Sylph says the master is alive. Aisha asks if this is true. Sierra is sure of this. She reminds that she is also bound by a contract with Yu, so she can feel whether he is alive or not. Sierra says she doesn't know where Yu is at the moment, but she is sure that he is alive and fighting somewhere. Yu runs away from the attacks and shouts that Luna is too aggressive, so he asks her to calm down and let him explain everything. Luna is not going to listen to him. She says that when she woke up, she was naked, alone with him, and his pants were already half down. How else should she understand this situation? Yu says he started undressing because he picked up the moon from the bottom of the lake, and all his clothes became wet. Luna doesn't believe his words. She says she's sure she was inside the maze. How then she ended up at the bottom of the lake? The moon suddenly remembers something. An image of Lazarus, writhing in pain, appears in my memory. The girl recalled how she freed the demon and cut off the hand of Prince Lazar. She had been deceived from the very beginning. There was no magic capable of controlling the demon. 
she realized that the power of the demon is beyond the control of ordinary people. The girl was deceived by stories that the power of the demon is able to save the fate of the empire. She freed the demon destroying their world. She is horrified at the thought that her loved ones will suffer through her fault. Yu asks her to calm down. He tells her that the demon has not been released. No one will die because of her. She didn't do anything irreparable. Luna is stunned that the demon was not released after all and no one was injured. Yu says that she only cut Laser's hand. It's a small problem, so she shouldn't blame herself. The girl is happy. There is an awkward silence for a moment. Suddenly she asks how much longer he will touch her. The young man immediately jumps away from her. Then Yu slips and falls right on the moon. Under her indignant exclamation, a loud falling sound is heard. The girl is embarrassed because the young man, unwittingly, fell right on top of her. The girl says she's had enough. The guy is trying to explain himself. The girl says that talking is useless and attacks him. Yu screams. Aisha suddenly felt that Yu was really healthy. Sierra felt it too. Yu stands near the stone and asks if the girl has changed her clothes. Luna tells him not to even think about looking in her direction. Luna thinks that she needs to solve the main problems first, and deal with you only later. Then the girl turns to you and asks him where they are now. Are they still in the maze? You replies that it is not yet known for sure, but it must be that they are no longer on their mainland. It is a completely different world. Luna doesn't understand how it is. The moon asks if they are not on the mainland, then did they get to the east? She can't believe it. Suddenly, something rustles in the bushes. You and Luna turn around and see a strange green creature. Luna got scared and screamed that she saw a monster. The creature spoke in an unknown language. You asks Luna to calm down, since this is not a demon, but an ordinary goblin. But the girl does not see the difference between them. At the sunset of the last civilization, most of the demons moved to the magical world. Only a few of them remained on the mainland with people, so the moon did not recognize the goblin. The goblin continues to say something in his own language. It seems he wants him and you to follow him. You agrees and follows the goblin. He is also followed by the moon, who asks to wait for her. She asks if it's worth blindly following this strange creature. You says that they have no other way out, they are not familiar with the people or the terrain here. They need to find someone, establish contact, find out the situation. At the same time, Yu says that it's time for the moon to find a whole set of clothes. She can't wear her clothes forever. Yu taunts the girl and asks if she likes his clothes. Luna refuses and tells Yu to go ahead. They are approaching some small settlement with a gate in the center. Yu notices this settlement. The goblin says something in an unknown language to the guard. The guard also answers him and opens the gate. While Yu and Luna are passing, everyone is looking at them. There are a lot of different goblins in the village. Luna says, isn't it strange that they just come into the settlement to the goblins? Yu asks her to relax, as he is fully responsible for her safety in front of Sierra. There is noise in the settlement. All goblins are talking about something. The little goblin says that he brought two runaway slaves from the beast eared. But it seems to him that someone cut off their ears. Elder Goblin asks again about the slaves. Yu does not understand the modern magical language. Apparently there is no one in this place who could speak the ancient magical language. The Elder looks at Yu and the moon, and then says that the goblin did not bring the beast eared at all. The Elder says that a long time ago, in his wanderings to foreign lands, he saw creatures with the same appearance. He recognizes them, noble beings. She mistakes you and Luna for succubi. All the goblins started at the word succubi. The elder continues, he says that in their family, all men are majestic and women are beautiful. Male succubi like to bear the torso to attract the other sex. The elder says that the goblins were not surprised that so many clothes were worn on the moon. Perhaps it only seems so. According to legends, this is how it achieves greater attractiveness. Now it is popular with them. Goblin girls are amazed by the beauty of the moon. It seems to the girl that she is being looked at in a strange way. The goblin asks the elder if they are really succubi. They don't even understand what the goblins are saying. The elder says that some of the succubi still insist on using the ancient magical language. They need to try. The elder turns to you and says that his name is Siwakta, the ancient sage of the settlement of the goblin tribe Vukunda. Yu is happy that he can finally talk to someone. Yu wants to know if the elder knows where the emperor is at the moment. The elder says that the lord is currently in Gaicheng. The elder thinks that Yu has just opened his mouth and is already trying to find out about the emperor. But he is undoubtedly from the upper layers of succubi. Yu asks where Gaicheng is, how far is it? The elder replies that if they want to go to Gaicheng, they will have to pass through the lands of the beastmen. 
If they don't mind, he would send a tracker with them. He will guide them. Yu asks about the tracker. Luna asks what they're talking about. Yu replies that he's just asking about the road. Suddenly, someone calls the elder. One of the goblins says that trouble has happened. The ogre broke into their settlement. The elder asks how. The ogre destroyed the gate. All the goblins are running. The ogre smiles menacingly, baring all his teeth. One of the goblins jumped on the ogre to strike him. But the ogre strikes him with his huge fist. One of the goblins says that they should not be afraid, but all together attack him for their tribe. The ogre growls and strikes again. All goblins scatter, dust rises. One of the goblins tries to get up from under the stones, clearing his throat. But a new attack arrives. Luna says the goblins will definitely suffer. She asks what kind of strange monster it is. Yu replies that this is a real ogre. The moon asks what they should do. While Yu is thinking, the ogre tries to eat one of the goblins. Yu, seeing the whole picture, says that they are unlikely to provide them with a guide, so they need to go. Luna asks if they will really just take and leave. Does Yu want to help them? Yu says that in the end, it's their business. So why would they arbitrarily interfere in all this? The elder falls on his knees in front of Yu and asks to save them. Yu is awkwardly silent at first. Luna points to the elder. It seems to her that the goblin is asking Yu for help. Yu replies that the goblin is just seeing them off on a hike. Luna asks why he is crying then. Yu answers because he is a very gentle and kind elder, so welcoming. Yu himself really wanted to help, but they are now in another world, so it's better for them to stay away from all this and be quieter. Yu does not have time to finish his own, as he hears someone's voice from the cage asking for help. The girl is sitting in a cage, crying and asking to save her. Yu suddenly stopped. Luna asks what happened. Yu understands that it was the voice of a little girl. A little girl is sitting in a cage and asks to be rescued. The ogre growls harder. He demolishes everything with one hand, and then finds a little girl and stands right in front of her. The girl was scared. She started screaming in fear and begging for help even more. Yu agrees. The girl fell into a stupor when she suddenly heard someone's voice. Yu was already ready to fight, and Luna was stunned by the fact that Yu disappeared from his place. The elder is crying. He sees how Yu handled the ogre with one hand, protecting the girl, and the rest of the goblins. Yu picks up the girl in his arms and asks how she feels. The ogre's body falls. All goblins recover after his attack. Everyone is surprised that the ogre is defeated. Everyone begins to rejoice and rejoice that now all the goblins are safe. Yu asks addresses the girl like a cat and asks her where she came from. The girl says that she is not a cat, but a lemur. Yu asks if lemur is her name or not. The moon is darker when looking at you. Luna says she hasn't sorted out you yet, and he's already reaching out his hands to another girl. Yu doesn't understand what Luna is talking about. The elder tells the young man that they are very grateful to him for saving their people from the ogre. Then the elder thanks Yu for saving the animal-eared girl. He says that they caught her to present her as a gift to the green sorcerer in exchange for a water source. If something happened to her, their settlement would have to start hunting for a new victim. The girl turns to you, starts crying and tells you that she does not want to be presented to the green sorcerer. The girl is trembling very much from fear. Yu says that since that's the case, they just don't have enough guide to get to Gaia Cheng. Yu says they are choosing a girl. The girl becomes happy at the moment. The elder does not want to give the girl away. Yu turns around, looks gloomy and asks if there are any objections. The elder, noticing this, still gives the girl away. Yu pats the girl on the top of her head and asks if she agrees. She is embarrassed and replies that she agrees. Then she says that she is ready for anything for the sake of the master, which puts Yu and Luna into a stupor. The moon is darkening at the moment. Yu says he doesn't understand what's going on. The elder says that Yu needs to know something. For the animal eared, rubbing someone's ears means proposing marriage. The elder continues to tell, if a foreigner rubbed the ears of a beast ear, the beast ear will still not mind. Moreover, this is considered as a request for recognition as a host. But in any case, there is also a subtext of the wedding. The elder says that since he liked her so much, you can take her and leave, and they will come up with something with an offering to the sorcerer. You asks everyone to stop, since that's not what he meant. The girl addresses you as the owner. Her eyes sparkle as she asks if the owner needs her. Yu looks gloomy and doesn't know what to say to her. The moon just watches all this with a gloomy look and then gives out sarcastic comments. The elder says that they don't have clothes that fit them in size, so they hastily made out of what they had. Yu says that the clothes look good and it's better to walk in them than to run without clothes. Then the goblins bring a cart and say that it is the only one in their tribe. The only trouble is that all the cattle were eaten by an ogre, there is no one to harness except people. 
so if you wants, he can send some goblins with them to pull the cart. Yu replies that they don't need it, they can handle it themselves. The sun is shining outside. Yu pulls a cart in which the moon and the lemur girl are sitting. Yu says he is very hot. The moon is angry because they have been walking for a very long time, and they have never met water yet. Even the trees in their path all dried up and died. The lemur girl says that they have been suffering from a terrible drought for six years. All the springs, lakes and rivers have evaporated. All the trees even died behind them. The girl says that in order to get to the precious water, they are animal-eared, often engaged in fights with goblins. Luna asks the girl that since everything is so bad, why don't they move to another place? The girls answer that the whole territory in this place is one continuous desert. They simply have nowhere to move. Yu asks, what if we leave this place altogether? The girl says that Mr. and Miss Luna are probably from a rich family. She asks them if they ever left the house. The girl says that the territories are separated by huge chasms full of terrible predators. Even with wings, they cannot be crossed. Gaia Cheng is connected by four zones, each of which borders two more territories. The only way to get into another territory or zone is to get a special pass. Luna stops the girl's story and asks what else kind of pass they need and then he turns to you and asks what they should do now. You also doesn't understand what the pass is. Then the guy says they will break through directly. Luna is shocked by what she has heard. She does not understand how it is directly. In the cave of the green sorcerer, the sorcerer chews meat. He says that this month the Vukunda tribe not only did not bring offerings, but also allowed their precious captive to escape. It seems to the green sorcerer that it's time to get rid of the goblin tribe and at the same time check the safety of his fighters. Then he says that you need to eat well before work. He turns to the animal eared. All his fighters are drooling from waiting for food. The green sorcerer says he will enjoy them properly. It's already night outside, and the carriage is still going without stopping. The girl tells the gentleman that ahead are the lands of the lemur tribe. Yu says they've finally come. They are met by fighters with weapons. Yu seems that they are not welcome. The lemurs who meet them ask what they need from the animals. One of the fighters notices that the cart came from the goblin tribe, so nothing good can be expected from them. One of the animal eared shouts for you and Luna to be detained. But a lemur girl gets out of the cart and asks them to stop. She says you and Luna are not bad. She says that they saved her. The animal eared recognize the girl. She's happy that she's back. After the goblins caught her, they no longer hope to see her. The girl says that you saved her. You, Luna and the lemur girl are sitting in a tent. They are thanked for saving the lemur. The beastman who thanked him introduces himself as the head of the beastman, Maggle. Maggle says that their relationship with the goblin tribe is disgusting, so anyone who comes from them cannot escape suspicion. He apologizes to them. You says there's nothing wrong with that, he understands everything. It seems to Maggle that he heard the lemur girl call him master. He asks him if he really proposed marriage to her. The lemur girl replies that this is indeed the case. She says you scratched her ear. You tries to get a word in, but it doesn't work out. Luna looks at you with condemnation. Maggle laughs. He says that this is their business and he understands everything. Then Maggle says that if the lemur girl agrees, then they will have no objections. Maggle says that lemur has returned just in time. There is an important matter that they need to discuss. Maggle reports that Arlie has fallen ill with rotavirus 19. The girl asks Maggle to stop saying that, she doesn't believe him. Then the girl runs away from the tent. Yu calls her, but she doesn't turn around. Maggle says that a terrible thing has happened. Lemur's mother left the world of the living because of rotavirus 19. And now Arlie, whom Lemur has been taking care of for so long, has also contracted the disease. Yu asks about rotavirus minus 19. Maggle says that rotavirus 19 appeared in them about four years ago. It is a terrible, very contagious disease. Maggle says that those infected with rotavirus 19 first have a fever, develop shortness of breath, and a strong cough. And then a transient aging begins, the vital forces disappear from the body, leading to death. The best healers of their tribe are trying to find a cure for this disease, but in the meantime, in order to avoid infection of the entire tribe, all those infected and those who came into contact with them are obliged to go to self-isolation. They are expelled from the tribe. Luna is surprised that everything is so serious. You asks what Maggle means. That is, all patients and those who have been in contact with them should leave the tribe. Maggle confirms this. You notices that Maggle told the lemur that Arlie was sick. He asks if the head understands that even being aware of rotavirus minus 19, the lemur will still run to check on Arlie. Maggle replies that everything is exactly like that. Lemur returned from the goblin tribe and brought two strange magicians with her. No one can guarantee that she is telling the truth and not trying to deceive the tribe. 
animal-eared people gather around the tent. Arlie lies in bed and tells Lemur to leave as soon as possible without thinking about her. If she stays even for a second, then she too will have to leave the tribe. Lemur says she's not going anywhere. She needs to find a cure. She promises that she will definitely cure Arlie. The tent guards are thinking what they will do now. Lemur ran inside. One of the guards says that there is no choice, now both of them will need to be expelled. Otherwise the infection will spread, and the whole tribe will definitely end. Maggle says he just wants to protect their tribe. He asks you if he has a suggestion. You and Luna are getting serious. Maggle demands that his decree be listened to. He says that in order to prevent the spread of the rot virus, Arlie and the lemur in contact with her will be expelled from the tribe. Lemur holds Arlie in his arms. Maggle tells Lemur to take the goblins she brought from the goblins. He demands that they leave immediately. Lemur asks them to stop. Lemur says she can leave, but they have to give her the raw materials for the medicine so that she can cure Arlie of the rot virus. Maggle asks if Lemur really thinks he can cure Arlie of the rot virus. He also mentions the recipe described in the Black Thunder medicine book. Their doctors have already stated that he is absolutely useless. Maggle says that if that recipe could really help, then her mother would not have left the world of the living. Yu watches Lemur, who falls into despair. Yu tells the elder to give the lemur a try after all. Maggle asks what now? He should give her the ingredients just because Yu said so. He says they can't waste precious resources. Yu asks if he speaks clearly. He said he needed everything he needed to create a cure. Yu says that if the lemur tries and it turns out that the recipe is really useless, he will understand everything and will not interfere with them. He asks if they don't want to go straight to the consequences of his anger. Maggle is alarmed. He doesn't understand how Yu dares to contradict him. Maggle notices that the guy exudes the smell of great danger. He can't figure out what's going on, but he better be gentle. Maggle agrees and says that he will give the lemur a try after all. He says that if there is no result, then they will have to take responsibility for themselves. Yu asks lemur if everything suits her. The lemur rejoices at its owner. Maggle asks to bring the ingredients. He says that the girl should start preparing her medicine right now. The sun is already visible on the street. Everyone was watching the lemur making medicine. Someone in the crowd was asking if it would be ready soon, because it had already been three hours. Someone says she's just cheating on them. Someone asks if it will really be necessary to drink medicine. Many crowds are shouting for the girl to finish with the preparation of the medicine. Yu asks everyone to calm down. Luna asks if this plan will really work. It's almost morning, will the lemur be able to make an effective medicine? Yu says it's nothing to worry about. We still have to wait. Maybe the lemur will really succeed. Yu says he has a backup option. An hour later, the lemur says that she has finished cooking the medicine. The girl brings a cup of medicine to Arlie. Arlie says it won't be a big deal if the medicine doesn't work. No matter what the outcome will be, lemur has already done everything she could. Lemur gives Arlie a drink of medicine. Lemur asks how Arlie is feeling. Arlie falls silent. Maggle demands that everyone look, because he said that nothing would work. He says he has nothing to talk about with them. He demands that they be thrown out. Yu demands that they wait. Maggle asks that they have a new excuse. Yu says that the treatment process is just not over yet. He asks Luna to use elemental magic on Arlie. He asks her to collect water elements for her. Luna does not understand, but fulfills Yu's request. Maggle asks about the magic of the elements. He asks if they are really real magicians. Luna asks Yu what he's up to. She explains that in such a dry place, it will be difficult to collect even a drop of water. Yu asks her to talk less and move on to the important things. He asks her to do as he says. Luna says that Yu only knows how to command people. She asks the water elements of their entire world to gather. Water appears in the hand of the moon. Arlie dives into the water. All people are shocked to see the natural magic of water. Everyone notices that Arlie has recovered. She became young and beautiful again. Someone in the crowd of people is happy that she was cured. The recipe turned out to be working. Yu confirms, he says that their so-called rotavirus is not at all some terrible incurable disease. This disease is caused by a simple lack of water. Yu says that the conclusion is the same. If they want to cure the rot virus, they need to stay close to the water. Yu says that a large amount of water will make the medicine effective, and everyone, like old Arlie, will turn back. Arlie turned into a beautiful young girl. Everyone is in a stupor. The animal ear do not believe that Arlie was really able to recover. Everyone can see how Arlie has regained her original appearance. Yu turns to the head of the clan and asks if the head of the clan can say something now. Maggle is glad that everything is over. He did not think that the problem was not in the recipe, but in the water. Lemur says it's not a problem at all. The problem was that the head of the clan did not give water to the sick. That's why the recipe was useless. Lemur blames Maggle for everything. 
the head of the clan is trying to find an excuse for himself. One of the animal eared falls to his knees and does not understand how it happened. He says that his father was also treated with this prescription. If his father had water, he might be alive. Everyone falls into despair when they realize that in order to cure the rot virus, it was only necessary to get water. One of the animal-eared ones says that he drove his mother and sister out of the tribe with his own hands. All the beast-eared begin to blame Magal for everything. They say he is not worthy to be their headman. Magal is trying to find an excuse for himself again. A stone hits him. He was abandoned by a lemur. The girl demands that the head of the clan return her mother to her. Magal says they shouldn't exaggerate so much. Magal points his hand at all the inhabitants of the tribe and says that he is not the only one who decided to expel people from the tribe. All the people of the tribe then agreed. Magal says that even if this recipe helps to cure rotavirus, it still does not change the fact that all the patients were weak, old people. Now they are no longer alive, and those drops of water that they saved will help the remaining ones to hold out for a couple of days longer. Magal continues and says that all the water they have is barely enough for healthy people to survive. He asks where else they can get water for the treatment of patients. The head of the clan is sure that the strongest survives in this world. All the inhabitants are obviously rather big and should already understand this truth. Magal says that they got rid of those who dragged the tribe back. Now their resources will be used for more useful people. He calls it the right way. Then he presses even harder and asks if the people of the tribe know where the water they drink every day comes from. He says it's all thanks to other people's sacrifices. He asks how then the inhabitants differ from him. Magal says that compared to the inhabitants of the tribe, it is much harder for him because they did not even know about it. But he is the main one and he must proceed from the interests of the whole tribe. All the animal-eared look at the headman. And then Yu says that at first they even believed that he bore all the hardships of life. The guy starts clapping his hands. Yu then says that the goblin elders told him interesting things. For example, that water for the tribe of the animal eared is exchanged by the headman at the sorcerer for special offerings. And the goblins also told that the abduction of the lemur was not at all a random attack by goblins, but the head of the tribe himself exchanged it for resources. All the beast eared are shocked by the news about the offering the exchange of a lemur to goblins for resources. Yu says that as soon as Magal saw the lemur come back, he was so scared. He was afraid that all his secrets would be revealed. Thus, Magal began to use Arlie's illness to expel both her and the lemur from the tribe. Magal says that all this is complete nonsense and you cannot understand them since he is a foreigner. He says that everything he does, he does for the sake of their tribe. Lemur says that this is all in order to protect his place as the head of the tribe. Magal roused himself. Lemur continues and says that Magal, unable to protect the tribe, should not have been its head. He is the most useless person in the tribe. Yu praises Lemur for what he said. Luna joins in and says that not appreciating the lives of their relatives should not be a leader. The girl directs her hand towards the head of the tribe. She's going to use her powers. She attacks with a stream of water. The whirlpool of water lifts the Magal up and carries him away. Then the water splashes and there is a fine rain. Everyone is happy that water has appeared. People raise the water and collected it. One of the animal-eared ones raises her hand and points at the rainbow. A rainbow appeared directly above the inhabitants of the tribe. Lima remembers his mother's words that, after waiting for the end of the drought, after the rain you can see a rainbow. The girl thinks that she will look at the rainbow for her mother. The girl starts crying. Luna and you are happy with the result. You only regrets that the rainbow is artificial, but it still looks amazing. Luna asks him to be quiet. Lemur says that they now have so much water that they may not worry about it in the near future. The people of the tribe are really very grateful to you and Luna. The girl approaches the lemur and says that they need to talk. The girl asks if it is possible to ask Mr. Yu to become their new leader. Lemur asks her again. The girl says that since Magal conducted secret affairs and failed, they now need a new head of the clan. The girl says that Mr. Yu is strong. He can also use magic. He is not deprived of his mind. Only he does not have a tail and ears, but at the same time he is still an ideal leader. Lemur says that the purpose of Yu's journey is Gaia Cheng, so he will not be able to stay in their tribe. The girl didn't know about it. The girl had an idea. She heard that Mr. Yu rubbed her ears and proposed marriage. In that case, since Mr. Yu can't stay, then let his children stay. His child will be their leader. Lemur says that Mr. Yu has no children. The pink-haired girl says that he does not have children now, but then they can give birth to one or another. The lemur meows with embarrassment. The pink-haired girl says that Mr. Yu is just resting at the moment. 
The girl advises the lemur to go to him while he is free. Suddenly the girl falls silent, as she notices that the lemur blushed all over and began to meow. She realized that she had gone too far. In the tent there is a chest of drawers and a soft bed on which the moon lies. Yu says that the moon is a princess, and so rejoices in an ordinary bed. Luna says the guy doesn't understand anything. Luna says that since they got into this tribe, they are surrounded everywhere by goblins, ogres, and rot viruses. As it turned out, a bed in which you can relax in peace is a rather rare thing. The girl still wants to wash and then all her wishes will be fulfilled. Yu says that if she wants to take a shower, then let her just ask the animal eared to cook everything for her. He doesn't see this as a problem. The moon gives out sarcastic comments. Although she herself got water for them with the help of magic, she cannot do this to them, remembering the drought and its consequences. Water is too valuable for this tribe. Yu didn't notice that Luna was so kind-hearted. He is very surprised. Luna starts to get angry because she doesn't understand why he is surprised. Luna hugs the pillow and says there is something she would like to ask him. The girl says that she doubted from the very beginning. She talks about goblins, animal-eared and moving to another world. The girl asks you if there is a way to return to their world. Transitions between worlds, this was not even in the legends. She's worried that she won't be able to return to her world. Yu confidently says that they will return. He reminds that Sierra, Aisha and everyone else are waiting for them. So they definitely need to come back, even if it means crossing worlds. He says that Luna should not worry, as he will find a way to come back and take her with him. The girl looks at you with admiration. Suddenly, a lemur bursts into the tent and says that trouble has happened. The goblin tribe was forced to return. You and Luna didn't understand. Animal-eared guards and goblins stood near the tribe. Luna and you run up to them. The guy asks what happened. Arlie meets them. The girl says that the goblin tribe came to ask for help. Everything looks like they were being chased. Yu doesn't understand who could be following them. Goblin addresses Mr. Yu. He begs the master to save them. He says they are helpless now. Yu comes closer and asks what happened. Goblin tells that the green sorcerer attacked them. Yu doesn't know the green wizard. Suddenly, one of the goblins shouts for the headman to look away and see that they have been overtaken. The elder turns to Yu again and says that their pursuers have come. Transform goblins, created by themselves to intimidate animal-eared and other tribes. The transformed goblins were very angry. There were a huge number of them, ferocious and cruel with a very bad trait, a thirst for flesh. A whole army of transformed goblins gathered around the tribe of beastmen. Animal-eared scares a huge number of goblins. They have no idea what to do. One of the animal-eared guards grabs the goblin elder and asks what kind of business it is. Why did they bring a whole army of monsters to their village? The guard assumes that the goblins did not want to go to the other world alone. The goblin headman says he just wanted to ask you for help. The guard raises his voice and practically shouts that no matter how strong you is, what can he do against a huge number of goblins? Yu looks at the goblin army and asks if this is the same green sorcerer. He says that the green sorcerer is not very beautiful. He will have to try to cope with so many goblins, but in general there are no problems. The headman asks what Yu is going to do. The guard tries to understand Yu's thoughts. The guy replies that they will be able to fight. The guard tries to say something else, but the lemur interrupts him. She stops him in mid-sentence. Lemur asks to stop constantly asking for something. The guard does not understand why the lemur is so angry. Yu says they're not that annoying. The lemur thanks the guy for pulling her out of the goblin lair and for saving the ancient lemur from death. The fact of dating you already makes the girl incredibly happy. The girl says that the owner has done too much good for the lemur, that now she doesn't even know how to thank him. The girl says that the green sorcerer came for them and the goblins. She thinks Yu doesn't have to put himself in danger for them, so she asks him and Miss Luna to leave this place as soon as possible. Then there won't be a chance. Lemur begins to cry and apologize for the fact that she will no longer be able to be Yu and Luna's guide. Everyone was moved after such a scene. The goblin elder says that the lemur said everything correctly, it's all somehow shameless on his part. The elder says that it is impossible to make impossible requests to the benefactor who has already saved their tribe. Therefore, the elder asks them to leave as soon as possible. It will take them a little time for the goblin tribe to delay the green sorcerer's army, and they will be able to escape. The moon looks at lemurs and goblins. Yu suddenly starts laughing. He says he is not respected at all. He asks lemur to listen to him. If he wants to leave a place, he will do it only of his own free will. There is no force that would force him to do anything. The problem that you talked about at the beginning is just an empty stomach, because while he is dealing with the goblin army, he will definitely get hungry. Therefore, all they need to do is go and cook something delicious. He says they started until he came back. 
Hugh and Luna appear directly opposite the goblin army. Goblins are grinning. The guy tells Luna that if she is afraid, she should move away so as not to get in the way. Luna says she will definitely not hide after his speech. However, the girl hesitantly asks the young man if he really has a trump card or if he was just trying not to embarrass himself in front of the tribes. Yu asks what she means. The girl asks Yu if he can really cope with such a huge number of monsters. The guy is sure of it. The girl asks him if he has mastered some incredible forbidden magic. Yu grunts questioningly and says that it can be considered that way. Yu thinks that this is certainly not forbidden magic, but the power is about the same. Luna thinks that Sierra's disciple is reaching such an incredible level. In Luna's head, it turns out that Sierra has been teaching incredible legendary magic techniques for a long time. Luna says she will help you buy time. The guy doesn't understand why he needs extra time. The moon, though, does not own everything that you owns, but it definitely takes a lot of time to perform such complex magic. She knows that for sure. The girl says that she will detain the transformed goblins, and the guy will have to focus on his magic. Luna reminds you that he promised to take her with him when he returns to their world. All she needs is not to let him go to the other world until that moment. Yu thinks that he doesn't really need time to prepare, but he decides to put up with it and just watch. Luna asks Asia to answer her and empower her. The sword responds that the forces of the moon are not enough to subdue him, but she appreciates how the moon takes care of her condition, so she still gives her all her might. Luna is holding a sword, and behind her appears the spirit of Asia, who looks like a blonde girl dressed in a white tunic. The green sorcerer notices that something is happening in the front ranks of his army. He notices the soul of the sword. He admires the girl's strength. And then the green sorcerer commands to take the moon alive and his whole army rushed forward in the next second. Asia says that using her powers will speed up the expenditure of her magical energies. She says that, judging by the state of the moon, she can only hold out for about 10 seconds, so she needs to deal with the goblins as quickly as possible. The goblin troops are illuminated by a bright flash. I hear a voice from me that says enough is enough. The moon itself disappears in a moment and sweeps across the entire field, instantly hitting every goblin from the troops. Only one flash is visible. All the goblins fly apart. The green sorcerer grins. He stops an energy strike with two hands. He is struck by the power of the sword soul. But compared to its power, it doesn't mean anything at all. The girl flies back, landing on her back. Even after using the power of the sword soul, she still didn't do anything in the end. Yu supports the girl and tells her that she did a great job. Luna asks him if she helped him buy some time. Yu replies that she helped him a lot. The girl's sword falls out, but Yu catches it and asks Luna to have a good rest. And he will deal with the rest himself. The green sorcerer says that another ignoramus has appeared who does not know what power and respect are. He orders his soldiers to deal with him. All the soldiers immediately start attacking Yu and Luna. Yu repeats the last phrase of the green sorcerer. Yu then puts the sword on his shoulder and asks if his sword soul can hear him. The sword says that he is very sorry, but the guy is not its owner so he will not be able to use its powers. Yu says there's nothing wrong with that. The sword doesn't understand. Then the sword says that the king of elements forged it with the purest lightning energy. No lightning in the world can harm him. Yu says he just needs to make sure. After all, the sword must withstand magic based on other sources of energy. The guy looks at the sword and says that in this case everything is fine. A huge energy explosion occurs on the battlefield. The green sorcerer looks anxiously at the explosion. The moon is also alarmed because of what is happening. But the tribes watching the battle are even more shocked. Asia asks you to stop. She asks why the guy is injecting thunder into her. Then she shouts that she has had enough and asks him to stop. She tries to explain that she can't get that much energy into her anymore. The girl twists, as she can no longer withstand so much energy. Yu looks at the sword and says that although Asia was able to cope with its lightning energy, but the capacity is very small. He doesn't understand what kind of magic sword it is. He asks if there is enough power for his techniques in this case. Asia says that it doesn't matter anymore. Yu has to use it faster, otherwise it will burst. Yu says that since there are no other options, then it will do. He uses the shortened version. Huge streams of lightning strike the battlefield. A great heavenly punishment is taking place. Lightning bolts are directed towards the green sorcerer. He doesn't understand what kind of power it is. The green sorcerer tries to stop the energy flows with the help of black armor, but he fails and is pierced by lightning, erasing completely. The green sorcerer did not understand how this could happen. In the center is the moon and you. A fog rose around them. After the powerful attack that all the tribes saw, the people, the creatures living in them were shocked. The goblin elder asks if he was the only one who saw what happened. 
Lemur can't believe that in an instant all the monsters disappeared. Luna is also shocked. She wonders if Sierra could teach such a you. She can't imagine Sierra's having magic of the same level. Yu looks at the fog and thinks that it turned out well and the sword coped with its task. He sees Asia in front of him. Asia says that he is not her master at all, and so unceremoniously used her powers. He tricked her and forced her to serve him, it's just terrible for a magic sword. But Asia liked the moment when she was filled with strength, and that short moment of liberation were beautiful. In the end, she admits that Yu is really good, did not drop the honor of the magic sword. Yu pays her the same compliment. Yu says that something surprises him, how the green sorcerer survived, how much power he has. The green sorcerer rises after the attack. He asks you a question about what kind of person he is. Where did he get so much power from? Yu asks what is the point of telling him something. Even if he finds out the answer, he will still go to another world. At the words about the other world, the green sorcerer laughed. He says there's no need to be so arrogant. He hasn't shown his true power yet. So now I want to see her. The green sorcerer releases a huge amount of energy. He uses the magic trick the dark world of the heart. Yu is a little surprised. He notices the souls of dead monsters. Then the laughter of the green sorcerer is heard. He transformed and he got wings. The green sorcerer rejoices that he has finally turned into a fighting troll. He tells Yu that on this day he will learn what real power is. Yu tells Asia that he will have to fight another battle. He asks if she's ready. The sword soul is not very ready. The green sorcerer says that Yu lived to the moment of his death and did not understand anything. The troll says he's about to send him to hell. Yu rejoices at his challenge and says he can't wait to see it. The troll soars up and flies to attack. He releases purple tiger cores that fly straight into Yu. The guy beats off all the cores that flew into him. Then he notices that the troll is missing. But, sensing danger, he reacts quickly and evades all the blows that the troll is trying to inflict. The troll asks what happened. He thinks Yu is running away and asks why the guy needs a magic sword if he is running away. Yu says that since the troll is so eager to be chopped up, he will start as soon as possible. Asia is excited. Yu fills the sword with his energy again and directs a magical cry at the troll, which pierces the troll in the chest. The troll laughs and says that he could stand it, so he won't be able to handle it. Yu brings the tip of the sword directly to the troll's eye, which is on his forehead, and says that he is no longer alive. The power increases, and the troll closes with two hands. But it doesn't help, and he falls back on his back. Everyone is shocked by this scene. The tribes notice that Yu was against everyone, but he was able to win. He was able to defeat even the green sorcerer. Everyone is wondering how Yu was able to survive. Someone wants to ask about Yu Yu Lemur. Yu then approaches Luna and says she can take her sword. The girl is also shocked. The guy scratches the back of his head and says that the battle has dragged on and now his stomach is cramping from hunger, so he wants to eat. Asia and Luna look at each other. The sword soul thinks it was a great feeling when it was filled with energy for a moment, and it was released. Luna stands in a stupor and looks at Asia, who also freezes the next moment. The soul of the sword says that with the powers of the moon, this cannot be achieved. Luna and you approach the tribe. The animal ears want to address you but he interrupts them and asks what they wanted to say. After all, he asked me to prepare a delicious meal by the time he returns. He says his stomach is twisting from hunger. Everyone is silent. Then a lemur appears and joyfully greets you. Everyone is shouting at once that they will arrange a feast. It's time to set the table. Everyone starts to gather to celebrate the victory. Everyone clinks mugs in honor of the victory. Someone is dancing around the fire. In general, everyone is having fun. Yu is sitting in a tent. Next to him is a beast who did not think that the day would come when he would drink at the same table with goblins. The goblin elder chuckles and says that he also could not have thought that such a thing would happen. All those sitting thank you. The animal-eared one asks what Mr. Yu's plans for the future are now. He asks if he will stay with them. Yu replies that it won't work because he has other things to do. So tomorrow he and Luna are going on the road. The animal-eared one says that Yu is a big man who cannot stay in their settlement, otherwise it will be a waste of real talent. The elder says that even if Yu has decided that he will leave, then he should not hurry. He talks about the fact that there is a place that Yu will be interested in looking at. The elder says that the cave of the green sorcerer contains treasures that they have looted. He suggests that Yu go to the cave before leaving and look for something interesting. Yu thinks that there is hardly anything remarkable in that cave. But he still goes there to dispel the moon, in gratitude for the fact that she has helped him lately. Yu says they will wait until the next day. The moon will rest, and they will go and see what's in the cave of the green sorcerer. Lemur asks if they will take her with them. Lemur wanted to stay longer as U.S. guide. 
you apologizes and says that most likely they will not return to the settlement anymore, so they will not be able to bring her back. Hugh says that the goblin headman drew them a map, so they no longer need a guide. The guy says that the girl should stay with her family. The lemur is silent. When the animal ear tries to pay attention, the girl begins to say that if she does not have the opportunity to repay the owner for his help, then the lemur will dance for him and this will be her compensation for everything. Hugh grunts questioningly and then says that dancing is a good suggestion. Music starts playing. Lemur looks at you with a mysterious smile. Then the girl starts moving to the sound of music. She moves her arms up and pelvis from side to side. Yu is impressed by the dance. He sees that the girl's eyes are shining. The animal-eared one is going to go somewhere. Yu asks why he doesn't watch the lemur dance. The young man says that it is better for the gentleman to see for himself. The goblin addresses Yu. She says that the fiery dance of the lemur means the expression of a woman's love for a man. Although she does not know what is between him and the lemur, but she gathered all her courage to confess and dance. Yu looks at the lemur, but after hearing this, the picture in front of his eyes begins to blur. The girl asks you to look at her at least at the moment. You, the next moment, you opens his eyes and sees a girl in front of him, who smiles at him and calls him. The guy comes to his senses. The lemur asks why he is staring at her, not averting his eyes. The guy is a little stunned by such pressure. You notices that he is lying on the bed with lemur. He asks why he is in this room. They were recently in the square and already in the tent. The girl answers, because you only looked at her stupidly, without taking his eyes off, since she started dancing. As he was not called, he did not answer, so I had to bring him to this room. Yu says that Lima really danced beautifully, that he was focused. Yu says that since the feast is over, he will go to his room. The girl stops him. Lemur says that according to their traditions, if he agrees to watch the recognition dance and goes along with the dancer, then the owner has one privilege. 